We'll start today with this workshop with a brief introduction uh, by Chiran Pagdemer and myself. So let me please share my screen so we can get a start in this snowing weather, at least in the Netherlands. Um, let's share my screen. Bear with me a minute. I hope you can now see the presentation and the introduction slide yep. with the title of the workshop, The Green Deal. Okay, thanks. So today we have the first relay workshop on the Green Deal and its implications for animals and nature. And before we start the workshop with the speakers of today, together with uh, Sharon, I'll give a, a brief introduction about the contents uh, of, uh, of the day. So if you, Look to the Green Deal. Eh? We just did a kind of a, a search sales for today's presentation. Um, it's about, of course, all the things we see around us. It's about the climate change. It's about uh, biodiversity loss. It's about loss of uh, species, uh, the pollution of oceans and, and uh, terrestrial biota. And the European Green Deal is a response to these challenges. Eh? Um, and it's also about a growth strategy. And I put some words in the text we found in red because that's, I really think, the issues we probably will discuss today. It's about growth, trying to transform the European Commission, the European Union into a fair, prosperous society. So we'll discuss this growth question. It's about resource efficiency and competitive growth. So we can question that uh, as well. Again, in the next phrase, what's the Green Deal is about? It's also economic growth mentioned again. Um, but also the things we will discuss today, animals and natural, cap natural capital are being mentioned. So also in the Green Deal, there are some words about a just and inclusive transition. Uh, but then again, I already mentioned that it must be people first. Uh, so there's a lot of things I think, which is on the discussion if you talk about the Green Deal. And you probably connected today to us because you're also interested about the role of animals and nature in the Green Deal. And that's exactly what we are interested in as well. We did a kind of a quick search, animals and nature in the Green Deal. And um, if you look at the text, uh, you see that animals are hardly being mentioned. Uh, some of the texts are not being mentioned once. Um, nature in the context of biodiversity, it is mentioned. And also if you saw the previous slide, the, the short description of the Green Deal, we saw that uh, biodiversity it comes back to that as well. Nature as such, as the word, uh, also rarely mentioned in the Green Deal. Uh, then again, ecosystems uh, more frequently. And then we took it even a little bit broader. Then we thought, well, hey, let's then focus more on sustainability, sustainable development, anything that has sustain in it. Uh, and there are more and more examples pop up in descriptions of the Green Deal. Um, some of them, I think, are quite relevant for today's discussion as well. But also, if you look at uh, the first eight or nine or so, you steal still a lot of resource. You still you still you see many words about sustainable investment, about sustainable growth, about sustainable financial systems. So the feeling I get when I, I, I see this is very much in line with this economic thinking. And we'll come back to that later on in this workshop as well, because I really think that if well the green is all about a sustainable future, that economic development, economic paradigm should only be one aspect of the whole discussion uh, and maybe even not the most important one. Because if you look in our world, if you look at our socioeconomic developments, if you look how they impact natural systems and society, if you look at how we are depending on ecosystem, biodiversity, uh, uh, animals within um, uh, nature, then I really think that the focus on animal and ecosystem health maybe even more important to start with in the Green Deal in discussion about it, and maybe even the key element to be taken care of when discussing about the sustainability of the next generations and sustainability of the future. So I think that human, but maybe even more important, ecosystem health is a kind of a key 
integrate the sustainability index, a key index how we are managing our natural and social systems. And I think we are all aware of the things we are seeing. If you look at ecosystems, if you look at nature, if you look at our interactions with animals, I consider that as being a core element in the sustainability debate, a core element for sustainable future. That are a lot of things we are not doing correctly. And we see all the symptoms around it. And these are just a few examples, uh, how we treat our livestock, our animals in uh, the bio industry. I really don't think that's sustainable. If you see how we um, do our ecosystems unjust, how we actually expand our living areas, our croplands uh, with biodiversity loss as a consequence, I don't think that's sustainable. Uh, trade of animal products and even closer by the overbreeding of animals for our own use, uh, that's not something I would consider again to be sustainable. And we see a lot of symptoms of that. Eh? And I don't think to tell, I have to tell you how impactful they can be talking about zoonosis, eh? that are diseases that are caused uh, between the close interactions uh, of humans and animals, and mainly when animals are not being treated well. So these uh, zoonoses are, again, a key symptom of that we are not treating the natural and animal world sustainably. And these are just a few examples to illustrate enormously. Yeah, we probably are with a, a huge variety of expertise uh, on the screen, have people probably from, from many, many disciplines uh, uh, presented today. Uh, and just to give you an idea that more than 70% of the emerging pathogens in humans over the last several years have been passed from animals. Uh, and the latest one, of course, is Corona COVID-19. And they have huge impacts. Eh? Not only they have a huge impact on uh, financial matters, on uh, uh, travel, on economic developments, but also on society. And again, this is a slide I already used for many, many years, but I don't need to explain them in detail current days. We all know what an impact the zoonosis a pandemic can have on our lives and our economic and social systems. Um, and also this cartoon is something that perfectly fits within today's themes of discussion. There are a lot of things we see today uh, from COVID-19, uh, from climate change, from biodiversity collapse that all have to do with our relationships with animals and nature. And as the Green Deal is trying to get a kind of a framework for a more sustainable future, it should of course be also taking these issues uh, centrally in uh, the development of the Green Deal in the future. And that's what we are talking about today with some key interesting speakers. Uh, are we talking about the Green Deal and trying to think about how can we make that transition to sustainable development? And we have, people talking more on the macro approach or more on a global level, what can we do on that level in order to achieve a more sustainable future in our relationship with nature and animals. And we have some speakers talking more on the micro level uh, because both levels, of course, are needed. And as far as I'm concerned that throughout the day, I'm very much also interested and we have a discussion later on by the end of the day to start uh, with some, some questions to start thinking about, do we not need to have a paradigm shift? Do we not want to transfer our thinking from economic, economic growth, economic development to a more animal well-being, ecosystem health as a kind of a key entry port for a more sustainable future? And if so, what can we then do about it? How can we actually make sure that it's more embedded than it is today in the Green Deal and other development plans regarding to sustainability? Um, now I'll give the word, uh, word uh, to uh, Sharon. She will tell a little bit more about uh, today as well and also some more practicalities. And then we can start with uh, the first uh, speaking of today. Sharon, the word is to you. All right, thank you, uh, Pim, for your introduction. Just to slightly reiterate a bit. So um, the European Commission speaks about protecting Europe's natural capital and resources. However, when we come to the core of it, does it acknowledge the value of nature and animals for their own sake or simply as a means for human flourishing? How can we understand this and what are the different viewpoints? So in this exploration, we have invited various speakers from academia and civil society to share their views uh, with us today. And together, like Pim also mentioned, we hope to also contribute to the important question on what would be good propositions to go forward in a good and green way. So in this first 
thematic workshop within the Relay project, we really want to discuss the Green Deal from this particular point of view. And before I continue with detailing today's agenda, let me just briefly provide you with more information about the Relay project. Now, Pim, if you could go to the next slide for me. Yes, all right. So Relay is a Jean Monnet project with, which is supported by the Erasmus Plus project that aims at discussing the European Commission's political guidelines and work programs within a wide and diverse array of stakeholders. Um, and stakeholders will be able to provide input through a series of conferences, workshops and working papers. And this particular workshop is part of that. And at the end of the project, the results of these discussions will be shared and integrated into a policy brief with recommendations. So for more information, you can also um, visit the Relay website. Um, if we can go to the next slide with today's agenda, then, um, um, oh, wait, oh, yeah, thank you. So it's uh, a short introduction by me and Pim. It's almost coming to an end. And then um, the first session is from 10 to 12, and we have various speakers uh, for that lined up. Professor Philip Patberg, uh, who will give a presentation also on will the Green Deal accelerate the sustainability transition, a preliminary analysis. Then we have Professor Frank Biermann with the Green Deal, an Earth System Governance Perspective. And after which we have Assistant Professor Budak Jam with um, a presentation titled Towards Climate Neutral and Socially Innovative Cities, But How? Then um, we'll have a break in between. And at 12, from 12.30 to 14.30 is uh, session number two, in which we also have three speakers. Professor Bram Buscher with a presentation on a Green New Deal needs a radically different conservation towards a convivial alternative. We have Dr. Monique Janssen um, with a presentation called Animal Business, an ethical exploration of corporate responsibility towards animals. After which we have the director of the Greenpeace European Union, Jorgo Riss with um, uh, uh, a presentation entitled European Green Deal or European Greenwash. Um, after this, we'll have a coffee break of half an hour, and um, we would like to invite the participants also for an interactive debate with um, some propositions and statements and really a conversation in which we want to have an interactive debate with you all and um, yeah, round up with concluding remarks. Now, before I would like to give the floor back to Pim to open the first session, uh, I would like to say a few words regarding the Zoom session today. So regarding the audio and video, please keep your microphone on mute and if possible, your camera on throughout the call. Um, it makes a dynamic experience, but please also remember that the, that the conference itself is being recorded. So if you don't want to be uh, on screen, then you can turn it off. For asking questions, please use the chat to ask questions in the first instance. Uh, they will be collected by us. And if there's time for participants to take the floor later on, maybe to ask questions or provide comments, just use the raise hand function. Um, and, and, and you can reach that by clicking on the participants um, note. And then there's a, a thing called raise hand. All right, I hope this was informative about the rest of the day as well to you. And Pim, I think we're set to go to start with the first session. Thanks a lot, uh, Sharan, for uh, co-introducing the workshop together with me. I'm really much uh, looking forward to it. And I also noticed that uh, Philippe is already around. So I will stop sharing my screen. And then I probably have to give Philippe the opportunities to share his screen. Let me find you, Philippe, on. Yeah, everyone can share screen. Aha, uh -huh, you already are able to do so. So, well, the first presentation of today is by uh, Philippe uh, Popback. And Philippe as well, I've known for quite some time. Uh, we go back uh, uh, several years ago and our collaboration um, went even closer when we got a kind of a collaborative effort last year between Maastricht University and the Brede Universiteit in Amsterdam. 
Uh, Philippe, he is professor of uh, environmental governance and policy. Uh, and he's also department head of the Department of Environmental Policy Analysis of the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Bay Universiteit. Uh, last but not least, he's also director of the Amsterdam Sustainability Institute. Uh, and I really think that's a key example of how a real interdisciplinarity kind of research uh, platform institute at the university could shape up, uh, also at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. Uh, Philippe will give his presentation on will the Green Deal accelerate the sustainability transition, a preliminary analysis. So, Philippe, I would like to give the screen uh, to you. I hope everything is set and the next half hour is for you. Thank you, Pim. Uh, and thanks, uh, Jiren, for the nice introduction, the invitation and good morning to everyone. I can't really see any one of you, but I know you're there and uh, that feels great. So I'm really um, honored to be here today and I feel this is a very um, important topic, very close to my heart. The irony is I will not really talk about animals uh, in much detail because I was asked to provide a, a broader introduction to the um, success conditions of the Green Deal. Um, but I want to say that um, the role of animals in sustainability have always been one of my um, actually, the key reason I became an academic in the field, so I was a, a, let's say, an animal rights activist before I became an academic, so I feel this is a, a topic very close to my heart. So I want to also say I believe that it's really important that we have these debates, and it feels a bit weird that we have them only in 2021. But uh, nonetheless, of course, that is, uh, in the broad scheme of things, maybe a good thing that we have them after all. Okay, so um, without much further ado, so the Green Deal is something quite weird because no one really knows what it is. It's sort of an umbrella of a lot of ongoing and proposed policy initiatives of the European Union to achieve indeed um, a transformation of our economic system with all the elements that have been mentioned. Basically saying that in 2050 we'll have net um, zero emissions in the European Union and at the same time we have decoupled resource use from uh, economic growth and we have done that in a way that puts uh, that leaves no one behind no person no region and then we should add uh, no no other living beings probably and no ecosystems as well although as you have already mentioned that's not really explicitly mentioned so the green deal is a hypothetical thing so it's really difficult to evaluate it uh, in particular in COVID times when a lot of the discussions have simply been put on hold um, so just as a little flashback it is December 2019 and we have these debates about the Green Deal, it is accepted in the end, but with a lot of haggling of the political um, actors. So in the end, Poland got an exemption. There were all sorts of debates about um, whether it's fair to apply the Green Deal to all European countries, as you might remember. So the feeling was, okay, we have it, but there, yeah, it's, it's not maybe universally accepted, but then we were moving into implementation mode and then the COVID uh, situation changed that. So I wanna just add this as a bit of an introduction. So what I try to do, I try to analyze basically the very, the very sort of um, fundamental idea to transform an entire e economic region. And I will talk a bit about what we know, how this will work. And I will then probably try to point out that there are a number of challenges, actually four challenges that I will talk about later. And um, so this is really at a very abstract level, but hopefully it helps for the uh, debates we will have today. Okay, so I will be very short. It has been mentioned. We're not on track with almost any of the, uh, <laughs> the goals we have, whether it's uh, on biodiversity, uh, where, as you know, the, the negotiations also had to be postponed to this year um, on the SDGs, on the Paris Agreement. So there's, there's a lot of work on the agenda and everyone agrees. Um, to the point where people that you would not necessarily think are hardcore Marxists, like David Attenborough came out recently with a great uh, quote, and he said, you know, we need to curb excess capitalism to save nature. And I think if, if a guy so middle of the road like he says that, then we really have a problem. Okay, so uh, the Green Deal, as I said, is um, an umbrella for a number of initiatives to transform basically the European Union in its entirety um, with, these, uh, with these points I already mentioned, net zero emissions, economic growth decoupled uh, from resource use and the idea of equity. So basically it's a huge transition agenda. 
So I think we need to look into what we know about transitions and how they work to understand whether the Green Deal will in the end succeed. So um, I'm not going to talk about you know, transition theory in any, any detail, but just, just to let you know the generic idea is we're here on the left part of this, uh, and we need to push the ball into a new stable state. And this pushing is, of course, difficult because we don't have to only change one little piece. We have to change the entire system. As uh, Pim already mentioned, this probably requires deep thinking about the way we want to organize our economy, uh, going back to what David Attenborough just said. So how can we think about those um, transitions? And there's a lot of scholarship on transition theory. I'm not going to rehearse that. But we have some ideas. And I think just want to mention uh, something important. Um, this is a quote from an article that has been published a year ago by colleagues. Um, Ilona Otto is the lead author, but there are other people uh, here um, in, in, this, in this article, Johan Rockström, uh, John Schellenhuber, so other sort of uh, leading figures of sustainability science. And they thought about what system do we need to address to get the systemic change? And they were talking largely about climate, but you can apply this really uh, to this broader question we have today. So they said, and this is a quote, we need to activate contagious and fast spreading processes of social and technological change. And uh, I remember they published this a month before the coronavirus really hit Europe, because it's interesting the language, right? This is, this is talking simply about some sort of virus, but a, a good one in this case. It is about really getting this fast spreading change processes in society. But how? And they have identified a number of systems, subsystems that need to change. And they have identified a number of concrete social tipping points that could be used. And I will comment on that idea. And I will tell you a bit about that, because that is essentially what the Green Deal needs to do. It needs to tip a number of social coupled technological social systems very quickly to get us to 2050 and beyond. OK, I want to add something that is important to understand. So when you think about transitions, then often in academic debate, we have very concrete transitions in mind. So for example, we have moved from the horse carriage. So that was the typical way you get around in say Amsterdam in 1880. But we have transitioned very quickly into this, um, the automobile, so the self-moving horse carriage in simply terms, because if you think about it, it's actually really just a carriage without the horse. And to the point that we still refer to the, uh, the energy that drives the car as horse powers. So you could say, well, that is actually just a small step. But when you think about it, and that's the important thing to realize about transitions is, of course, that basically everything around that has changed as well, right? So if you know how to build a carriage, doesn't mean you know how to build a car. And if you were trained to do the one thing, it means you need to be trained to do the other. So in other words, technical specifications, regulations, um, education systems, communication and the whole infrastructure will change as well. And of course, if you think about it, how much the car has changed the appearance of the world, you need just to go outside and check what's outside. And I'm pretty sure when you look outside, it's either your backyard or street, which is made of concrete because that's the best way for cars to go. So actually this is a small step, but on the other hand, it's also really a transformation of entire systems. And that is exactly what we're looking for when we think about the Green Deal and what the Green Deal needs to do, it needs to transform the entire European ecosystem of different sectors, different economic subsystems from energy to agriculture very quickly. And um, we also know how that works in theory. It follows this S curve. So one interesting question is always, where are we actually on that transition? Are we already somewhere in this acceleration phase? That would be ideal because otherwise probably we will not make it. But um, well, this is actually up for debate, and I will also comment on that. Okay, so that is enough um, to know before I can go into my sort of analysis. So what I will do, I will use that article that I mentioned by Otto and colleagues. Uh, the full title is Social Tipping Dynamics for Stabilizing Earth's Climate by 2050, and they basically suggest six concrete interventions. So this is basically the things that need to change, the big systems that need to change. And many of those, if not all of them, are part of the EU Green Deal. The energy system needs to change. 
the way we construct cities needs to change. The way we finance and how we construct our economy needs to change. The whole normative and value settings or ethics need to change. Education systems, including things like we do today, will need to change, as do systems of information feedback. So how do we deal with accountability, legitimacy, and information? So all of those things, they say, need to change. And they basically suggest concrete interventions into those systems. So concrete things that people act as agents do, not individuals per se, but institutions, uh, decision makers, civil society, business, and partially also individuals. So I will run through those six basically interventions. And one of my main messages is that we are already actually doing a lot on each of those. So it's not that we need to just get started with those. They're already long-standing transitions here, which is good news because it also means we already basically made a way up in the slope I showed you. But there are also a number of challenges doing that. And these challenges apply really squarely to the Green Deal. So we'll talk about those challenges in the end to make sure we all understand where the difficulties are. Because this sounds really interesting, nice, and sort of straightforward. We just need to change all those systems and then we're good. So I, I have I sometimes admire the, uh, the, the positivism that is sometimes in this, uh, this type of article. So, so everything looks super simple. Of course, it's about uh, changing culture, uh, which is very difficult. OK, let's get started. So these are the six suggestions they make. Uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies, uh, building carbon neutral cities, divesting from fossil fuels, talking about the moral implications of fossil fuels, but you could also say about our lifestyle as such, and that relates nicely to the topic of today. You know, um, um, strengthening the education system and using uh, information feedback. So these are the six concrete interventions they suggest that will bring us to a uh, basic carbon neutral 2050. So you can basically apply this thinking to the uh, EU Green Deal. Okay, so where are we? And um, I, I have uh, a, a presentation where I do this in more detail, but I don't have that much time. So I'll be pretty quick, but I tried to just highlight a couple of imp important observations on each of those, okay? So let's get started. So the first intervention they suggest is really to end fossil fuel subsidies. Why is this so important? It's not about the fossil fuel subsidies per se. It's to understand that our economic system is by and large totally biased towards a number of technologies. And it's doing that basically via money that we all pay via our taxes. And that's redirected to certain interests. It has a lot of scholarship how this works and why this works, but it's simply I think astonishing to realize that we spend around six to 7% of global GDP just to make fossil fuels cheap. And in, in terms, uh, in real money, that's 5.2 trillion US dollars in 2017, okay? So when you compare that, for example, to the 100 billion that we should pay in the Green Climate Fund, which is a way to help uh, countries to you know, get basically climate action on the ground, and you really see the difference. So 5.2 trillion is what we collectively pay to make fossil fuels actually work. Now, the good news is that in 2020, COVID opened up tremendous opportunities to change that. So uh, early uh, research has shown that we see around 40% reduction in subsidies globally due to COVID. And why is that the case? Very, very simply, it's because if you're an exporting country, you earn less because of oil prices fell. So you need to actually quickly think about alternatives. And if you're an importing country, then of course the cheap oil that flows in makes it easier to actually change something in the way you usually make that oil cheaper because you don't need to do that anymore. It's cheap anyway. So you can pull away some of that money. So that is an interesting dynamic. It has been going on for a couple of years now, but you see that there is also real world uh, pressures on getting that system changed. There's, of course, also huge vested interest. I'm not saying this will just happen, but you see already a dynamic. And I want to add this other slide. You can't really see it very well, is that many, many countries, I think 100 countries by now, have pledged net zero emission targets by the mid-century, right? So that also means that actually governments have realized that to reach those net zero emission targets, they will change the subsidy systems. 
And that debate is fully going on in Europe and beyond. So this is actually good news because it means that in one of those systems that the, the researchers have identified, you already see tremendous change. I need to speed up a bit, so let me just go to the next one. Um, sorry. Yeah. The second, um, the second major challenge is to rethink the way we live in cities. And there's a lot of great research and a lot of practical things that happen. Just, uh, just recently in the city that I live in, in Amsterdam, the city council has announced a very ambitious plan to green the city dramatically in, in the next couple of years. Um, but the bigger picture is that this is not only happening in Amsterdam, but in actually 20,000 cities around the world, which are connected in so-called global city networks where they learn from each other, right? Like C40 and the Covenant of Mayors and others. So you see a global movement of cities that is actually also now spreading to the global south, because you see here the bias is very much in the north, but it's slowly spreading to the global south as well, so that we actually have what has been referred to as a city revolution in sustainability. It is the revelation that cities are key actors and, and be basically key levers of change. And it's really important to realize that this connection and this learning is going on for almost three decades now, and it's very, very successful actually. So there are many case studies that show that cities have learned from each other how to use policies locally to change. And just recently, of course, we heard a lot about cycling, you know, many cities that have uh, used also COVID as an opportunity to change transport infrastructure. And it's great to see how this is now really taking off. So a number of global cities are actually deciding right now to keep that direction and not go back to where they were before, yeah, including Amsterdam, where it will be almost impossible to drive a car um, into the city center in a year or two from now. So the message here as well is that there is a lot of um, action already happening. So it's not that we need to get started with that, which is again, good news. I wanna to move to a third thing the researchers have said, and that is the power of divestment and correct investment. And that will be very crucial for the Green Deal. The Green Deal essentially is a huge investment program if you think about it. Um, and, and recent discussions on the, on the hydrogen economy have again reiterated that it is really about where we spend our money and where we shouldn't spend it. So divestment is a great showcase how this works. And um, just want to say that the last year, 2020, has been very active in this sense. A lot of universities came out, Oxford uh, in April last year really was a big bank came out and decided to divest from fossil fuels and other public actors following suit. There's a very lively social movement as well that is underpinning this. So this is a very great example of how this social tipping is actually already happening. So I'm not saying that the system is already tipped. There are universities such as my own who have not divested from fossil fuels yet, but we're working on it. And um, we are in, in discussions also since a couple of years with, for example, our Dutch public pension fund. Um, which most which all universities are part of and, and trying to, to achieve something there. But it's also just a sign of this dynamic that these debates are global, they are uh, basically institutionalized in civil society and they're happening. This is an important reminder also for the Green Deal that this is not just about technologies, but it's really about the smart decisions that we need to take. And we'll come back to that um, when I talk about the challenges. Okay, um, yeah, if you want examples empirically why this makes a lot of sense, I mean, I just looked this up yesterday. So probably a company that very few people know, it's a, it's a solar company in the US, is as of yesterday worth more than, for example, Shell. And that is because their business model is simply better. And uh, so there's also not just good wish and you know wishful thinking, civil society and some of those students here, but there is actually really vested economic interest to get the system shifting, which is interesting to see. And uh, just recently, I, I read a report by McKinsey and they said, look, it's highly unlikely that the fossil fuel industry will just go back to what it has been before COVID. And the same is true probably for aviation and other industries that are at the tipping point right now due to the pandemic, but not just because of the pandemic but because there were other forces acting before. Again, I think this is pretty good news from a transition perspective. Okay, now another point the researchers figured out that is very important is education. 
and I think I don't need to talk about the relevance of education, but just saying that if you wanted to study sustainability sciences 20 years ago in Europe, there were two programs that you could choose. Today, there are 250 to 300 probably. And, and this is again, a testament to those transitions. Transitions don't happen overnight. They have this, they have this, um, this curve, as I mentioned. So I think it's good to know that we are actually doing a pretty good job here. Again, I think COVID is a tremendous, um, how should I say, um, tremendous um, event that will that will actually uh, f that will make everything go quicker. So we, we couldn't plan for that, but in that sense, that's the good news in that. So also education is now taking drastic steps, the education system to integrate sustainability in a much broader sense. And um, if you want to know more about it, just uh, as a means of little advertisement, there's a, a conference actually tomorrow. It's organized by colleagues um, from the University of Amsterdam, the UFA. Um, it's called Critical Perspectives on Governance by Sustainable Development Goals. And it, it is on SDG4 on education. So we'll talk about the role of education in this transition. And if you're interested, we're organizing as the, um, the Amsterdam Sustainability Institute, a lot of um, panels on that where we have panels that are discussing the implications of COVID, for example, on sustainability education. And I think all the speakers tomorrow will tell you what I tell you now, that there's this tremendous change going on in higher education towards sustainability across the board. It's really interesting to see that. Okay, so I move on quickly to morality, which was another point they identified as a tipping point. And I think this discussion this morning is a great example of that. We need to shift our debates from what's politically feasible and effective to what is actually morally required. And I've been arguing this for a long time, but I really see also that this is a much more accepted position, that normative questions around equity or fairness, but also really about rights and responsibilities have come to the fore. And again, I can only give you some very sort of anecdotal evidence, but of course, there's a lot of things happening in the recent past, um, new civil society movements popping up like Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion that actually in their different ways ask moral questions. And um, I was thinking about a good example to communicate that. And I think what has happened with individual behavior, for example, related to flying is really very insightful because it has started before COVID. So these are figures of uh, from Sweden, for example, where we had this debate in 2017, 2018, 2019, where people started to question the moral implications of, let's say, going to Barcelona for a weekend of partying. And you see that actually in the, I mean, in empirical data, the reduction here was before COVID. So this is a trend that started before we couldn't fly because people took a decision not to because of the moral implications of doing that. And this is just one example of a broader trend, I think, to reframe a lot of our debates, not in terms of you know what is effective, or what is maybe cost efficient, but what is morally right. And this is a huge change. Actually, if you think about it, probably no social movement, no social transition has ever worked without asking that question, right? I mean, you didn't get rid of slavery only on the basis of economics, although that had a major role to play. But in the end, ending slavery was also and predominantly a moral question. So why should that be different in the things we discuss here? And then finally, the last point they make is on transparency and on information. And here again, I just wanna reiterate my message. This is happening on a broad scale already. If you just think about um, how we use reporting and information disclosure to drive change, it's really interesting to see how far we got in the last 20 years. Just if you, if, if you just wanna have an empirical check again, Companies, I use Dutch companies for some reason here as an example, Dutch companies that actually do CDP reporting, that's the carbon disclosure projects, outperform other companies by 5% over a seven year period. So actually it's smart to invest in those companies and of course there are discussions on the, what's cause and effect, but you see that this is also a broad societal trend. Okay, so what I try to do really quickly um, is to say, look, we have identified the number of social intervention points and we are actually already working on each of those. And this is the good news. Now, when you apply that thinking to the Green Deal, then I would say what we can learn is that there are a number of important levers that we change them, we will change the entire system. It's our finances, 
That's one important thing we need to change. It's the way we talk about why we shouldn't or should do something, the morality. And it's probably also um, the ideas of a broad education for sustainability. As I said, to build a car is a different, requires a different skill set than building a coach with a horse. So living in 2050 in a sustainable future will require different skills from us, not just in terms of what we can do as employees, but as citizens as well. And I think that's something we haven't really reflected enough upon, and I will come back to that, because there are also a number of problems. And there are actually four that I want to identify. Four challenges to make these transitions stick that we can also apply to the Green Deal, and we should apply it to the Green Deal, because again, the Green Deal is a really ambitious transition agenda for Europe. Okay, what are those challenges? Um, and I will just um, give, give, them right, give them up right away and then talk about each of them very, very briefly. So the first challenge is the one that, and I used um, A's here just for the fun. But if, so the first challenge is the acceleration problem, which means we have great ideas. We have a lot of policies that work, actually. It's not that we, that we don't know what works, right? But the problem is to really accelerate transitions and to upscale. So we have had a lot of talk, and you can, you can basically visit that in any international negotiation. And a lot of people say, okay, enough talk. We need to start implementing. And even that is not new. I remember that the, you know, the, the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development was called the Implementation Summit because they figured out they had made enough international agreements in 1992. So this is also recurring, but uh, it's really a challenge. And, and I, I, will, I will come back to that in a second. Um, the second thing I want to mention is the question of accountability. It seems to me crucial that we switch debates, that we shift debates towards accountability. And what do I mean? We need to make sure that those people who are responsible for what's going on are held accountable on any level. And we all are also accountable in our individual roles as professionals, as citizens. And we need to make that a much bigger part of our debates. And that is not to say that we should now, you know, make individual people responsible for systemic problems, but there are actually people responsible for systemic problems and we need to help hold them accountable. Now, the third challenge is that we have done a lot on the technical front, but we need to do more on what I would refer to as agenda setting and collective visioning. What do I mean? Well, basically everyone says, yeah, we need to be carbon neutral in 2050. But how will that look like? Because there are very different ways you can get there. Let's say you can have a Russian approach, a Chinese approach, a US American approach, a European approach. And, and they, these are all ideal types of how societies will look like. And I think we are not discussing that sufficiently. So in other words, the Green Deal is another example of quite lofty uh, ideals. But how will Europe look like in terms of citizenship, in terms of solidarity and of course COVID has raised huge question marks about the solidarity bit of the European Union so how will we actually live together in 2050 in a carbon constrained world will that be a world in which citizens are free information is free um, there's uh, the rule of law and equity or is that a world in which we have reached those goals but we have traded in a number of our freedoms for example which is possible if you think about the different development path the world is taking these days. Good, and the fourth challenge I want to briefly mention is that uh, very often we have seen good ideas failing because there wasn't sufficient public support. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not calling for a planned economy here, but I want to caution that I think the, the days of the, of the liberal market economy ideology are over and everyone agrees. So the state needs to come back, but in what form? And I think the state is a shorthand for all of us as a collective needs to come back and taking responsibility for actually driving this agenda. So the European Union is doing that partially by putting a lot of money into research, um, but also the European Union is failing, I think, on doing that because they still are vested into a very neoliberal market-based way of doing that. And I just wanna provide an example to, to show you what can go wrong. If you, if you forget to really support innovation. And I use this a lot because it's a funny one, but it, I think it has a very 
it has a deeper message. So let me just uh, provide you this example. Okay, so <clears throat> if you um, cycle around in Amsterdam, um, you probably are a bit annoyed because there will be people using this thing on the cycle path. And it's an electric vehicle, super, super cool actually. Um, and it's, I think, epitomizing this idea of the modern urban transformation, right? So this is electric mobility. There, there are all sorts of car sharing schemes that use that as well. It's small, so you know there's no problem with your parking. So it's one of those things that people understand. This is how transitions will look like. This is this is the way we will change, for example, urban mobility. And it's just one example, obviously, right? And I think it's important to realize that many would probably think of this as a very up to date 2021 ish type of thing. Well, in fact, and that's a true story, we already had the same thing in Amsterdam in 1974. And this is the white car, which was a car sharing scheme, which was electric in 1974. And it was run by a computer. It was a very simple computer, but it was a computer based car sharing scheme in Amsterdam. And I repeat, in 1974. So that's one year before I was born. So, and there, there's a lot of interesting research on why this doesn't work out. But one key message is we have often good ideas right in front of us, but of course we don't take the risk to explore them because there is this ideology that the market will have to decide whether it's a good idea or not. And yes, the market can decide and the market obviously decided it's not a good idea. So that's why we don't have it. And that's why we got here only in 2020. And I don't want to have a discussion on you know, the market per se, but I just want to alert us that the European Union in their Green Deal, I think, also need to make sure that we don't fall into those type of traps. And it's, it's really interesting to see that debate right there right now with the hydrogen economy, where this is one of the key problems. How will we organize this? Will this be a top-down governmental mega project? And then people say it will fail big time, or will that be based on market forces. And of course, then it will take probably longer, we'll take a detour. And I'm not saying that I know how it exactly needs to be. I just want to remind us that this is what we have learned time and time again. There is a role for collective steering in these transitions, and we shouldn't underestimate that. Okay, so I want to close by saying these are four important things that we definitely need to take into account when we think about the Green Deal. The Green Deal is an assemblage of policies. But I think where the real problem lies is indeed, how can we be quick in making it work? How can we make sure that the people who are responsible are hold accountable? How can we agree collectively on where we want to go beyond technical stuff? Yeah, we will live in a hydrogen economy maybe, or in a renewable economy, but how will we do that as citizens, as professionals, as individuals? How will we live together? And again, the fourth thing is we need to make sure that we do this in a way that we find the right balance between public and private responsibilities. And I think if we do those things, then what we have on paper in the Green Deal will succeed. I think the ingredients are there, but I think again, we need to make sure that those debates are kept alive because otherwise the Green Deal becomes one of those policy initiatives and it will basically die a slow death. And actually, there are some signs already doing that. Um, because of COVID, of course, there are some delays. But there's also hope, because as I said, there are so many examples of the transition already taking place, that it's not just about doing it now. It's actually learning from what works to accelerate. Now, if you're interested in this question of acceleration, just want to mention, we also have a conference on that. Uh, it's actually next month. 24th to 26th of February, all virtual, and we'll have a special section on the acceleration problem in relation to climate change. So if you're interesting, interested in that, or if you have research that tells us how to do it, then you're very much welcome to this conference as well. Um, and yeah, with that, I want to thank you for your uh, attention and uh, looking forward to your questions. Hopefully you get some idea how the Green Deal could become successful and um, so the larger picture that I think is important to mention. And yeah, obviously the times, they are changing. So that's, that's just uh, good to keep positive.
Well, many thanks for, the, for this very interesting and, and, and thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, you could also play the sound there by Bob Dylan, of course. Uh, yeah, I could. Uh, I could. I have, I have yeah, a good time. As, as kind of a background yeah. underneath. So, uh, well, thanks again. Also, thanks for sharing uh, the very interesting uh, next workshops. So that's also, I think, a slight advantage of the, the getting used to having online conferences. I think it increases your opportunities for all of us to, to join them and, and to, to get all the interesting information of what he's working on uh, on, your, on your screen as well. Um, there is now time for some questions for those of you who have. Uh, you can raise your hand, you can uh, uh, shout, uh, hear yourself and, and, and get any questions uh, through the chat or directly through, through Philippe. Uh, well, I, of course, take a little bit of the prerogative of, of carrying uh, this morning's session to, to ask my question, uh, Philippe, if, if everybody doesn't mind. Um, well, I was intrigued about this divestment and, and morality thing. And uh, I fully agree that we don't want to invest in not sustainable kind of businesses or whatever you have. Uh, but talking about morality, uh, actually, I really think that the whole idea of investing, the, the share uh, holes thing, the, the investment schemes, that's also something that's not moral as such, because still in many of the schemes, even if you invest in moral just things like maybe sustainable energy or solar energy, whatever, it still very often implies growth. Uh, hey, you, you want to have revenue on your investment, be it if it's a stable investment or not, you still want to have revenues on your investment. And in many cases, the same rules then apply even as if it's a sustainable investment. So how do you think about that? Is that also something that is changing or is that something you, you would agree with so that the whole investment scheme should change? What is your idea about that? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Pim. Um... Well, that's, that's a, I think, a difficult question because it goes quite deep in the sense, I think, as a policy analyst talking about the EU Green Deal, I, I think what we all need to um, be reminded of, that it's, of course, a compromise. So the Green Deal is a typical EU thing. It says we will have green growth and we will have no emissions, but at the same time, great jobs for everyone and we will grow. I go, okay, that's, that's the politics of it. You need to say all those things to get everyone on board. How you do that? Yes, I think that's the great question. So how do we actually make those transitions? in those systems to ensure that we can actually get there. And I do think the debate about what role, for example, finance, the financial system, the financial sector investments should have and how that relates to morality is a really important question. And it's, I think, not the place here to discuss that in much detail. Um, I do personally think that there are changes in that. I mean, there's a whole uh, niche market, but still growing really of responsible uh, investment of, of, of ethical investment, right? That has kicked off only in the late 1980s and is now really a major sector to the point where every corporation will say something how that relates to them. It doesn't mean they do it, but they will, they at least rhetorically need to argue, which, which shows that there are these deeper normative shifts. The thing with those is they need some time to get really implemented, but I think we're on the right track. And again, as a Speaking as a strategist, let's say, of change, I would say the way you do that is, of course, by making those debates uh, central debates. So wherever you go, whatever you do, you can ask those questions and, and you can use that influence, right? So I think that's how you push that. But uh, in that sense, I would agree it's something that is not ideal. But from a feasibility perspective, I think it's also not really the right approach to, first of all, change the entire... Uh, investment sector and, th and then use that uh, to, to transform, the, let's say, the EU. I think these things, and that's, of course, this idea of a transition, they go hand in hand. There are all these dynamics in between, right? So I think um, that's probably the way to, to think about it. Yeah, well, well thanks, Philippe. I, I, I agree to the extent that, that you don't want to, to change too many things in order to, to move forward. Right? It's uh, sometimes uh, uh, one step forwards, two step backs, and then two step forwards, one step back. So in that sense, it should go hand in hand, I think. So, uh, well, thanks again. Um, any other questions? Uh, I see, Sharon, you had a question? I do, indeed. Um, Philip, thank you so much for your interesting ideas, also pointing towards um, the challenges. And I think I see also some, quite some solutions uh, in there as well. What I find very interesting about what you said was about the balance between public and private interests also in, um, yeah, addressing these challenges. And I was just wondering, um, well, going over the documents uh, of the European Commission, um, 
I thought, okay, well, clearly the private interest in terms of businesses, um, um, they are clearly present there. But um, I think what you mean also as a governance scholar, of course, is um, civil society in playing part, uh, you know, beyond only government. So I was just wondering, how do you see their role? I saw it, of course, with uh, these groups uh, who have become more prominent in, in um, recent years. Um, but what about more organized forms? Just so your, your, your idea really about civil society and private interests from that point of view. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so I'm a bit torn. So. On the one hand, you see that the that the the commission is they they understand let's say um, what's at stake and they know that it can't pull this off without major involvement of civil society. So they actually, for example, use pla campaigning platforms to invite citizens to come on board. So they have one on climate. I, I forgot how it's called, but there's a nice video in all you you languages where people say let's work together, and it's really an invitation for individuals to get involved in climate action. And it shows that they understood that you need that type of in, in involvement um, to get buy-in, but also actually to get the ideas how to make those changes. It's not that the, the commission knows and they just need to tell everyone. It's they don't know, actually, and that's why they need this input. And I know this also just from my own experience uh, doing some, some um, let's say, some work for the commission on, on climate change right now, where they actually want to know how to use the bottom-up, let's say, the, approach so so all the civil society action how they use that in the best way and they simply don't know how to do that but they want to so i think there's a huge opening to get let's say civil society perspectives and more sort of multi-stakeholder initiatives in there however of course there is a limit how to do that there's a sort of a glass ceiling in that and that is when you when it comes to the the vested interests and uh, of course the green deal is a great lesson in that um, there's already some scholarship that describes how the lobbying occurred around the Green Deal and who was very influential in that lobbying was the fossil fuel industry, in fact. So, of course, there is basically this, you know, this conflict going on. Um, and I'm not naive about it, but I do think that anyway, we will not succeed without involvement of civil society and the commission is willing to involve them. So there is an opening. Now, how that plays out in detail, I don't know. And I haven't done that research, I have to tell you. I mean, this is something I I'm, i don't know empirically. But I think there is a there's an opportunity to have a good mix. But of course, we shouldn't be naive. Uh, this is about different visions of the future. And that's why I say the most important from my perspective is to 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 be accountable and to to hold people accountable. If we if we use that approach, then that becomes also much more obvious what is actually going on. Okay, thank you. I think um, if there are no questions over the chat, Pim, then what do you propose? Yeah, I'm just checking with, with Frank. I noticed there were some technical difficulties. Uh, you, I see a thumbs up with, with Frank. So then I would like to thank uh, Philippe again for giving your presentation. Uh, look forward to meet you soon again, uh, virtually or in, uh, in real life. And then I would like to give the, the screen to, uh, to Frank. Uh, Frank Biermann, uh, he's a research professor of the global sustainability, uh, so with global sustainability governance, uh, working at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. And also, I haven't met Frank for quite some time, but I know him several years uh, when we worked together uh, in, in many uh, projects before. So I see it, everything is on the screen now, so I can see it perfectly, uh, Frank. So I would say the screen is yours, so uh, let's go. Thanks. You need to uh, unmute yourself, Frank. I'm sorry, yeah, no, I had a, okay. had a little internet uh, confusions this morning, but now I changed my room and I have a perfect internet connection. I'm extremely happy. I'm not happy that I can't see you in person. It would be so nice to be with you all and see also Pim and many others or meet also many of the new colleagues whom I've not met yet so far. Um, but unfortunately, we have to do it online, so we do it. Um, it's very difficult to follow up Philip, who was really uh, very much in, in detail on the European Green Deal. 
And I knew this, and so therefore I have adopted a rather broad perspective. And I was challenged by the organizers, and thank you very much for that, to talk a bit about or reflect about nature and animals. I mean, these are kind of the two key terms that came up in the discussion and the planning. And, and I bring in my own research perspective, which is very much a planetary scale. So I am a scholar of international relations, of global institutions, global governance, or system governance. And I wanted to use a few of these insights and reflections to talk about nature, animals, and of course, also the European Green Deal, which is the focus of our attention. Um, starting with nature. Um, so nature, if I look at nature, for me, it's actually an analytical term that I don't use anymore. I think that we have to fundamentally change our coordinates when we think about environment and nature. And for me personally, when I think about nature, when I hear the term nature, when I read about the term nature, I think it's an outdated category. I think in the modern world of today of the 21st century, it is a bit the world that you see on this little photograph there that some of you might recognize because it is not too far away from Maastricht and many other places where you are based. It's a world where you have animals, where you have plants, where you have fish in the sea. These people here, they are also planting flowers and tulips, very nice. But it is a place, a world that you would not describe as nature anymore. It's not nature in a way that it is undisturbed that it is untouched, that it is independent from human uh, influence. Of course, this photograph is a little bit of a biased one. This is probably the most managed piece of the earth. It's actually an artificial piece of earth. This is from Flevoland. There's nothing that is so artificial, so much shaped by humans on the planet anywhere else. But on the other hand, I would argue that there is no space on this planet anymore that is not in one way or the other affected by human influence. And if it's not affected directly, uh, then it is because humans have decided to protect it. So therefore, I believe that these old dichotomies, these binary systems of humans versus nature, humans versus an environment that surrounds them is utterly outdated. So I believe that we have to change the way how we think about nature and have we cannot see it that long anymore as this independent entity that is somehow out there, out there from the human spurs. And I've written about this rather recently about the future of environmental policy, which I also believe is a paradigm that fundamentally needs to change because it cannot really be maintained in this way. So for me, nature is more like a 19th century concept. It's a concept for romanticism. It's not a concept for political science. I don't believe it's very difficult. So for that reason, essentially my own writing, and I try also my own talking, I do not really use the term anymore. I try to replace it with terms that are focusing on integration of people and non-human agency, humans and non-human uh, um, uh, values uh, in, in a way, and see it all as integrated systems that we have now and that are shaping planet Earth at the local scale, but very much so also at the global scale. So therefore, the term, and Philip has written about it, and we have written about it in Utrecht, is the Anthropocene. Now, see this as a big, big challenge in conceptual terms. It's a new way of thinking about it. It's a notion that opens up new discourse of space for breaking up and uh, going beyond these old binaries of humans and nature and humans and environment. On the other hand, if despite all this talk about the Anthropocene and all these books about the Anthropocene, I mean, every Monday morning, the new book is being published on the Anthropocene these days. Nonetheless, we have to be also critical about the Anthropocene term. We have to also interrogate this term and see to what extent it hides certain conflicts, political conflicts, injustices, inequalities, and these kind of things. So the Anthropocene is on the one hand, a step forward, on the other hand, also a conceptual move that needs to be criticized by social scientists. For example, and this was one of my critiques 10 years ago, um, Anthropocene is creating what I call the one humankind um, paradigm. This idea that we have people, the Anthropocene, the Anthropos in the Anthropocene, that people together equally shape the planet. And this is a picture that is being generated by the Anthropocene idea. And I think this is a very dangerous one because we are facing tremendous inequalities. I come back to this in my presentation between different countries, between continents, between genders. We face 
situations of post-colonial oppression in also our own field of global change science. Uh, so therefore, these conflicts that we have on our planet that are partially actually increasing, we are hiding them away by the Anthropocene term, unless we qualify it, unless we break it up, unless we really say what we mean when we talk about the Anthropocene. Uh, some people also argue that the Anthropocene implies or creates possibilities for what some people call a global techno-managerialism. The idea that once you start to talk about the Earth system, once you talk about the uh, the, the Anthropocene, you are generating conditions that necessarily and inevitably lead to geoengineering and these kinds of eco-modernist discourses. And I object to this kind of possibilities. I think it's a possibility, but it's again something that we also have to break up in our discourses about the Anthropocene. And when we talk about the Anthropocene, we have to use it in a way that is not hiding the inequalities, as I mentioned, but it's also not opening up to uh, planetary management and eco-modernist solutions to the problems that we have. Uh, so therefore, I used also the term, I used the term Anthropocene. I also mentioned lots of criticisms. Uh, on the other hand, I must say, I also don't know any other terms. So some people say, why don't we use not a different term? And there are lots of proposals about to link it to capitalism, to link it to plantation, to link it to gender. And I believe all these other terms are important. Uh, they're high, they, they emphasize important elements of the debates, important critiques, but I believe they're not kind of telling the entire story. So therefore I'm kind of sticking with this term with all the qualifiers that I mentioned. Coming back therefore to the title of that was in the program, the Earth System Governance Perspective. And this is the idea that we have to replace um, the environmental discourse by something that is new and something that is focusing more on the system perspective at the local, regional and global scale. And this is what I call Earth Systems Governance. Governance from systems, many of them like the water system, land systems and the diverse systems, many others, but also eventually governance of the integrated planetary system, which includes people and non-human entities. Um, so, this creates, and now I slowly come to the European Green Deal, they don't be afraid of that. So that slowly, this creates a challenge for the normative debate. And this, I think, is a very fundamental philosophical question. It's a question for the environmental movement, or let's call it the post-environmental movement, because in the old days, we were there to protect the environment that is around people, or we protected nature as we understood it. So if you follow me now and say that nature is outdated, environment is outdated, how can we then define the normative space for our activities? Where should we guide our policies? What is then the target of our activities if it is no longer protection of nature, if it is no longer the protection of the environment? And this is a very, very important and very, very fundamental question for the activist, also the academic communities and anybody who is in this field, including the European Commission. I'm coming back to this. Um, there's one attempt that um, I'm very intrigued by and also worked on a bit in the past is the attempt of defining the normative space by scientists. And this is essentially the proposal of the planetary boundaries. That is the idea. I believe that most of you will be familiar with it, but I can just briefly explain this. The idea that has been laid out by a group of scientists that have now also found support by many, many more scientists to define certain threshold elements in the planetary system that if we would surpass them and violate them by our activities that would bring the planet into a different um, state uh, that is maybe uh, in, in certain ways no longer hospitable or differently hospitable for human, human species. Um, so they defined nine boundaries such as the climate, uh, climate system or zone layer and a couple of others and this is a proposal that has been defined and further developed since 2009 when the first paper has been published. And there are variations of this like the donut pr pr proposal which links the planetary boundaries with social boundaries which is again also in a way driven by experts. Uh, and here my critique uh, has been have various critiques on these ideas that I have voiced in the past, but one of the main critiques in this situation here is that I believe that uh, the problem is a scientific definition. The problem is the dominance of science in defining the normative space. So I have written in this article that is mentioned here that came out uh, last year, 
uh, that the operating space of humankind must not be designed by professors. It must be defined by the people. I think this is a very, very important part. And then the scientific research can be part of it. Of course, it has to be part of it. But the final decisions, where the values are that we want to protect, where the boundaries are that we want to fight for in our activism, in our academic research, that is essentially to be decided by democratic processes and not by expert per se. And this leads me to the main solution that has been found so far and of which I'm very supportive of, which are the sustainable development goals, which is a definition by the United Nations, which means all the governments of the world to define the operating space and normative space for the Anthropocene in the post environment, in the post nature world. So this is the attempt to say, if we accept that there is no environment out there, there's no nature out there, then these are 17 goals that we as people should strive for till 2030. And of course the concept can also be continued beyond 2030. It has been created by international agreement by governments, but also with a lot of stakeholder involvement. I must immediately say that the process is innovative, but not perfect. So I have written also a lot of critique about the direction of stakeholder involvement, of biases in the stakeholder involvement, how industrialized countries are much more dominant in these stakeholder processes than people from poorer regions. So there's lots to be criticized about the process, the way it has been implemented, but the idea to have governments and stakeholders together to decide and define what we are doing is great. On the other hand, uh, also another critique, and I share this critique is also that the SDGs are also not perfect in terms of their values. Their internal cons inconsistencies, as has been mentioned by many people in the context linking up to Philip's presentation, it's very much the internal inconsistency between economic growth which is very central to the SDGs, as really mentioned there, and the protection of biodiversity, climate, water, and a number of other values. So there is this consist inconsistency that both values are being supported, and many people would argue uh, that they are not compatible. I mean, you can't just go for excessive economic growth. I'm sure the Prime Bishop will talk about this later after the lunch break. Uh, and at the same time, probably reach all these climate and biodiversity targets. So, I mean, it's, we don't know yet in a sense. I mean, it's an assumption for the future. I have my doubts that these internal consistencies will play out. And another problem, and this is driven by research we are conducting at the Utrecht University right now in the Global Goals Project, uh, in which a team of a dozen researchers is looking at the impact that the SDGs actually have as steering tools, as mechanisms to steer societies, to steer political processes. And here I must say that now, 2021, which is six years after the launch of the goals, we don't find much evidence so far. I mean, we have looked at different countries, we looked at the international system, we have used different methods, interviews, network analysis, all kind of different studies, and we couldn't find so far a lot of influence of the SDGs on political systems. That can mean that our methods are wrong, possible. It can mean that at six years is not enough. It can also mean that this approach of having non-legally binding goals um, uh, at this level is maybe not the right way, that we need a much stronger steering mechanisms in place. Uh, leading now to the European Green Deal, I think the European Deal is the attempt, of course, of the European Union to engage and to implement maybe the SDGs. And so now I'm coming back after this big introduction in a way to what I think about parts of the Green Deal. So I can't, I can't develop ideas about all the aspects, it's just too big a document, but just some generic reflections on the Green Deal uh, and a few questions that I have in particular looking at the document, reading the document uh, and questions about less the detail, but more the big question that are maybe not answered and not sufficiently addressed in the European Green Deal. Number one, and this is one thing that is very much related to my own career for the last 25 years, I've always been driven by considerations of global equality and global justice or planetary justice as we call it these days and driven by what Gandhi has given us Mahatma Gandhi in what is known as Gandhi's talisman. And he has said that whenever you have any question, and let's say the European Green Deal is now the question on the table, whenever you have something and you are in doubt what it means, and you're in doubt what 
value it has, then you should recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man or woman. And Gandhi was not the gender balance at that time. Uh, so look at the weakest man or woman whom you may have seen. Ask yourself, is the step you contemplate, which is the European Green Deal, is it going to be of any use to him or her? Will he or she gain anything by it? So if I look at this perspective at the European Green Deal, I believe it's not sufficient. I believe that it's not sufficient in guiding European policies in changing our relationships with other countries, with developing countries, and in really engaging in a global governance program that makes the poorest people on the planet better off. It's maybe a little bit unfair because the European Green Deal is only part of a larger set of policies. But the key question that we have to ask and answer here in the sense by the Green Deal is the relationship to trade, the relationship how our agriculture systems is related to global trade, the relation like the border tax adjustment, which is part of it, to what extent will it negatively affect developing countries? To what extent will our possible reliance on negative emission technology negatively affect developing countries, especially the poorest in the developing world. It could continue with this list. So there's a huge catalog of questions we have to ask to what extent European policies to implement these ambitious goals will uh, maybe harm the poorest on the planet. And I think that's a big challenge and uh, a big research question also. I mean, the Green Deal has just been announced. So we have to see, of course, in the implementation and the coherence of this deal and other European Union and member state policies, to what extent the Green Deal and these kind of policies related to it will really protect and help and advance the interest of the poorest. And I have so far certain doubts on it, but uh, it's of course a little bit too early to tell also how it will be implemented. And then the question is also the just deal for all Europeans. And I think this is fundamental. I think European, Europe became more unequal about in the last 30 years as an effect for various reasons, including the neoliberal economic policies that have been enacted over the time. It is, on the other hand, still relatively equal compared to other parts of the planet. I mean, this is also important. I mean, so we've still protected a higher degree of equality than you have in North America and many other places. On the other hand, inequality has been increasing. I think this is a problem. It's a pro problem for, for, for various reasons, but it's also very much a problem for the Green Deal because you need support. You need to have um, the support of all parts of the world, what else part of the of the, the population. And what the Green Deal is doing, they talk about just transition. Of course, they have a huge section on the green transition. They talk about the just transition fund. But I doubt whether this is really enough. It's very much focused on those who are losing on particular policies, like those regions and sectors that are depending on fossil fuel production, for example. I think we need a much stronger policy to ensure and create more equality among our people. And there are certain ideas, I can't really develop them, I'm also not an economist, but I mean, there are certain possible policies to increase equality and reduce inequality in the European Union. I think that's one important factor that will determine also the success of these demanding and ambitious policies that are laid out in the Green Deal. So I think it has to be also a just deal for all Europeans and probably going beyond what is written there in the just transition paragraphs of the documents. And then what's also the Anthropocene, we talk about deep time, we talk about problems that will probably be about uh, beyond our lifetime. And we also talk about uh, problems which are um, solutions which are probably beyond the lifetime of our politicians at least. So if I look at the announcements of the Green Deal, they're all done by people who are 60 plus. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the bottom line of, of the Green Deal, but they will affect the next generation. They affect the young people of today. So here, I believe what's very important for the European Union and all our member states is to reconsider our democratic processes uh, in the field of earth system governance and all these issues. Uh, to reconsider ways of making the voice of young people and maybe also next generations much stronger. There are lots of proposals out there. There are lots of ideas out there. Uh, one idea I have is not really fully developed yet. We have a council of the regions. We have an economic and social committee in the, in the European Union. But we should have something like that also, like a council of the young people. 
somehow there is a European Youth Parliament, but this is more like an educative tool. It's not a tool that is in any way integrated in the decision making processes. I don't say that we necessarily need a second chamber, but a stronger reliance on young people, that we need young people who also have a stronger buy-in in the European Green Deal and all other related policies, uh, that we don't see only the 60 pluses to announce the policies of the future, but they also see young people announcing the policies that will be the ones that will affect them. So all due respect to, to Ursula and, 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 and Franz and all the others who are announcing this. I mean, they do a great job, of course, in pushing this forward, but I want to hear also different voices to push this forward. I want to have, I would like to have uh, reforms in the constitutional and democratic systems of the European Union and its member states that give a stronger vote for the stronger role for young people and also the next generations in certain ways. It's a huge open research question, but I think this is a way forward. And then, I mean, these are kind of um, two other questions I have for the European Green Deal in the direction of um, what is missing. Um, and one thing is um, we have already a substantial global warming. So it is above one degree is already warmer. Um, there are I mean, it's, it's difficult to really foresee to what extent uh, the current policies will be enough to keep um, global warming under 1.5 degrees or even two degrees. There are lots of experts who say this will definitely not be possible. I mean, it's based all on very, very courageous assumptions in the partially Philip has laid out in his transition uh, slides. Um, so I think adaptation is very important. I think adaptation is even for one degree is, is, is very important. So what I hope here is to have a much stronger debate also as part of a Green Deal of a European Union uh, that is much more able to adapt to a world that is fundamentally changed by human influences. And it is, of course, there is a European adaptation policy. It's not like that. I'm missing here also very much the global part. And this is a very difficult one. I have myself worked for 15 years on the plight of climate refugees or climate migrants or climate mobility, as it's called these days. Um, I think this is a big challenge. I mean, how do we deal with the impacts of climate change also for the regions outside Europe? Uh, and this is again the question, how is the European Green Deal and how are European policies influencing and impacting um, uh, regions outside Europe, especially the poorest regions. And here, I think there is a huge gap also in the effectiveness and maybe also in the ambition of the European Union. And this is maybe one part of the critique. Uh, a related discussion, and this is a little bit a detour, but I find this very interesting because it's one of my research hobbies, and I talked about this just last week with members of the European Parliament, is the challenge of geoengineering. I mean, this is something that has been brought forward by experts, largely from the United States, but also from other countries, is the idea that uh, we can engineer our way out of the mess uh, of climate change and um, uh, global warming by certain technologies to cool off the planet. I mean, I don't want to get into detail. One of the core ideas that has been um, put forward by experts and field experiments are currently being uh, developed is to emit uh, aerosols in the stratosphere that would block off a part of the sunlight for a particular period of time for a few one year or a little bit more and this would kind of serve as a cooling layer around the, the planet and would help us to um, to get through an overshoot scenario that at some point we have too many emissions and we are not making the two degree target and so this would be like a backstop technology that is being discussed and I'm against it I believe that is a wrong move. I think it's dangerous. I think it's poorly understood. And very importantly, uh, I believe in this idea of moral hazard here that these kind of technologies, if they were available, they would take away the motivation, they would take away the pressure to enact very, very ambitious climate policies that might be costly. Uh, and that surely will be objected by many vested interests. So this could be a way, so if these technologies would be there, it would put us at risk, it would put many people in developing country at risk, and it would 
the big argument for fossil fuel industries not to engage in decarbonization, not to engage in the Green Deal. So therefore, I think we should engage now in the discourse on limiting the possibilities to develop such technologies. So my call is here for the European Union, that's a little bit a detour from what I talked before, but my talk is here that the European Union should enact a unilateral declaration of non-use and non-development of solar radiation management, uh, or even a non-use agreement. That means that the European Union could engage with other countries, not necessarily the United States, they will not go for it, not necessarily China and Russia, but with other countries such as the African Union and others to engage with these countries to set up a global coalition of like-minded countries that has a global call and global declaration, a global agreement moratorium on the non-use and non-development of such technologies. I think it's a very important part and I proposed this to members of parliament just a week ago and I want to develop this further. I think it's a very, very important part. It's not part of the Green Deal, but the point is that nothing is happening at the European level. So in a sense, Europe is sleeping away. These technologies are developed outside Europe, uh, partially also inside Europe, but the momentum of the debate is outside the European Union and, and Europe should be active, should get into the debate and should do something about it, which I believe should be working towards a global moratorium and stopping the development of some of these technologies. So now I come a little bit to the animals. And that's kind of what, what, what Pim and, and Shiren and others wanted me to talk about. Uh, and here I'm actually extremely surprised that we do not have stronger meat policies. I believe that meat is really, reducing meat is one of the silver bullets. Uh, in the sustainability debate. I don't see many advantages of consuming meat. Uh, I see lots of advantages of reducing it. So we get better health. Uh, we have more fertile land available for food production. And also if you link it to the debate that we have on the net emissions, um, land that we are currently using for raising livestock and cattle, this land could be in many cases, not in all cases, but it could be used for for ways to increase the carbon uptake in a very, very productive way. I mean, this depends, of course, lots on the on the places. And so, I mean, it's not it's not a one on one relationship, but there are lots of positive effects if we reduce the consumption of meat in the European Union. Uh, there is also a positive income benefit to this thing that it is expensive food stuff. Uh, and of course, there are lots of reasons also in the direction of animal welfare, which I believe is also very important for the community that organized this conference. So I think that's very important. And if I look at the Green Deal and I looked at it, there is, of course, it's, uh, for, uh, this uh, farm to fork part. Um, I don't find anything about it. I mean, it's not correct. I mean, they talk about it, but they talk very much about the, the, the old style. I mean, the initial debate of changing consumer behavior a little bit. They talk a little bit about also changing the value added tax to have more plant-based diets. So there are elements in this direction. I would have expected or hoped for, not expected not, but I would have hoped for a much stronger language. And the language would be just in the direction of, um, of clear and strong and assertive and aggressive policies in supporting the reduction in the consumption of meat. Uh, and I believe just in the, I mean, organic farming, this is one way in general, which would also include also a reduction of, 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 of different ways of, of raising animals. So right now, I mean, the Netherlands is below the European uh, average. What I understand from the, from the European Green Deal is a 25 target for 2030 in organic farming. Uh, of course, you can't do that quickly. I mean, a transition to organic farming is not done overnight, uh, but I would have hoped for a much more aggressive target in this direction. Uh, I would have hoped for meat taxation. I know it has been tried and it was extremely controversial. I know there are not many fans. Of them. It's probably politically toxic for many, for many uh, 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 countries and governments. On the other hand, I think this is the way forward. We have done it for alcohol. We have done it for cigarettes. We do it also for a number of other issues. So I believe that it's the easiest way in a sense to move in this direction of over time reducing the consumption of meat. Important, of course, is again, is a just transition for all of this. Organic food is more expensive, we know it. Um, and of course, meat is also produced by people. So it is a global issue. And uh, any transition for the reduction of meat consumption over time has to be based on a just transition, uh, support policies that are 
Um, supporting people who have to pay higher cost in buying food. This is especially a problem for the uh, for the poorer communities, I think that's very important, but it can be done. I mean, any tax can be re, um, re, uh, given back to the people in a sense, the same with all kind of environmental taxes. It's not a problem, theoretical. It just has to be done in the correct way that the poor people are supported to pay the higher food prices that are a consequence. And, uh, and of course, the producers also have to be uh, addressed in a way which includes also the international um, producers. So I think that is a very, very important part of the entire equation. Um, I think what's very important is, I mean, I'm talking very deliberately about reducing meat consumption, which is driven by sustainability considerations. I'm not talking necessarily for vegetarianism. And I think there's a difference, actually. I mean, there's a difference between vegetarianism, which is an ethical principle, and meat consumption, which is a principle driven by animal welfare and sustainability considerations. And I think the community will not do itself a favor by kind of promoting vegetarianism per se by policies because it's an ethical position. For example, I put this photo of the boar here. Uh, I believe, I mean, that the consumption of this wild animal um, has from a sustainability perspective, not any problem. It's an ethical problem. I mean, you want to eat it, but from a sustainability perspective, there are certain uh, types of meat uh, that could be consumed by humans without a major negative impact on sustainability concerns. I think that's very important. So I would definitely try to keep this separate. Vegetarianism, I know uh, Philip and others are vegetarians, of course, but there are, and meat consumption are two different things and the one is driven by sustainability and the other one is an ethical proposition which i think should not be necessarily um, um, uh, be part of a, of a policy uh, to be enacted but reducing meat consumption is possible uh, it's controversial i know uh, it's toxic for many governments and politicians it's not really what helps you in elections necessarily but it is in the long run the right way forward and i missed this in the green deal so I believe that I come to my last slide. Very good. Okay. Um, this is kind of my, 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 my most uh, passionate, no, 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 I don't more passionate, but this is a slide which I believe very much. I mean, the Green Deal and all our policies, the entire enterprise of uh, governing in the Anthropocene, dealing with sustainability, advancing Earth system governance requires a strong European Union. I mean, especially in the times of Brexit, and people who talk about Nexit and all other kind of debates in this field are all wrong. I believe that we need a strong European Union for these issues. I believe that European free market and capitalism, the way it has evolved, requires strong European institutions. I believe the breakup of the European Union will not strengthen our labor and welfare and environmental uh, standards. It will harm them. It will lead to negative impacts on all the, the values and the policies we have uh, in this direction. And at the same time, I also believe they need a strong Europe to also be a strong player in global institutions, and we believe also that we need strong international institutions to deal with all these challenges. So this is kind of um, my, my European support slide, so to speak, that it is very important that we see these issues and these policies also in the larger context, that we need a strong European Union if we want to address, if we want to deal with these challenges. The one is part of the other. We can't separate them. We need this policy at European level and to have them effective at European level, we have to strengthen the union to the extent possible. So these are some of my reflections on nature, the Anthropocene, and um, also animals to some extent. And I thank you very much. And um, my internet connections are quite stable today now after some explorations. So I'm very grateful and I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, very much uh, interesting. Uh, presentation you had and also intriguingly uh, linking the sustainable development goals with vegetarianism with the green deal so i think it, it, it perfectly fitted in the ideas we had about uh, today's uh, webinar and workshop uh, i noticed i'm also looking a bit to uh, sharon that there were some comments on the the chat sharon can you take them up yes indeed and um i think we can only take a few pim uh, just to have a look at the time also with our other speaker coming up soon so but let me just also um, 
take first the one from Lisette Lemons, I believe. And it's also um, basically about the polarization that we have in society, that we have central parties, rightist parties, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, who are gaining a lot of traction and votes, while at the other side, we also have parties who want change, but who are not doing so well. And now Lisette is asking, what is necessary to change this? Is it necessary to improve communication, information on what is necessary? Or do parties need to change the way they present themselves in debates, on TV, and these sorts of things? Or do you have any other suggestions to make you know, the general public and the people more aware of the changes that are necessary? So Frank, that's a very big question, but maybe you have an idea of uh, how to answer this question by Izeta. Well, thank you so much. It's a very, very good question. And I could talk now for two hours, which I won't. Um, uh, if you look back at one of my slides that I had there, I had a photo of the green vest. I mean, this is also, we have them also to some extent in the Netherlands, but it's very much a French movement. It was originally driven by opposition against environmental policies. Um, though I believe it's uh, much more driven also by, by lots of inequalities in those countries where these kind of protests are very strongly uh, visible. So I believe um, uh, that uh, what is very important is to maintain a certain degree of inequality uh, of equ equalities in our societies. I think this is one of the key solutions um, to address many of these frustrations, many of these um, these um, oppositions against um, stimuli policies across the planet. Um, so I think that is one of the important parts of a policy mix must be to look very carefully into any policy and see how it affects the poorest people and how it affects overall inequality. For example, if you have a system like in Paris, where living in Paris is almost impossible because of the rents and the prices of property are so high, uh, where people have to commute, there's not enough sub-public transportation, so they have to commute by cars, and these cars are uh, driven by old technologies because of past industrial policies. Um, uh, and then you kind of focus only on the cars. I mean, then you create the inequality problem because you kind of hinder people to go to the, the job in a sense, or you make it more difficult. And, and that means these are environmental policies that are extremely short-sighted and are not helping, or they are kind of short-sighted in a way that they disproportionately affect uh, the less well off in a country. Secondly, I think institutions are very important. We have to very much protect our institutions, uh, which includes universities, actually. I think that's a key issue uh, that we have to protect our universities from these uh, post uh, science, post fact, uh, fake, fake, uh, fake uh, um, uh, discussions. Uh, this is a very, very fundamental. It's not easy. It requires also scientists and academics and university members to get out of their positions. I mean, I try to discuss this a little bit at, at uh, in a way how we can move forward also to be more outspoken in support of our science and be more outspoken also against certain political movements in the Netherlands that are questioning the value of science, that are questioning the expertise. And I think it's actually not, not everybody jumps immediately on this bandwagon. And scientists say, oh, we are staying out of politics. We are just scientists. We are have all political views. And so I think the universities have been much more active in this to protect institutions that are important for our democracies. Uh, and that is an important part there. And the third point I want to make is um, I think uh, I forgot the name of the, the question is now um, is the, the link about parties. Uh, I believe it's very important. I think uh, there's a lot of debate about what I call the localization of sustainability, the belief that we can just set up alternative communities and uh, change lifestyles and these things, which I think is very important. But I think the most important um, instrument, so to speak, uh, to change the world is winning elections. I think that's kind of, I mean, I think uh, those countries that have the make the biggest advance in the direction of sustainability are those parties where parties in favor, uh, those countries where parties in favor of these progressive policies have won parliaments and have changed the government. So I believe that the national political um, conflicts and national political debates are extremely important. So I think uh, it's very important also not to only engage in changing lifestyles, but it's very important also in winning elections. And there's a case, I think, in this country coming up very soon. 
Indeed, there is. So, um, Philip, I saw that you raised your hand. Would you like to add something to this discussion? Yeah, just very briefly, because uh, some of the questions um, were basically uh, driving towards that direction. And I would just want to add to what Frank said, I think, um, made two points, basic. First, I think we need much more debate about how a sustainable future will look like. It's not just about the poor and disadvantaged people, uh, because I think there's some confusion about who's voting for these parties. It's not often the poorest, actually. That's true, yeah. The poor people that believe in QN and conspiracies. Um, so, but that's a separate debate. But I think what we don't do sufficiently is to explain how a transition towards sustainability would look like and what the added value for people is. We talk about it very dispassionately, very technologically, but actually it's about how we want to live. How do you want to talk to your neighbor? What, what are the things you will do on a Monday morning in 2050? In what, sit, in what surrounding? How will the city look like? How will you go to work? What type of work will that be? Um, and these questions, I think, are very important, but we're not really addressing them. So the people don't really know what all this will be. It always sounds like you shouldn't eat meat and you need to pay more taxes and you are not supposed to go on holiday. And of course, with that, you don't win, win elections. But I also don't think that it is necessarily helpful to appease uh, you know, those people that just don't like this transition. So I think what we need is a bigger civil civic discourse about how we want to live in the future in the EU partially has a really big role to play because the EU, I think Frank said that very, very clearly, is needed, but it's underselling itself because it's perceived as a technocratic thing, but it is actually the platform for us Europeans to discuss how we want to deal with each other. And uh, if we don't use that, we're missing a huge opportunity. Uh, opportunity. And I think that's partially the answer. Um, we need more debate on those difficult issues. Um, and then we can find, I think, common ground because it's there. Sustainability is not a losing scenario. It's a win-win scenario, right? So I, there's this joke, even if climate change is a hoax, I, I think reducing air pollution, you know, going for electric mobility, uh, saving biodiversity, eating better food, healthy, is actually the right thing to do. So there are so many co-benefits, in other words, but we need to put them forward in debate. And then the final point, I agree. Elections, that's accountability uh, in a very concrete sense. We need to use all means we have to hold people accountable. If it's in our city council, if it's in national elections, it's with our teachers, it's with people in a supermarket that you hear talking nonsense. We have a responsibility to hold everyone accountable. And if we do this, then we can change, I believe. All right, thank you, Philip. I just want to say um, that we have many more questions on the chat that we cannot um, ask you now at the moment, but what we will do is also keep these questions and come back to them at the end of the session with all the participants then who are available um, to converse further on the, the issues raised. Um, so Pim, may I give the word back to you? Well, thanks a lot, uh, Sharon, and, and thanks again, uh, Frank, and also Philip, and all the others that posed the question uh, during uh, the last uh, presentation. As Sharon already pointed out, uh, we will collect them, and we have a final meeting uh, by the end of today's uh, webinar, where we'll come back to, to several of these questions in, the, in a kind of total discussion uh, as well. So I would like to uh, finish today's morning sessions uh, with the, the last uh, presentation of uh, this morning. Uh, and that's by uh, Burak John. Uh, he's a colleague of mine and Sharon at uh, Maastricht University. <clears throat> we are even at uh, the same uh, uh, faculty. <clears throat> Burak is uh, <clears throat> working at the Department of Data Analytics and Digitalization at the School of uh, Business and Economics at Maastricht University. And recently, uh, our Sustainability Institute is also part of the same faculty. So um, without further ado, uh, Burak, I will give the screen uh, to you. I hope you can share if you have any slides. Yep, uh, I'm just trying. I have a, I hope I will be able to manage sharing screen. Uh, yes, we see uh, your screen. Yes, we see it. Screen okay. is yours, uh, Burak. Thank you, Pim. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. Uh, as I said, if you remember a while ago, you posted it on LinkedIn and you used the term keynote speaker. And I just said, well, I don't know about that, but I, I'll be a keynote listener. 
And uh, I'm already blown away by the first two talks that I've been listening. I'm kind of, I kind of wish that I wish this was months before and I could just really uh, listen to all these uh, lively and beautiful talks and ideas. Honestly speaking, I don't know where to start, but I'll try to wrap up. But, but I think I should first mention, uh, as far as I think uh, Pim has kindly invited me to this talk is because of my involvement in uh, one of the central uh, uh, Green Deal topics, that's topic 1.2. Uh, there are a dozen of Green Deal topics uh, uh, that are out in, on September 18th. And the last seven months uh, we are building, we have been building a consortium to write a project on towards climate neutral and socially innovative cities. Uh, the, the, the special thing about this particular topic is uh, it's 53 million euro. And, uh, but the, this particular topic is at the core of all other topics. The reason being, if, if you have seen their topics about how to prevent wildfires, uh, how to boost social innovation or citizen engagement or farm to fork, there are different thematic calls. And there is then again, there is this particular call, which I regret having uh, started because it is just basically uh, trying to combine all the other calls, uh, all the other thematic areas. And uh, had, I, had I known better, I wouldn't have uh, started doing this uh, six months ago, but kind of destiny. And now uh, I've been coordinating this consortium in the last uh, six months and Unlike the convention in this, this Horizon 2020 and FP7 worlds, what we did differently is that we have basically called out to everyone. We made a website. We said, look, we have an idea. Would you like to just work with us? So I personally talked to 200 different institutes around Europe in the course of uh, six months. And in the end, uh, we are right now 56 partners. That's the last count of yesterday. Uh, and today we are submitting the proposal. Hopefully the deadline is tomorrow, five o'clock. And I lost 10 kilos in the process. And uh, I'm, I'm very much inspired by the previous talks. And I, I don't want to focus the talk on, on what we are going to do. Mention briefly, but uh, having listened to the talks and also uh, the, the main theme of the uh, workshop being uh, animals. I just conclude the following throughout my last six months in, in this journey, I have realized the answer to the question and I'll give it right up front. Where do animals stand in all this? The answer is nowhere. That, that's flat out the uh, answer, at least uh, through the uh, eyes of the commission. Now, uh, having said that, I also thought a little bit of why uh, this question didn't occur to me because I'm basically looking at the text of the commission and trying to find a solution to the problems that Philip actually mentioned in detail. And also Frank has uh, uh, proposed different approaches. And so it will be a very high level, very uh, abstract talk today and, and due, due to the uh, fact that I'm sleep deprived. But I wanted to put my two cents on the table uh, that will be literally two cents, not as much as uh, Philip and Frank. But I wanted to uh, address a few questions. The most important question for me is, oh, in all this green deal and all this uh, uh, systems thinking and moral values that Philip also mentioned, I think the main question we should ask is, what do we put at the center, center of it all? Uh, Philip has given very nice uh, examples on it, it, about the civil rights movements, for instance. Uh, Thinking about that, uh, you know, we, we have put the Romans at the center of it all at the time, thousand years ago. And it took a gladiator from a Ludus in Capua to shake this idea, Spartacus, and say, this is not just, this is not right. It's not the Rome and the Romans only, that this has to end. And it somehow ended at a time when the German tribes just uh, sacked the city and eventually after uh, Constantinople also fell down. And then we have expanded our understanding and then we have come to understanding that the center of it all is the white man. And it took a mother of a 14 year old kid from Chicago who lost his child 
Emmett Till, a 14-year-old kill in Mississippi to a brutal uh, bloating. And she left the, the, in the funeral, she left the body open so that all the news media in the US could just show the photo of this brutality. And this fueled the civil rights movements. And everybody said, well, we have to do better than that. This is not just white men. We are just all but one race. And that was the lie that changed the, changed the uh, understanding and expanded our uh, perspective about what is at the center of it all. Then we are at the moment in our evolution where we put the humans at the center of it all. And this, this idea has also been challenged uh, now and talked about in Philip's and Frank's uh, contribution. And a full disclosure, I'm not vegan uh, or, or vegetarian. I eat all kinds of meat, but uh, I am doomed to live with, with this cognitive dissonance that I think it's just not right that I eat meat. I want to, I'm, I'm a science fiction fan. And uh, in one of the episodes of Star Trek, I, I remember this idea first time instilled in me was that the Star Trek crew goes to a planet encounters a, a, a very powerful, uh, I think a sort of ethereal sentient beings. And these sentient beings basically they just ruin the life for the crew. And they just basically try to kill them and shake them and they, they basically cannot do anything. And then comes a moment where the captain asks, why do you do it? We have not, we have not done anything to you. We are just peaceful explorers, etc." And then the answer, these ethereal sentient beings, you know, almighty godlike creatures is, is, is that uh, because we can, because we are smarter than you, because you're just like nothing to us. And then the captain says, but this is not right. And then the sentient being re responds, this is also what you do to the inferior beings, to the beings that you see inferior to yourself, such as the animals. At that moment years ago, they didn't know, oh, yeah, that, that's right. The reason we eat meat is not because we need anymore, not in this day and age, but because we can, because we think, uh, why not? Uh, and, and I think the next step for human evolution is that level of understanding that we make connection, not only with the German tribes, not only with the black people, not only with the animals, but even on top of that, with also the planet and the universe that we are living. I think that there are first the step of the animal animals, but then there is also the step where we actually gain some consciousness that has a spiritual element of it, that being connected to uh, uh, the universe that we live in. That's a bit far fetched, I know, but I think that's going to come in a thousand years. But what I want to talk about is that we lack that understanding as species, and of course the commission is also, you know, belonging to the same species. This, this topic theme of the workshop reminded me of this, this book that I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Noah uh, Harari. And there is this quote from about 15,000 years ago, humans colonized America and wiped out 75 of its large mammals. And I find it fascinating wherever humans go, you know, we think COVID is the thing, but you know, we're just worse. We're just basically parasites on this planet. Sorry for being brutally honest about this. And, and then the fact that is not told is the industrially farmed animals that we, we turned a sentient, you know, a, a, you know, lots of sentient beings as tools, as machines for our pleasure. And that's also as brutal as, uh, you know, the killing of Emmett Till, a 14 year old kid. So it's, it's, it's an ethical question, yes, but it's not right. So I think we first have to admit that and have to learn living with this cognitive dissonance. And the more we do that as a species, we have a chance to evolve being better beings. Now, coming back to the, the particular uh, Green Deal that we are doing, uh, it has no place for that kind of uh, spiritual or, or uh, broad understanding because the commission, as also Philip said, doesn't really put it on moral values, but puts it on a market values. So when you want to change something, you cannot say like Greta, say, no, climate is dying, etc. You just have to say, 
What is the economic aspect of it? And this is it. You see, there are right now 140 cities who are taking systemic actions in their city. Uh, that's the tool that we are offering in our consortium. And these are the numbers. And if you look at the, this particular number, when I first saw that number, each city is putting about 2.6 million euro, sorry, uh, 19 million euro, roughly 20 million euro. And every year, annually, they are saving 2.6 million euro. This is pretty good. 13% return of investment, given that we don't have that high interest rates. And then it puzzled me, how is it possible that you have 13% return of investment? And if that is the case, why don't we just do it? And then it hit me, well, of course, the whole presidency now is focusing on, on Green Deal because there is a lot of juice in this. It's not because they want to you know, protect the government. There, there is that aspect, but it's really, sadly, market driven. And the fact is you have such high uh, return of investment on climate actions because uh, you have solar panels that pay off in, in seven, eight years. The technology in photovoltaic solar panels has uh, 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 developed immensely. So what they want to do is that, okay, uh, as one of the talks already had in the title, it's kind of greenwashing actually. Let's put it under a nice cozy name and then put our growth into a direction where it also helps the planet. And I'm personally fine with that, whatever works. And because through this, this challenge of making a better planet, we will have a lot of imperfect allies. We can't expect everyone to be purpose-driven. We will have to have some energy companies investing. As, as Philip also showed in this uh, uh, a company who has just gone about uh, 160 billion euro net worth, Shell is the second company. But as a matter of fact, Shell today is the largest investor of solar panels and wind energy, renewable energies. You ask yourself why? Uh, well, because of the return of investment, not because they care about the uh, future or, or nature. And we shouldn't expect that because these, these, are, these are companies. These companies operate on a certain paradigm. We have to change the paradigm and, and let the companies uh, do the work. It's also related to system thinking. We have to set the system so that the companies operate in the way we, we, we actually want them to operate. And what I want to show is again, another uh, uh, dashboard that we are pro going to propose to the European Commission. And it is, it is a serious possibility that we might actually win this bit. And we might provide these tools to all European cities, but I want to focus, bring attention to your, why particularly this photo we are proposing? Because it just shows that there is a possibility for cities if they invest in about 10 years time, that investment becomes a positive net investment, a discounted cash flow over the 15 years. This is what actually uh, this is what make, actually makes the cut for a lot of policymakers. They want to see what's gonna uh, what's gonna be the, the result financially. And that's a sad thing, but you can't expect uh, people, unfortunately, to have this uh, spiritual understanding and connection with the earth, one step at a time. And to continue, we brought all these little KPIs. Again, most of it is about how much tons of carbon dioxide saved per year and how much investment that we expect. Uh, about 1.25 billion euro invested uh, investment will go through this one so-called one-stop shop. I, I want I, I, I don't want to go into the details to bore you to death, uh, but very likely if this wins, uh, the, the European Union will go through a huge transformation. And that transformation will be something good, but it will be something imperfect. What needs to be changed is that uh, we have to bring these additional things that the moral values, the, the citizen engagement, the, the, the in inclusivity of it all, which we have actually done in, in our proposal, uh, it has to be more on the, on the agenda of Horizon Europe, which is gonna start in March. So therefore my, my talk is also a little bit call for attention in the sense that 
when March comes and when the calls are announced, I, I really think that the themes that are discussed today in this workshop should be more brought to the agenda of the, of, of the European Commission because it wasn't. And all we have in, in our particular proposal is citizen engagement, social in, in inclusion, uh, inclusivity, uh, inequality. We address them all, what, what Frank said, what, what Philip also said, but no animals, no connection to nature because that's not what drives the commission. And this is a bit of, of a summary. Uh, in case we win, you, you, you may actually uh, uh, see it more often, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm here just giving you a little bit of heads up is that we will create a marketplace. Think of it like alibaba.com at the very basics, okay? And instead of bringing together Chinese manufacturers and European buyers, what we're going to do is we're going to bring uh, service providers such as construction companies or solar panel providers or, or any company that does something that touches upon climate actions. We will fill them in our, in our repository and we will match them with city's needs. And the city will use this monitor dashboard and the calculator dashboard to drive their pathways to climate neutrality until 2050. And they will implement with consultants that are also registered on, on board. In addition, we also provide uh, open source IoT and digitalization libraries so that they can, cons they can uh, create climate data hubs. So we also propose to use all the smart city movement and di digitalization techniques for the sake of climate, and then use the other technologies that are available today, such as drones or IoT devices or citizen data donations, etc. All the data to be collected, excuse me, at the climate data hubs at the local level, so that the citizens and the cities actually are empowered by owning the data. And then they can just uh, uh, see their uh, progress across 500 cities. And uh, again, about the call, the journey of a city in this particular case will be, a city will set its priorities together with their citizens. And we expect at least 30% of the citizens to be uh, uh, under, oh, uh, to be either immigrants or refugees or uh, uh, people who are not represented very well. That's a condition. And then together with their citizens and industry and investor as well, they set the priorities because if you only leave it to investor, they will only want to invest in solar panels because that's the only thing that cashes out. After that, we ask them to visit the one-stop shop and set the prior portfolio of climate actions. It could be offering money to citizens to uh, do their house retrofitting. It could be building solar panels on their roofs, et cetera. There are uh, about a hundred existing action plans now and mitigation and adaptation measures. And we build another hundred through research and innovation. Then they sign a, a climate city contract uh, at the uh, marketplace and they start implementing through the dashboard that I've seen uh, that I've shown and then they also monitor and evaluate it through that dashboard and that's a whole complex governance of of, of this whole uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, proposal that we have but I want to skip that and leave the screen sharing now and wrap up the conversation a little bit to come back coming back to my initial point as i've shown you uh, the consortium that we have uh, built and now bidding for this particular topic has nothing to do with animals has actually uh, something to do with the nature but only nature that pays back honestly speaking and i am personally fine with that the reason being, if nobody does, nobody, if, if I don't feel fine with it, then nothing will happen. So my point is we have to take action and we have to, be, we have to ally with, it. we have to have imperfect, we have to be okay with having imperfect allies. That could be Shell, that could be energy companies, that could be you know, uh, super neoliberal uh, 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 initiatives, etc. Whatever makes the cut, to make this planet a better place, 
it's okay to uh, uh, collaborate with them for the moment being until a time where we can actually realize it's not just until a Spartacus or, or Emmett Till or a COVID happens and we just uh, achieve a higher plane of comprehension about our connection with the universe. I'd like to thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity, Tim. Uh, I, I've gained much more than I could have given uh, to the table and I'm uh, fascinated by the talk and I'm open if you have any questions, the best of my capacity. Thank you. But you're on mute, Tim. Yes, now I am not. I pushed a button, but it didn't work. Thanks a lot, uh, Burak, for his very uh, nice presentation, introduction, and sharing your thoughts. Um, uh, again, I, I, have a, I have a question that, that pops up, so uh, I hope all of you don't mind that uh, I, I ask my question first. I was intrigued by one of your slides with a question where you actually uh, didn't give a precise answer to. It was about Green Deal and does it help the bio industry? Roughly translated by myself. I think it was more elaborate than, than that. Um, so, and then you also came back, you're actually fully uh, right. That's kind of a cognitive dissonance we probably all have by still eating meat and knowing that's not the case. We do. Uh, you address the issue that in the Green Deal, uh, animals in nature are hardly being mentioned. That's something we experience from first hand uh, as well. Uh, by the way, it's, it's very much like climate negotiations, kind of protocols and reports that animals in nature are being mentioned, especially animals as kind of commodity, as product, or as kind of a cause of greenhouse gas emissions. So these are the two key elements animals are part of. But coming back to my question, do you think the Green Deal will help the bio industry, will help the animals that suffer in the bio industry? Or do you have, uh, take from an economic point of view, or maybe a moral point of view like uh, the other speakers did, what do you think? I, I think it will. I think it will. It will indirectly. It will indirectly, but uh, it, it will take years uh, to come to an understanding. And I think we're at the very early stages of understanding the, the way we live is just not okay. And one particular example is that we, I, I've shown this slide about meat industry and Frank also mentioned vegetarianism, etc. The only reason that this is becoming an issue is because in the last two decades, especially the, the world has accumulated so much wealth and it's because a lot of a lot of the poor in the South has gained a lot of uh, average income that they have started consuming more meat than they actually could have afforded with uh, two decades ago. And this is the reality. So in, in equal, equality doesn't also always help in that respect, but, but what kind of uh, an inequality, it, it, should we have kept it unequal like two decades ago? Now it has become better. You know, India got richer, China got richer, but as a consequence, the meat production has increased and it has become even more industrialized in its days and in China and everywhere. But my point is that this whole industrialization of meat has become a problem, not because of the ethical reasons, but because of the greenhouse gas emissions, so on and so forth. I'm fine with that, but maybe when we, just uh, address it through that market-driven or human-centered driven perspective. With that in time, we can also achieve, wait a second, it's not just because it just makes our planet warmer for us, but it's also because it's just not right. You know? And that's why I wanted to give this example of Rome or, or Emma Till and, and civil rights movements. We come to an understanding slowly, you know, but we do, people sit in the back of the buses, you know, this, at some point people realize this is not just right. And this is how uh, I think it, it will happen. That's my projection. I quickly want to address another very quick question about 13% return of investment. I have to make it very clear. These are cities that are already using these tools. And of course they are cherry picking all these low hanging fruits. If you tell them, you know, why don't you use this device which sucks up the carbon dioxide uh, uh, through the air uh, which costs a billion euro, they won't do that. What they would do is that, oh, you know, there is this nice project in Utrecht where you actually connect the solar panels uh, 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 with the house mortgages. And whenever somebody buys that house, they actually pay a 50 euro like a service cost, but they pay the solar panel in 30 years and their energy consumption is reduced. These are the kind of things that they cherry pick. 
And that's how they get to a 13% return of investment. <clears throat> but it's pretty good still. Thanks, uh, Burak. Um, I think there's another question in the chat, isn't there, uh, Sharon? Yeah, so maybe we can uh, make this also the final question for now, Pin, um, before the lunch break as well. But there actually, um, Lisette Lenz again, um, she asked a question, um, basically saying, if you want to achieve, uh, achieve more citizens to participate in their city, um, then it would be logical to make children also aware of the chances. Uh, so one of the uh, lessons uh, it could contain is to citizens, um, in which world do you want to live as a question? Do you agree with that? Or what is your view or, and your opinion on increasing democracy and the involvement of citizens and also um, I think young people in this sense in the near future? Budak, do you have any ideas about this yourself? Uh, well, the answer, the quick answer is, uh, Yes, it is logical, and yes, that's why we see, uh, you know, uh, youngsters, teenagers uh, crossing the ocean, and then, you know, being on TV, uh, etc. And th that's precisely the reason. And yes, uh, because they are new generation, and they are not traumatized by the by the uh, generations uh, of ours, having seen the Berlin Wall collapse and such things. They are they are born on the age of internet. They are different species almost, and they should be trained as such, and they are. And it is, that's why I'm more positive. And in the near future, uh, it will be more better. Regarding farm to fork, quick an answer is that, again, it will help. It will help the animal rights, et cetera. It helps not putting uh, all these pigs in inhumane conditions because people say, oh, this is bad. Uh, but it's, it's, again, what's the center of it all? Our, you know, so that we don't feel sad or it's just not right. And, and the, we will come to an understanding slowly. It will take a 50 years, perhaps a hundred years, but we will come to an understanding. We belong to the same planet. We belong to the same universe and we have to share it with all the other species as, a, as sentient beings. And I think that also requires a little bit of a spiritual enlightenment. That, that's, that's, that's for later. That's for later. One, I think sure. there's another question. Time for another one. I see uh, Anna also posed a question. I, uh, I addressed that quickly about farm to fork. Uh, that's it. But if I may, I'd like to uh, refer to one, one quote that Frank gave about Gandhi, uh, about uh, 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 what is the, uh, uh, the minimal uh, at welfare. It's a very social. Well, it's a very social welfare uh, theorem-like thing. It's just the, the poorest or among us that matters the most. And we are as good as the poorest or as good as the worst among us. Idea of it. This this reminds me of, of an anecdote very briefly uh, between uh, Rumi and Shams uh, in Mesnevi. Shams, the companion of Rumi, says, "Rumi, you cannot feel warm if there is a single person shivering in the cold." on the world. So that's the kind of comprehension and compassion that we need to have, not only for the humans, but also for every other sentient being and the planet. And until then, these remain ethical questions, unfortunately, but it will come. That's all I'm saying. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, sorry for talking too much. No, don't be sorry at all. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the contribution uh, you made. And also many thanks to Philippe and, and Frank. Um, well, we're closing this more than part of this uh, today uh, webinar, so I think we all could need a kind of a stretch uh, coffee and something uh, to eat, probably go to the toilet, uh, whatever you need to do. Uh, we will be back in half an hour, if I'm correct, um, half past 12, to start with the second half, a tree, uh, a new speakers, and then after that we will have a kind of a plenary discussion on various statements and uh, unresolved issues we still have on the table. So uh, again, thanks all for, for being around uh, this morning, for uh, paying attention to the presentations, posing questions and being interactive. Very much looking forward to see you back in half an hour. So see you then. Um, all right, so welcome everyone. I see that people are uh, getting back to the room again. We will just allow everyone to do that. Um, but welcome to the second part of today's session in which we will 
delve deeper into the various viewpoints on which voices are currently missed in the European Green Deal and what added or alternative accounts need to be considered in going forward. The setup is actually similar to the first session of this morning, but in case uh, you have missed it, let me just briefly repeat it to you. I will shortly introduce um, the three speakers that we have for this particular session, after uh, which uh, the floor is for that speaker to um, present their talk. As members of the audience, I am sure that you have questions or comments uh, that you would like to add to the conversation. So please don't be shy in this regard, just note them down in the chat. And, um, after each presentation, we'll select a few if they're there, and then uh, we ask the speakers for their response. In case we are short on time, because the talks are so interesting, and we, I think we can deliberate for hours uh, if you want, but we will keep some of those questions also for the later session in which we want to invite you uh, for more open and interactive conversation with all of you. All right, I hope that is clear to all. So let me then um, take the liberty to introduce the first speaker of uh, this session. And it is Bram Buscher. Bram Buscher is professor and chair at the Sociology of Development and Change Group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Bram has published over 80 articles in peer reviewed journals and edited volumes. And um, one of his most recent publications is actually The Conservation Revolution which is written by him and co-authored by Robert Fletcher. I think the view that Bram will express today will be largely connected to one of the main points expressed in his academic work, uh, which is also expressed, I think, in the title of his contribution for today, which is a Green New Deal needs a radically different conservation towards a convivial alternative. So Bram, we are very happy to have you here and I would like to give the floor to you. Let me just first unmute myself. I think the most common phrase these days is you're still muted. So that hopefully is sorted. And then I need to get my uh, PowerPoint back up. Let me see if this works. Good. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation like this? Great. Yes. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Seren and, and, and Pim, for the invitation and to all of you for joining. It uh, really is a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and I'm sorry that I had to miss the, uh, the morning sessions, but I look forward to the discussion and the other presentations uh, in this session. As Seren already mentioned, uh, yeah, my presentation is entitled A Green New Deal Needs a Radically Different Conservation Towards a Convivial Alternative. And I must say uh, uh, in the beginning, I, I'm not an expert on the EU Green New Deal. Um, I have done some of my homework to try to, you know, at least read some of the policy documents and uh, look at, you know, the, the EU Green New Deal website and some of the other things. Um, but I'm not an expert on the Green New Deal. So um, please, uh, I, I you know, depend on all of you to bring that information in and ask questions and I hope to have a debate with you all uh, on that. But what I noted and uh, noticed in uh, going through uh, the Green New Deal and some of the yeah, communication around, uh, around it is that it's actually rather similar to some of the debates we have seen in, in conservation over the last years that the book uh, that Taryn just uh, just mentioned it, it's all about this book, The, the Conservation Revolution, uh, Radical Ideas for Saving Nature Beyond the Anthropocene that I wrote with Rob Fletcher. So what I want to do is highlight a couple of different elements of the book in relation to some of my own ideas about the Green New Deal and how I think they, they may sort of, um, or at least some of the discussions within conservation may be able to shed some light on, yeah, on, on this aspect of the of the Green New Deal. So there we go. Um, just by way of, in, so that, that, that's, that's literally my goal, not to give you a whole overview of the book or, or whatever, uh, but really to connect these two, these two discussions. 
So when I read and go through the materials of the Green New Deal, the first thing that, that immediately pops out is, uh, is uh, in, in, in the introduction video on the, on the website by uh, Ursula von der Leyen is, is that she, the first thing she says literally is that the Green New Deal is EU's new growth strategy. So, um, you know, that, that, for, that, that is the central starting point of, uh, of the entire, uh, entire policy. And to be sure, it has some really important goals. If I look through it, uh, I, I certainly don't just want to be uh, negative about this. I think it, it is an important step that um, in some ways is being made. And some of the things that I, I pick out, for example, you know, is the focus on, on more greener cities, uh, increasing biodiversity, also in particularly in, 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 in um, sort of living and inhabited landscapes. So this for us is, is really important and I will show a little bit why in, 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 in a minute. Obviously carbon emission reductions, etc. So I think these are really important goals that, that, we, that, that we shouldn't underestimate and that are, are absolutely critical. At the same time, and ultimately, um, it's not enough, I, I think. And hence, and I say this very deliberate, it's not a realistic strategy to deal with the problems of our time. Basically because the EU wants, you know, wants to have its cake and eat it too, and that's never really possible. And hence why I'm saying it's not realistic, because a lot of policymakers would say that this, this is the only kind of realistic thing. We need both growth and all these kind of things. But given the, I think the, the, the environmental problems that we face, uh, we need a different type of realism. And this is again, something I will, I will come to in a moment. The main issues for me in the Green New Deal is first of all, the very central element of decoupling to decouple growth from its impact on ecosystems, uh, animals and ecosystems. Uh, and this is simply not possible, right? It, 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 there's no evidence whatsoever. And my co-author Rob Fletcher has written extensively about this. Uh, even you know recent studies from the uh, from the uh, oh, the European Union uh, sorry uh, United Nations show that decoupling is 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 a very marginal strategy in the end. I mean, of course, there are all kinds of discussions about absolute decoupling, relative decoupling, uh, etc. But ultimately, it's not um, it's not a viable strategy. We can talk about this more if you if you want to, and, and perhaps you have already have. But the other element within that, of course, is the whole point of efficiency. And efficiency for me is not, is certainly not anymore uh, a solution, but rather a problem. I don't know about all of you, but you know, my life to a degree has become so efficient that I, I never feel I have time for anything anymore. And anything that I want to do must be as efficiently, you know, put in between all the other things that I must do efficiently as possible. I'm actually longing for, you know, some kind of life where efficiency is no longer a goal, but you actually have some freaking time to do the things that you want to do. I'm sure many of you can uh, can relate to that. So ultimately, it does not actually go to the roots of of, of the problem. It it, it tackles them. I mean, it, it touches on some of them, and there are you know clearly some of the issues do come out, uh, but it ultimately doesn't tackle them. And so this for me shows that a different overall but especially also conservation strategy is needed and this also ties directly into our sort of analysis of current conservation uh, dynamics um, to give you a bit of an introduction to to that one thing i'd like to i'd like i normally like to start with is comparing and contrasting sort of the the, the role of you know, biodiversity conservation within the broader political economy through two very simple graphs. This is the famous uh, set of graphs that I, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, under the heading of the Great Acceleration that play an important role in the, um, in the discussions on uh, the Anthropocene, the idea of the Anthropocene that, you know, us humans are now the dominant force on, on the, the planetary system. And behind that is this idea of the great acceleration where across socioeconomic trends, but also earth system trends, you know, from carbon dioxide, 
you know, to even here, shrimp, agriculture, domesticated land, but also transportation, dams, energy use, etc. We all see coming from 1750 to now a set of what you know so-called hockey stick graphs, right? So it tends to sort of slope upwards slowly and then go very, very quickly um, uh, rising upwards. And, um, and hence, I think what this picture shows is sort of a clear unsustainability of our global system. You know, it's very, very clear that these things can't grow in that same way anymore. Um, conservation, you know, biodiversity conservation, and particularly through its main um, main uh, strategy, namely protected areas, has often been seen, or is often sort of is often shown as an, an alternative, right, or something that tries to mediate these kind of forces. Um, and to to get away from the worst. And to um, and to enable the conservation of, of, of biodiversity, animals, species, and ecosystems. Um, but if you look at this picture, uh, it has a similar type of hockey stick graph. So this picture is the, the the growth of protected areas or areas under some form of global of, of protection, both a marine and a terrestrial, and the cumulative total area under un, under protection globally. So you can see again from the early 1900s that this is, you know, uh, particularly from the 60s and 70s, gone sharply upwards. And so what this indicates for me is that the main way in which we try to protect biodiversity, right, has grown at exactly the same time as the problem has intensified. So as the global biodiversity crisis and also the extinction crisis is intensifying, conservation, the mainstream type of conservation is also intensifying. And what that actually says is that it's not the solution to it, but actually it's part of the problem. And hence why we need to rethink this quite fundamentally. And this is what we've been trying to do in that book, The Conservation Revolution. So, you need to think about system redesign more generally, right? Uh, and, and, and of course, the EU Great Green New Deal tries to get there in some way or another and talks the talk, but doesn't actually do that, like what is currently happening in the, in the conservation uh, sector. And I think that's sort of short, I mean, I mean, there's a much longer history, of course, but that's short sort of brief two graphs, which kind of show the history of conservation, right? show that it's deeply connected to broader political economic developments and that we can't take it as separate uh, from those. Um, interestingly and importantly, this is what we're currently seeing in what is referred to generally as the Anthropocene conservation debates. So the whole idea of the Anthropocene and the current crises have had a huge impact on the um, on the debates within conservation for all kinds of reasons that I won't be going into. But interestingly, they do touch on, on two foundational uh, elements that I think are also important in the, in the EU Green New Deal. Namely, how to deal with you know, the relationships between you know, nature and people. And of course, this is very central, I think, to your, to your project as well uh, that, 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 that you're working on and why we're having this seminar. And the question of economic growth that I also sort of outlined and highlighted in the um, uh, in the European Union uh, Green New Deal. So if we take those two elements as two very basic axes to try to understand those Anthropocene conservation debates that I just mentioned, um, a couple of things become sort of noteworthy. First of all, how you can sort of map the different sides of the debate, which I will do in a second, but also how they could be a sign of broader and more fundamental changes to come. Whether they or not they will come is a question I want to, I want to come to, but I certainly do think we need to push for that. But all in all, uh, all in due course, let me first sort of briefly 
try to fill in uh, this sort of simplified heuristic, this simplified model of, of those Anthropocene conservation debates. So if you have four different quadrants along these two axes, the separation between you know, people and nature or going beyond that, trying to integrate them and how to deal with, with economic growth in our sort of yeah, capitalist political economy. Then mainstream conservation has really been sort of, you know, focused on protected areas um, and in many ways sort of separated, you know, nature and people in order for biodiversity, ecosystems, etc., to thrive. It's always been a response also to and never been a fundamental critique of our, our contemporary political economy and especially of, of the idea of economic growth and hence why we put it in that in that bracket and hence why I also said in the beginning of my presentation why you know that there, there is such a strong relationship between the growth of protected areas and you know all these other similar type hockey stick uh, graphs. Now within the conservation community and because of the Anthropocene, because of the extinction crisis, you know, because of uh, climate crisis uh, and broader socio-economic crisis, I think we've seen massive debates on this within, within conservation, but also critiques of this mainstream sort of picture. The first sort of real fundamental um, critique came from a group of people, you know, that came from mainstream conservation that referred to themselves as, as new conservationists. And they said, you know, conservation ultimately is failing to protect biodiversity um, uh, and worse, it even, you know, is negatively affecting people. So we need a different conservation strategy uh, completely. We need to go beyond these myths of, of wilderness and, and protected areas, because uh, even the idea of wilderness is a human invention. Um, we need to find new ways that we can bring people and nature together so that conservation does not lead to poverty, but actually can help reduce poverty. And it, you know, uh, biodiversity conservation becomes part and parcel of our economy. Um, and they want to do that in sort of a mainstream economic way, and hence they're in that particular quadrant. Now that has seen a huge backlash again from others within, you know, within sort of yeah, the biodiversity conservation, more the mainstream. Um, and we refer to these this this group as neo protectionists or back to the barriers folks, etc. And they, they said, no, I mean, this, this new form of conservation is ridiculous. It's becoming more like a form of development rather than focused on biodiversity and nature. And hence we need something very different that really puts the focus on what nature needs, what, what animals need to survive, what, what, what ecosystems need to thrive. And the, the problems are so big at the moment, uh, some of them say that we need to separate nature people on a massive scale. So uh, E.O. Wilson, for example, advocated for this idea of half Earth, that half the entire part of the planet goes or should go into protected areas. Now, there's, a big, there's been a big debate, should they be very strict protected areas or, or loose? And, and this has developed over the last couple of years. There are you know, big um, uh, uh, international sort of goals like 20-30% uh, of the, the planet by 2030 protected etc but a lot of that is sort of focused on that separation between nature and people initially not so much anymore I must say a lot of these neoprotectionists were also very much focused on that at the same time we also needed to challenge things like growth and endless consumption etc and hence why we put them in this you know left bottom uh, quadrant. Uh, the important thing for us, as I said before, is that these two, these two, you know, quite fundamental critiques of mainstream conservation have erupted over the last 10 years as a response to the crises of our time. And so they kind of show that, 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 that a lot of things are happening on the one hand, and at the same time, that which we think is actually you know a good thing they are touching on the fundamental issues of the debate that we actually need to talk about but they don't yet go far enough so we in our book say 
you know, you can't really do one without the other. You know, if you want to stay within, you know, mainstream capitalism or mainstream economic growth, right, through the market system, which depends on making things into commodities, which necessarily separates them again from their, you know, their environment, it means separating nature and people in all kinds of insidious new ways. So new conservation can say they want to go beyond that, but going through capitalism is, is a bit of a different, <laughs> difficult proposition because the history of capitalism and conservation is really uh, entangled. At the same time, we think that separating people and nature on the scale that neo protectionists uh, promote is really problematic, not just because we think it won't work, which is already problematic enough, but also because if you would want to do that, it has huge implications for peoples literally around the whole globe, particularly, of course, uh, the poorest. And hence, we actually suggest a third alternative, which we call convivial conservation. So a convivial uh, alternative to, to both of these, which actually goes beyond people and nature and beyond economic growth towards a complete, you know, sort of system redesign. And I want to, you know, basically use the rest of my, uh, my time to just lay out some elements of that vision to all of you to, to trigger a debate and make links with, uh, with the EU um, Green New Deal. So just to sum up what I just mentioned, or what is most important, right, and how to bring the two together is that you know, these three currently dominant perspectives in the conservation debate, mainstream conservation, new conservation, and new protectionism, like the EU Green New Deal, do not go to the roots of the problem, right? Why not? Because they do not take the history of political economy seriously enough and so fail to present a coherent system redesign. And exactly like what I would, what I would argue is happening currently with the, with the EU Green New Deal. At the same time, we argue that these radical challenges are important because they you know, are signs of the need for systemic transformation. And this is how I read the EU Green New Deal as well. So how to move forward? How to do justice to the radical impulses we see around us, but also move move beyond them. And this is where we promote uh, the case for convivial conservation. And I have a little video here that I that I am going to play and I hope this this works so that all of you can actually see see the video. It's, it's just three minutes. So it'll be quite quickly quite quick. But I hope it works with the sound but please let me know if not. Remember this guy? Well, its fate is soon to be shared by many more species of animals and plants. Species that are key elements of ecosystems vital to us. Economic growth is putting continuous pressure on valuable habitats and species. So what to do? Can we still change the tide? Can we protect the earth by putting a fence around half of it? We don't think so. We think trying to protect nature top down and at a distance is a losing battle, a battle that is turning more violent as biodiversity becomes scarcer. What about turning nature into a product, allowing businesses to trade in nature's services and protect biodiversity with the profits? This sounds logical, but really isn't. Continued resource extraction and land use change the root causes of biodiversity loss are not addressed by this model. In fact, it even depends on them. There is an alternative. It's based on two main principles. The first, let nature flourish more freely and let people be part of it. Allow nature to flow deeper into our cities and integrate living spaces into ecosystems in a durable way. Some human places will become wilder. Some wild areas may become more human. Secondly, we need to transform the economy. Right now, it is highly unequal and leads to intolerable pressure on the planet. We must balance and align human needs with those of the rest of life. An economy demanding endless growth can't accomplish this. To ensure that all life can flourish, the wealth that we already have must be distributed more equally. We call this whole earth vision, convivial conservation. 
This requires changes in three main domains. The first is landscapes. How can we rethink rural and urban landscapes so that humans and other life forms can flourish side by side? Second, we need to change how conservation is financed. For instance, a conservation basic income for people living near biodiverse areas could support sustainable livelihoods and lead to forms of development based on care rather than competition. Finally, we'll need to organise conservation more democratically. This means that those with the largest footprints must change their livelihoods the most, even if they live far from conservation spaces. While inspired by countless initiatives under development in many places, the convivial conservation revolution is only just beginning. Much help is needed to expand this emerging vision into a movement able to transform policy and practice throughout the world. Get on board. The case for con. All right, so that's a very quick um, promo for uh, for the convivial conservation work that that we do. But just to sum up, um, you know, for us, convivial conservation is an intertwined strategy beyond growth and beyond the nature people dichotomy. Um, and I will say a little bit about what that means in, 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 in the next slide. Like I said at the beginning, it's deliberately not realistic if realistic depends on the current type of capitalist realism, right? But what Wark actually calls an act of alternative realism, which opens towards plural narratives about how history can work out otherwise, right? It's not teleological, you know, you know certain things, you know, that are not so supposedly up for discussion are actually up for discussion. And it's part of a much broader wave of movements that demand exactly this, even though they're different, right? They're, 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 they're very different. And I think, Pim, you know, your work is also sort of, you know, part and parcel of, of, of this, again, different. But at the same time, we also feel that a lot of these things in certain kind of important ways come together. Um, and that you know we see this as different kind of streams you know in a, going towards a much broader kind of river demanding you know actual and structural transformation and clearly you know the fact that we're meeting like this right due to the COVID-19 crisis shows that it's more needed than ever now okay where do we want to go and how do we want to get there this is of course <laughs> the most uh, difficult thing um, and especially something for that Academics sometimes feel a bit queasy about. It's taken me about 15 years after my, uh, I think, sort of after my PhD to 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 finally feel you know confident enough to to present uh, some of this. But I think at the same time we have to we have to you know use our our knowledge and our ideas also to to become part of this political political domain. So what we do is propose some long-term propositions, a theory of change and some short-term elements, and then I'll just wrap up. So for conservation, this is specifically for conservation, right? Not, not for the whole EU Green New Deal, but for conservation, we promote five long-term idealistic propositions. The first is to move away from the ID of protected areas to rather go towards an ID of promoted areas. If we see biodiversity and all this as separate from us, if we need to protect nature, you know, from ourselves, something is wrong, right? And I felt this for a very long time and now I actually put pen to paper, right? So we should not set nature apart or turn it into capital, but really integrate the use of nature into social, cultural, agrarian and other contexts. So it's, it's, it's like a reverse kind of polony kind of re-embedding of big natural, uh, natural areas. At the same time, we should not just save nature, save non-human nature. We are nature as well, and we're part of, you know, those interactions. I think, and this is, I think, what I understand, a central sort of element of 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 of, of the project that Sharon and 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 Pim are part of. Um, and so, to we 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 say we need to move from saving nature to saving and celebrating human and non-human natures, and very more pragmatically of the long term, this means that we need to relearn needs. We need to, A, better understand the needs of animals, 
of ecosystems and B, put our needs in relation to that. So we need to rethink our needs. Do we need all that we are supposed to need or do we need, you know, or, 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 or is that fundamentally contradictory to, you know, ultimately the needs of non-human others? Um, and of course here, you know, our, our system is in inherently problematic, right? Commercials day in, day out, tell all of us that we need all this, we need this, we need this, but we don't actually, if we think about it. And this is part of that relearning. So in terms of conservation, you know, a lot depends on tourism. Um, so we figured the tourism industry is not very sustainable for the long term already. Well, after the COVID-19 crisis, it's become utterly uh, clear that if you let, you know, the basis of life, you know, depend on tourism, you know, for people to fly around the world, spend money to, to save uh, biodiversity, it's not a sustainable strategy at all. And hence, we need to change, you know, tourism, moving away from Puristic, speedy, you know, touristic, what do we call it? touristic voyeurism, been there, done that, big five, moving on, blah, 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 to more slower, long term, engaged visitation. We still think travel is important, but it should be visitation rather than touristic voyeurism. We need to think differently about nature away from the um, uh, spectacular David Attenborough type of, you know, uh, nature channel documentaries to appreciating mundane natures you know that we that we live with every day right rather than the spectacles that that that, that we increasingly tend to um, tend to see on tv and finally this must be part of broader common democratic engagements rather than privatized expert technocracies that a lot of conservation has historically focused on good so this is the long-term picture this is where we want to get to how do we get there how to promote for fundamental and sustainable or structural transformation. So in our theory of change, we focus on three central levers, power, time and actors. So dealing with power means a focus on political struggle and strategy, right? Really taking differential interests as the starting point to deal with institutionalized forms of accumulated power, right? All those graphs in the beginning depend on all kinds of institutions from the you know, world uh, trade organization to the kind of culture we have built, right? And those are forms of accumulated power over time. Some of these need to be dismantled. Some of them could be refigured, reconfigured and others can be built or should be built from scratch, right? Across material and discursive domains. So both symbolic change but also real material change in terms of technology, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of anything and everything. One example here, currently we work with the, the Dutch Planning Bureau for the Environment, the, the PBL, to build scenarios for this new type of thinking in their post 2020 biodiversity frameworks. So one thing we actually found out is that, you know, some of these key assumptions that, that, that we're talking about in these conservation debates Right, about integrating people and nature, for example, really underlie these same type of models that they use, which is very fascinating. So one of their assumptions in their big, you know, like scenario analysis modeling is that less people means more biodiversity. But if you want to integrate those two, those are very different uh, problematic, or those are problematic assumptions. And so you need to build new institutional forms based on these new models. Secondly, dealing with time, means that you need to always connect long-term visionary direction, direction and short-term practical action. And that change is always a two-step strategy, right? From radical reformism to systemic transformation. And so this for me is really not what the current Green New Deal actually ultimately, um, ultimately means. For me, the Green New Deal in that sense is kind of, I would like to, <laughs> summarize it as the more things change, the more they say the same, or we need to change everything in order for them to, to, to say the same. And that's simply not a, a structural transformation. Let me just move a little bit more quickly in terms of time. Um, so uh, lastly, the third element of our theory of change is dealing with actors, is that we must acknowledge, and this is also why it's so political and why we want to politicize things, because we need to acknowledge and mediate the variegated political positions of different actors within a fundamentally uneven conservation field and or terrain. So what we show in the book, you know, what we do as a, another heuristic 
is different kind of classes that are important within the global conservation uh, kind of landscape, right? Upper classes, land owning classes, middle lower classes, and lower rural classes. And these four, this fourth category, they are often the people sort of targeted and they must change their lives often in order you know, for conservation to work because they live in and around conservation areas. But it's also these others that must change their lives, not just them, and you must sort of connect them. And that for us is absolutely critical going forward. And why we are now sort of working with an organization to develop something we call conservation value chains to relate these di different actors to each other and to focus on the politicization of the relations and to try to level the playing field. Lastly, and then I'm finalizing and, and, and wrapping up. Now, what are some, some concrete actions to shift the political terrain on the short term for conservation, right? First, we think absolutely the first start must always be historic reparations, acknowledgement of past injustices and a focus on holistic decolonization of conservation, including its incredib incredibly uh, you know, problematic racial class and gender dim dimensions. I don't know whether this is something you all have been talking about this morning, uh, my own field research has been in South Africa a lot, where particularly whites have a closer relationship to many animals than they have with black people. So if you as a white person come there and you say you want to protect animals and you don't take into account people, you actually make probably the plight of animals worse than, than, than better. And hence why we say we must first and foremost address you know, the decolonization of conservation. Second of all, we promote a conservation basic income, which is basically a monetary payment to individual community members living in or around promoted areas to allow them you know, to lead a locally defined decent life. And this is unconditional. So this changes you know, the debate a little bit, but it's unconditional because we want to decolonize. We don't want white people with money to now tell other people how they should live their lives. But we do want to get into a conversation with people about how to develop different development models, right, for the longer term from this. So that is absolutely critical. And this is something we're currently working on with, uh, with a, a new funder and trying to set up in Southern Africa as well. Right, so this relates to the figure that was in the little video, moving from economies, you know, competitive economies to, to care economies, basically. Third, uh, conservation must rethink relations with corporations and the state. Right? Engaging on their terms, natural capital growth is, is failing. Right? So rather, if, if these corporations or the state does not want to embrace degrowth, donut, or others, you must challenge them right? in many ways. You can still work with some of them, perhaps, but also really challenge and build counter power. And lastly, we can do that maybe by coming together in a convivial conservation coalition, whereby the focus is really on gaining power and not to get money in a small seat at the global table, right, of current realism, but rather to help build alternative power. All right, finally, on the ground, and this is the last thing, we want to really sort of look through our research to more integrated conservation landscapes that do not strictly separate humans and other species. In India, for example, there's some really interesting cases where they already do that, but in Southern Africa, that's not, you know, much done at all. Right. So that's what we're trying to sort of uh, learn at the moment. And of course, working through direct democratic governance uh, arrangements in the process, together with non-market redistributive uh, funding arrangements that do not rely on, on markets like, for example, the tourism market that I mentioned before. Good. Finally, concluding, um, my call is for structural transformation, right? We need to tackle the biodiversity and other political economic crisis through systemic and systematic redesign. We feel that key levers for change in that process is dealing with power, time, and actors, and of course, the relationships and dialectics between them. That it's time to reclaim revolution. We didn't call the book for like that for nothing. We actually need bigger change to not let this kind of change overcome us, like now with the corona crisis, but to actually plan and push for it deliberately. And my last is a question to all of you whether, you know, and, and how you would see the EU Green New Deal in that, uh, in this kind of picture, right? Is the EU Green New Deal a first step towards more radical change as we see some of these conservation, you know, critiques? 
or is it perhaps meant to prevent talking about more systemic change and hence actually even more conservative than we may realize? So that's my question for all of you. And with that, I just want to thank you for your time and um, attention. All right, Bram, thank you so much for uh, presenting your ideas, which I have to admit are very interesting, but also very grand. Uh, we're talking about systemic change. Um, there's a really grand proposals for a post-capitalist society. And um, I think uh, also what we discussed at the start of uh, this morning session was exactly that it's uh, the proposal at hand that we have is very entrenched in um, the growth paradigm. And uh, this indeed uh, allows us to ask the question, can, can those things that you discussed be merged um, with a proposal that we have. So I would also like to yeah, open your question up for sure uh, to our audience that we have as well. Let me just start off uh, with one question by Anna Fulden, and she asks, she's not sure whether it's related, but how does convivial conservation relate to compassionate conservation? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. They're, they're, they're quite different, I must say, because I've been part of a, a, an article that critiqued compassionate conservation. Um, the compassionate conservation is also very much about sort of, yeah, the rights of individual animals. And this, of course, sits quite uneasily with a lot of conservationists who focus more on populations, right? Um, one element in compassionate conservation is also to do with you know whether humane killing of animals is is is, is allowed or not and um well the paper that i co-authored was uh, led by indian conservationists uh, natural scientists who are really sort of unhappy with this because they feel well may maybe people in, in in wealthy northern countries have the luxury to uh, Right to, to to think about how they can they can set you know these spaces apart and some of them don't even have the problem at all because they have exterminated all their, their dangerous wildlife years ago, you know okay well the wolf is coming back but hey, you know uh, that has not led to any major you know issues except for you know uh, farmers and and sheep herders complaining, but 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 not any threats like for example people in India have with with tigers uh, or uh, elephants or, or other more dangerous animals. And even so, they, they really live with, with them. And so convivial conservation takes a bit of a different approach to, to, to that. It does, on the one hand, focus on, you know, and like I said, the needs of animals and the needs of non-humans are really important in, in convivial conservation. But it, likes, it wants to frame that within a much broader process of histor historical and political economic change, right? Political economic development. And so in that development, relationships between humans and the rest of nature change, like they have done over the last 300 years of global capitalism, right? My take also is that the, the, the reason why so many people now have become so passionate about individual animal rights, right? Which really is historically something interesting Right in, in the way that it's currently being done, because you know before a lot of nature was you know and, and animals were evil, and they were bad and they needed to be exterminated, and now you know even the most dangerous animals we say that we we love them and they're cute and cuddly and all that, so so these relationships will also change as we change the political economy around us, and hence yes that is a great, that is a big picture, but I think if you want change you need to think big and not small, <laughs> we've we've tried that it hasn't worked. Yes, exactly. And I think uh, the next comment uh, that Lisetta Lemons uh, put down relates to this. And it's also about that uh, the political consensus that is sought, actually, uh, of course, also with the New Green Deal in Europe, uh, she's afraid that it doesn't really, that it will not include real change because it's aimed at consensus and getting everyone uh, with you. Do you do you agree with that? What would be your opinion on such a statement? Yeah, I think Lisette is spot on. I think that, I mean, often, too often, um, there is still this consensus type of politics, right? It, and I, I don't think, I mean, the problem with consensus is that you paper over real differences, right? That you 
paper over real political differences. And perhaps politicians may may realize that you know that you know that this is a bit of a, a marketing ploy but but a lot of people may not really realize that their real differences are being taken seriously um and 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 really addressed over the long over the long term and in, in a deep and, and, and meaningful way to a degree i think that that's why we see such a polar you know sort of popular uprising in in many places right and that 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 unfortunately the left is is you know not really good at at um at addressing but uh, popular populist uh, people like trump and others are much better at, at 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 sort of tapping into this kind of discontent um so at the same time i do think if you want to move forward with another political vision you have to try to be inclusive in a way that is also also sharpens and, and, and makes your own statements clear and, and, and different from what you oppose. You can't just say, yeah, we want to bring everything together. And right, we very clearly say growth should be, you know, not the main priority. It's simple, it's as simple as that. And hence that, that excludes a lot of potential actors that still believe in that. You know, we think that when you actually look scientifically at the situation that, that we have right now, that's the only viable conclusion to, to come to. And that at some point, you know, the reality around us will show that that is indeed uh, the most important, one of the most important elements to consider. And I think, you know, the COVID crisis in that sense was already a case in point. Um, a lot of people said a lot of these changes couldn't happen. COVID came in all of a sudden overnight, you know, so many of these things could, you know, were all, all of a sudden possible. So they are possible, but you need to push for that and you, and you need to strategize, you know, strategize uh, politically and, you know, and, and play a smart political game. A little bit of consensus sometimes is part of that, but at the same time, not too much. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your response. I think, um, Bram, thank you so much. And I will leave uh, I will leave the conversation that we had just uh, for now. Uh, I hope to get back to you maybe uh, later in the next session. But before we run out of time and we have so many interesting speakers still lined up, I would um, like to introduce the next speaker that we have, which is Monique Janssens. Um, I have the honor to introduce her and she's the second speaker of this session. And she's an ethicist and also an expert in communication. She works as a communications consultant uh, to the animal welfare body Utrecht and is furthermore also responsible for the coordination of internal and external communications about animal experience, ex experiments and laboratory animals of Utrecht University and UMC Utrecht. In addition, she's also a self-employed entrepreneur in ethisch bedrijf. Her presentation is entitled Animal Business and Ethical Exploration of Corporate Responsibility Towards Animals. And I really look forward to your point of view. Monique, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chiren, and thank you, Pim, for inviting me for this conference. Um, I will start sharing my screen. And in the meantime, I think I should say something about my affiliation. Uh, let me see if I can do that both at the same time. <laughs> because uh, um, I, I did my PhD at uh, Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So that's additional to my work at Utrecht University, which you described very well. Yeah. Like this, I guess. Okay, it's okay. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, I think I guess I will be talking a bit more than Bram about uh, compassion for animals, um, animal business. It's about corporate responsibility towards animals, uh, and which uh, I I, um, I studied from several angles uh, at uh, to do my PhD research. And I will start with, uh, with the topics I will be talking about. The first one is that animal ethics should be part of business ethics and CSR. That's the normative part of my research. 
And at the same time, there is an empirical part and that's um, from which I conclude that it's a blind spot of companies and that managers can contribute to the paradigm shift that is very much needed uh, in several ways. And I will show you the ways. So let's first um, begin with uh, how it all came about. Um, I think it, it was about 15 or 20 years ago when I read about uh, John Elkington's Triple P, the concept People, Planet, Profit, which you probably all know. Uh, I was then working very much into animal protection and environmental protection, and I was very happy with the, the, the concept of CSR, corporate social responsibility. But uh, I thought, well, it looks as if they have forgotten someone in Triple P, and that would be the animals. So animal protection is quite common in the Netherlands, as most of you know, and, and I guess in, in Western Europe especially. But um, in CSR, the animals have been forgotten. And actually, I, I asked John Elkington, I met him, when he was in the Netherlands uh, to talk on a conference. And uh, well, he said, yeah, actually you're right. Uh, I think we should have included the animals, but they still aren't. And, and that was troubling me. And that's uh, what I uh, based my research upon. Uh, you might have noticed that last year, John Elkington uh, revised uh, Triple P uh, in his book, Green Swans. Um, it's not the case that the animals have uh, a, a really much better place over there, but he has uh, um, um, yeah, changed profit for prosperity. And in that concept of prosperity, there is a bit more room for animals as well. But it, I, I still see it as a blind spot. So then I, I had a look into um, academic animal ethics and academic business ethics, and I noticed that they as well are worlds apart. They don't talk to each other. Um, they each have their own concepts, their own ideas, their own models, and they are not integrated. And what I've been trying to do is integrate the two. So the main question here is uh, do companies have responsibilities towards animals. And to, uh, to, uh, to make my argument, I looked into the most common, most accepted strands of uh, ethics, both in business ethics and in animal ethics. So that's where they, they do integrate in a way, but implicitly. And uh, there you see that uh, there's Peter Singer, of course, the well-known consequentialist and utilitarian who says, well, animals have a moral status. We should consider them uh, in our ethical choices. And so does Tom Regan uh, from rights ethics. And so does Martha Nussbaum from virtue ethics. Her, maybe you know her capabilities approach. Uh, the 10 capabilities we should allow humans, but they can be translated to animals as well, which she does uh, in her work. So what I could see there is that actually the, the most common and accepted strands in animal ethics all agree that animals do have a moral status. So my argument goes like this, animals have a moral status, plus moral actors have a moral obligation to take the interests into account of those with a moral status. And therefore you can conclude that moral actors have a moral obligation to take as well the interests of animals into account. Now the next question from business ethics of course is, are companies moral actors? And if you, if you look at CSR literature, there are, there are many arguments to say that companies are moral actors. And I specifically zoom into Isaacs uh, in the, her work, Moral Responsibility in Collective Contexts, which says that um, it's, it's, it's difficult to put it shortly, but that all the individual intentions of people working in a collective together make the collective actions. 
and therefore the collective has a responsibility to do good and uh, all the, the, the people in the collective, which can be a company as well, all the people have their own small part of this responsibility. And those who have more power have a larger responsibility and those who have less power have a smaller responsibility. But they all together have this corporate responsibility, you could say. And therefore, uh, my conclusion is that companies should take the interests of animals into account. So the answer to the question is yes. And that was the normative part. And now we're getting to the empirical part. To, to do this research, I worked with Muel Kaptein. He's a professor of uh, business ethics at the Rotterdam School of Management. And we looked at the 200 largest companies in the world. And uh, we, we scanned their websites because there is literature that says, that argues that if companies do CSR, you, it shows on their websites. They will talk about it. So you, uh, checking the website is actually a good way to see whether they talk about animals somewhere in, in, in some way or another, an ethical way. And we take that very broadly. And our conclusion was that half of them uh, does not say anything about animals. They don't uh, mention the word actually. And the other half does. Um, so that was quite disappointing amongst uh, those large companies that, that don't mention animals. Uh, for example, were uh, large companies of, of supermarkets, retailers. So they, they have lots of, let's say, pieces of animals in their shops and they don't mention animals once. Not on their CSR uh, documents, not on their, um, yeah any place on their website. So that was quite disappointing. Nevertheless, there's these 47% uh, who, who do mention animals. Now you might say, uh, why would some businesses actually have to talk about animals or think ethically about animals? Why would a package business have to say, well, we have nice boxes to put your cat into? Well, we we found that actually uh, every, especially large company has uh, a responsibility towards animals. So I will give you one of the many examples where companies do take responsibility. There was this air company who had explicitly in their code of conduct, we will not ship products related to blood sports. So we don't know how this came about. Maybe there was some pressure from an organization I've worked myself at the Anti-Bullfight Committee for several years, so it, it could be pressure from an organization like that. And there are many other uh, animals and animal products that they don't mention anywhere. But nevertheless, they have taken responsibility to mention these animals. And that is, that I think that's a very positive example. And then, of course, you have the large uh, company restaurants, you know, the you, they hire um, uh, caterers who, who, who yeah, fill their restaurants and these restaurants have many animal products. So um, for every company, there's a way of dealing with animal ethics if they want to. Another conclusion of this the same uh, set of data was that those co uh, companies who do have a high concern for animals um, uh, it was hidden in the far corners of, of their websites. So of course, when you, when you look, you, you search with Google or with, with the system of the website itself for the word animal, you also end up in a, a PDF of uh, um, uh, an employee magazine where there is a small article about, um, yeah, maybe animals have a certain value, we should be kind to them. So I also, sorry, I also uh, looked at those um, uh, ways of mentioning animals. And uh, so we, we had uh, 
uh, like a formula to count the ways in which animals were mentioned. And then uh, they ended up uh, rather high because they had many of these small uh, mentions, small um, places where we found the word in a, a slightly ethical way, but it was not on the main pages of their CSR um, or their, uh, their code of conduct or anything. So we thought, well, companies should, should do better in that way. Now you might say, um, well, in my country or in the place where I live or my supermarket, things are going okay, you know, there's this uh, uh, veggie chef uh, um, notice on and, and so many products I can eat as a vegetarian or as a vegan or, and there's a lot of advertisement on, uh, on animal welfare. Um, so that's why we did another um, study, which was qualitative. We started talking to nine um, managers who were responsible in nine different uh, companies in the food chain in, uh, in and around the Netherlands. So this is, uh, this, these were all good practices in Western Europe. And we did triangulation, which is you, you take uh, three different sources. So we had these interviews. We had uh, uh, we checked their websites again, but but deeper, and we checked the, their CSR reports. And then we 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 discussed and we looked for uh, places where animals were described, and we looked at these. Uh, yeah, these texts and these interviews more closely. And from this uh, uh, research, um, this model came about. And uh, we have uh, many, many data about um, what the, the difficulties are for these managers and at the same time, what they do to overcome these difficulties. Because we found that, that in all the all the companies we approach, there is a manager responsible for animal welfare, and it, this might be the, the quality manager or the, the communications manager or the uh, CSR manager. But there is something responsible, someone responsible. And um, the three main topics or themes, I should say, we found to overcome uh, problems in getting the company to do more for animals is leadership, partnership, and championship. Well, I think you can imagine what leadership is. It's, it's quite a common uh, uh, term nowadays. You know, being a front runner, not being afraid to be the first one to adopt new things and taking the others along. And that's why it, come, it gets close to partnerships, which is working together with, uh, with the, the supply chain, with the industry, with the government, with the, the NGOs, with researchers. And then finally there's championship by which we mean that you, um, that you kind of uh, celebrate uh, your goals and when you've achieved these goals. So you can do that in cooperation with these NGOs. That's why it's the NGOs are close to the to the, the term championship, that's why you go outside eventually together with them to, uh, to, you know, to have a press release or something like that to celebrate what you've achieved. And um, as well, you heard then that I'm also a communication specialist, I, I went a bit deeper into communications. I, I have to say that I, do, I did these last two studies uh, to get together with Florit van Wezel. She's an, a methodologist of, uh, methodologist of social sciences. So that helped me a lot because I had no idea how to conduct these uh, types of studies. And this is uh, uh, specifically, these are the com communicative drivers for getting animal ethics in food companies further. And this one is a bit more complicated, but I will, uh, I will walk you through it. Uh, again, we have here to the left, the company, to the right, the society, and uh, the manager who is responsible for animal welfare. 
and notice that these here in the inside there are um, five dark red uh, arrows which show how the, the, the manager who's responsible communicates with other stakeholders. So um, this person communicates with employees, with adjacent departments, and that could be um, marketing or quality departments or communications. And um, the manager communicates with NGOs, and this results in collaboration and debate, communicates with governments, and that's the same, and communicates with the production chain, and that gains trust and insight. So what is near the arrows is, is what is gained by it. But um, more interesting even, we found that these green arrows, those are communicative connections between uh, these stakeholders without the manager per se uh, involved, being involved. So the, the manager can stimulate um, and facilitate these uh, communication lines without uh, interfering himself or herself. And I will give you a few examples just, just to make it more, um, more concrete. For example, if the manager thinks it would be helpful that the employees and the production chain, so let's say the farmers, that they interact that would gain more insight, right? So then uh, a farm visit is an option. And this is done by several of these managers. They organize farm visits for their employees. And how can the adjacent, adjacent departments communicate to employees? Notice that this, this is the only arrow that goes only one way. So the employees do not really talk to these departments, but the departments talk to the employees. And that's done by a newsletter. So uh, the manager can, uh, can ask the communications department to, to write a piece on animal welfare in the newsletter that goes to the employees regularly. The same with uh, the consumer or the public, the, the marketing department can communicate with the consumer on uh, packaging, packaging of, of products. And so it goes on, as I just already said, NGOs can communicate like awards. And um, this is a, a, also an interesting one. We, we found that um, for the consumer and the farmer to communicate that it is very helpful if there is personal contact. So when uh, consumers go to an, uh, an open farm day, that they really get insight in how things work for the animals and for the farmers. But of course you can't, you can't have all the people in a country come to your farm. So then um, uh, we saw that uh, a, a YouTube film in which the, the, the farmer explains how he does things, why he does things. Um, that is very helpful for the insight of the public. And then finally, there is the production chain. You also want uh, partners within the production chain to communicate with each other. And so that's just organizing meetings. That's one of the, of the channels we found that are used by this manager. So these are just examples uh, in the study. There are many more examples that companies could, uh, could uh, be inspired by. So the conclusion from that study is that an animal welfare manager has plenty of ways to advance animal welfare in the production chain by communication. Now, how this, does this relate to the Green Deal? We have seen a few more connections today and um, um, I, I, I think my conclusion is when I've studied the Green Deal a little, as I, as I did, especially for uh, this afternoon, uh, that sustainable stewardship of animals there as well is a blind spot. And I think uh, several speakers today have touched upon that already. Um, most relevant for animal welfare are two themes. That's the farm to fork theme and the biodiversity theme. Animal welfare can converge, 
converge with biodiversity and ecosystem protection. But as Bram already mentioned, it can also diverge. Uh, and one example is emission issues. As we all know, animals have to stay inside for emission issues. And at the same time, they, you know, it's good for their welfare to go outside. So uh, those are a few of the, of the problems that the, the companies as well um, noticed and they are struggling with. So what actual, actually can companies do from now on if they, if they see these conclusions? The first thing that is helpful is to make a manager responsible for animal welfare. You now, if there is the focus of at least one a person with some power in the organization, then things can get better. Then this manager should use these models or other models to, and start communicating about it, start, start talking, start uh, connecting people. Thirdly, it is very important to integrate animal welfare in CSR and in CSR communication. So it's, it's not people planet profit anymore or people planet prosperity, but it's also the animals. Um, there, there is some, uh, I don't remember his name, but there has been a scholar who said, well, we, sh we should add pets because it has a P as well. But you know, it's of course about more than pets. And especially animals in the, in the food production are, are you know, are, it's, that's a very desperate situation, I think. Then in the fourth place, as I already mentioned, add personal contacts and storytelling, like a video, to this communication. So that's an extra you can do. And there's another extra, and that's uh, use uh, channels like apps and gaming. There are in, in the study several examples of that as well. So th those are, of course, new emerging uh, modern uh, channels to communicate. So hopefully uh, this is helpful and uh, I'm, I'm gonna make this, uh, this little piggy a, a bit happier now, see? Um, and uh, well, all of this is of course uh, in my PhD thesis I defended uh, in last, uh, last uh, fall animal business, it's called corporate responsibility towards animals. And there's also um, uh, a Dutch version of that. So thank you um, for listening and I'm happy to take questions and join the discussion. All right, Monique, thank you very much um, for your great presentation and for sharing your ideas. And I can really see in the model um, how you're knowledge on communication really comes back uh, within your theory development. So that's very nice. Um, I think I would immediately like to give the floor to um, Pim, um, if you are here and you Yes, can. yeah, of course, I can also uh, speak out my question, which I put on the this chat. Uh, well, thanks again, and Monique, uh, great. And of course, I, I read your thesis uh, in Dutch, uh, so uh, you refer to it in your, your final slide. Um, well, I'm, I was wondering, uh, the key thing is, of course, that, that I fully agree that companies should take into account animal interest. Uh, and, and you started to discuss uh, how you could do it. Uh, but I also thinking about the earlier conversation that uh, I'm also thinking about why they don't do it. And of course, you have companies that have not a key interest in interacting with animals in a bad kind of way, yeah, just a kind of a regular company that maybe indirectly has something to do with, with animal interest. Uh, but going to the extreme, eh, and, and I have a very strong feeling that if you have animals and profit, so actually making profit of animals, animal products, animal behavior, whatever, that's asking for an unsustainable situation, be it having animals for meat production, be it having animals in, in circuses or whatever, and that was my question. Whenever there's a euro or dollar sign attached to it, then no doubt you have some, some animal ethical issues because then the money is more important than the, the, the morality. So um, how, did you, how do you see to, to change that? Is it, again, not more like a moral dilemma? Or do you also think from a business point of view, you can really move forward to having 
animals also being taken into account? Yes, uh, th that's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, I think we've, we are seeing now uh, in many, uh, in, in some companies that uh, actually it can be quite profitable to, um, to, to, uh, you, to treat animals better. Like we've seen uh, Unilever who has taken over the, the vegetarian slager, the, the vegetarian butcher. Um, so Unilever didn't do that because uh, the animals are so, uh, so, you know, <laughs> so sad. Uh, it's, it's for profit. And uh, so I think that there is a business case there, but um, yeah, what we see actually, is, I think there's a difference. When you look at the companies who don't mention animals at all, um, that is, um, well, we, 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 that is a bit more like in, in Asia. Um, and uh, I think there it has to do with awareness. There, there still has to be, um, yeah, I think awareness that animals matter, that animals are sentient, that they can suffer, uh, is not common sense there. So I, but I think uh, for the companies we interviewed here in Europe, uh, we saw that there are many obstacles that uh, the people are really struggling with. And that is, uh, you know, how do you balance, for example, these emission issues and animal welfare? How do you, if you have to invest in, in, in new systems, how do you balance uh, what you say just now, profits and expenses? And so that is exactly why uh, uh, leadership and partnership and championships can help. If we take as an example, um, uh, partnerships working together, when you, when you work together within an industry and you try to take things forward uh, at the same time, doing that together, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's much more interesting from a, a profit point of view because you're not the only one doing all these investments or, or this specific research. You can invest on that together. So uh, I think that, um, well, I, I have in my data a huge list of, of obstacles that the people who are, in, in the people in the companies who, who are really trying their best <coughs> that they have to deal with. And uh, so uh, clever solutions to to, to come by these obstacles, I think is, is essential there. And, and that's what, we're, what I've been trying to do with my research. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, just a short remark, because there are many other questions I see. Well, I, well, I fully understand that, that having a kind of a profit model or seeing that, that looking to animal welfare and well-being can also change your, your profit or your business model. But personally, I found a little bit uncomfortable by, by looking at it from that perspective, because when I still see the core of the issue uh, just respecting animals is, is then being replaced by having a better, uh, maybe even greenwashing or animal washing kind of business model to, to increase your profit. Uh, but then again, that's maybe also for this discussion later on uh, today, because there are other questions as well. I don't want to take all the, the time. So, Turan, you may want to pick one of them. Yes, indeed. And uh, I would also like to connect it to uh, what Professor Frank Biermann uh, in the morning session uh, observed when um, reading the Green Deal. Um, he said that um, he was surprised by the lack of strong language, specifically also in relation to reducing meat consumption. But there, I think he made a very interesting point where he wanted to decouple it from ethics, uh, where, where, for instance, Philip was uh, a bit more, um, yeah, on the ethical side, he said, um, well, I don't even want to go into that, but it's just surprising that it's, um, that it's not even that part uh, stressed. And also a question from the audience that I would like to couple with my observation now is, uh, what should then um, be the role of governments uh, in, in, um, and putting this message forth, uh, according to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will first uh, answer your question, which is related to pins actually. I think there are two ways to move forward. You can talk a lot about, about animal rights and about animal sentience and try to, to change the, the morality there. And you can say, well, it's just, it's just good for your profit, you know, uh, 
things are changing in society, just, just move along with us. And I think both are okay because we need them both. If we do one of the two, it will go much slower. If we, if we connect these two ideas, they actually, they, they stimulate each other. And I think uh, thing, the way we, we treat animals is, is so cruel that uh, every, every thing we can use to, to make changes go faster is okay with me, yeah, if, if it just, if it works, yeah. And then, well, I think now I forgot your second question. <laughs> the question from the audience, sorry. Oh yeah, the government, the government, the role of the government, yeah. Well, well, that's, that's not exactly my, my field of research. So I'm a bit hesitant to talk about that. But you know, personally, um, uh, if, we, if we look at uh, our ethical responsibilities as humans towards animals, I think governments should do much more to, to, to make this change possible. Yeah, so I, I think like, uh, you know, uh, a, a tax on meat and uh, uh, making, making healthy food, uh, um, uh, fruits and vegetables cheaper, etc. Not not going on with, with giving giving money to the, to the the farmers who uh, who, who use animals. Um, yeah, I think there are several ways to to acceler accelerate the change for governments, and yeah, they hardly do anything. All right, Monique. Um, with this uh, last question, I want to round up um, uh, our conversation for now because there are many more questions I think we could come back to. I think this is also a, a topic that interests our audience very much. So once again, thank you very much for your contribution. And if you permit me, then I will go to the last speaker that we have in line. And let me just say last but not least for now, of course. And the next person is Jorgo Riss. Um, Jorgo Riss is the director of the Greenpeace European Unit, which is based in Brussels. The Greenpeace European Unit monitors and analyzes the work of EU institutions, exposes uh, deficiencies in EU policies and challenges the EU decision makers to implement progressive solutions. And I think just like we talked about in our, uh, with our earlier speakers, but the European Union also specifically focuses on areas such as climate change, energy, forests, oceans, chemicals, and sustainable agriculture. Now the presentation of Jorgo Riss is entitled European Green Deal or European Greenwash. And I very much look forward to your thoughts, Jorgo. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jared. Thank you, Pim, for the invitation. And uh, congratulations to everybody on this call. This is such a rich seminar. I was just thinking if this was real food, I'd be like this now. <laughs> um, Maybe if some of you who are still with us can put on the cameras. I, I love, I mean, there's, I see a number of people, but not everybody. Just for a moment. Hi, Christina, thank you. Good, good to see your faces. I'm not gonna start with my presentation straight away. I wanna hear a little bit from you guys and I wanna do a little bit of hand, holding up the hand, quick votes. Uh, so that's why it's good if, if I, can, I can see you. Um, as Jeremy was saying, my presentation, uh, when I got this invitation, I said, well, I'm going to talk about European Green Deal or European Greenwash, because that's usually the role that I find myself in, working for Greenpeace in Brussels with a team of colleagues where we monitor not only what the EU institutions are doing, the Parliament, the Commission, the Council, but where we also monitor what the business lobbies are doing and what the many PR companies are doing working for the business lobbies, it often falls to me to say, hold on, it's not as great as it looks like, watch out, you know, they say this, but in detail, this is actually what they're proposing. Careful, careful, this law could actually lower existing standards rather than improve them, etc. Here, I'm in the lucky situation coming at the end of today's seminar that many of the speakers have already pointed to the shortcomings of the European Green Deal. Uh, I mean, Philip at the very beginning told us the European Green Deal anyway is not just one piece, it's not just the communication 
that Ursula von der Leyen presented in December 2019. It's a number of strategies that the European Commission is putting forward. And then there's lots of legislation to actually make these strategies real, to actually you know, change the way businesses operate, change the way markets function, et cetera. So it's a huge thing to look at. It's a project in the making. Uh, Frank was also pointing out to some of the, the problems. Um, Ram was looking at the systemic change aspects, even sort of warning whether the green deal could be like a, a smoke screen to sort of pretend and, you know, we have this thing in control and it could actually be worse uh, than nothing at all. Um, so with that, I'm not going to spend more time pointing to the shortcomings. I think you've got a feel for those. Um, what I would be interested in is how do you guys feel now at this moment, right now, with what you've heard about the Green Deal, maybe what you knew earlier, how do you feel right now about it? Can you put in the chat just sort of one or two words? You know, do you feel it's very important? Do you feel cynical about it? Do you think it's business as usual? Do you think it's great? You know, just, just to get a feel here in this virtual room, uh, after everything we've heard, how do we feel about the Green Deal? And let's have a look at the chat. So the question is, right now, how do you feel? It's an opportunity, but insufficient, said Felix. What else? A compromise, but it's a start, so hopeful. Good intention, but a lot of business as usual. Important, but needs improvement. So much more is yet to be planned. Lacking a lot of important aspects. Insufficient, lots to work on. It raises our attention, but now needs to deliver. Better than nothing, yeah. Complex, could be more inclusive. Okay, thanks very much. Mixed feelings, realistic compromise. Uh, then let me say very briefly how I feel about it. I see the Green Deal as the response to a growing wave of environmental consciousness across Europe and also worldwide. The Green Deal clearly is a political reaction to what crystallized in the climate marches, in the school strikes, and many other activities across Europe in 2019. It influenced these, that movement influenced the European parliamentary elections and the European Commission and von der Leyen, you know, caught that and tried to give a political response. Von der Leyen is a conservative politician from the European People's Party. The governments that currently govern in most of the European countries also have that sort of broad political affiliation. This is what they came up with. I think the European Green Deal is extremely important, despite all its shortcomings. I agree with everybody here who said it's insufficient, there's a lot of business in Europe. It's extremely important for two reasons. Firstly, the European Green Deal communication from December 2019, and especially also the biodiversity strategy from 2020, and these are relatively short documents that you can sort of read in 10 to 15 minutes each, they clearly present the problem fairly well, okay? So the problem analysis, the European Commission got it pretty much right in terms of the rapid loss of diversity in nature. So the rapid loss of life, of species, the shrinking uh, areas of nature, the growing pollution, all that is clearly there. The problem, of course, as so often is, what are the answers? What do we do about it? But I think the fact that the European Union has set itself the Green Deal as sort of a political guideline is crucial. And this is the first reason why I think it's important because in the end, to get anything done in the European Union, there needs to be a certain coherence between what the European Commission is proposing, what the different governments agree in council and what the parliament, the parliamentarians are ready to do. And to provide a sort of common orientation and say, hey, this is the challenge we're facing. Actually, environment, the decline of environment, the destruction of nature, the destruction of life has become so dominant that the European Union, which for a long time was primarily associated with internal market, common market, trade, etc., that this is now an objective that is important. And these communications give us, the citizens, a reference points to go back to when we judge our politicians on what they're doing because they have said these are the problems. It's no longer Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and others. 
or, or United, United Nations um, panel on climate change and other scientific bodies that have to say, here's the problem. It's on their black and white, the EU has set itself as a goal to achieve on. And so we need a certain sense of unity among the actors. That's the first reason. And the second, we need to have a reference point so we can judge political action. And with that said, there's a lot of problems and that's good because that gives us something to do. I read uh, in, on PIM's website that PIM understands himself as a scientist, which is a mixture of being a scientist who also is an active citizen. So kind of a show of hand here, how many of you are you know, aspiring scientists, but also would say aspiring or, or acting scientists? Is that something that rings a bell that you feel works for you? Yeah, a scientist who is also an active citizen. How many of you uh, would say, I'm just a scientist. I leave the activism to others. Or how many of you maybe are just activists? Yeah, okay, thank you. So it gives us something to do. Those of us who feel analyzing is important. Thinking of better solution is necessary. But if we leave it there, we haven't done our job because we have to make sure that those in power listen, that those in power are forced to listen, that those in power change if they don't listen, if they don't change. And there needs to happen more than, than just the scientific part. I personally studied political science and I was teaching that as my, and when I was in the PhD program. And then at some point I felt impatient. I felt like I need to be more directly on where the change is happening. I cannot wait until what I teach will be turned into practice by others. I was too impatient at the time. And so I turned activist and I've been, been doing that for the past 20 years. Now, on the human, European Green Deal. So we agree it's an important reference point, but we certainly cannot sit back because neither is it perfect, nor do we trust the politicians to actually fully do what is necessary to do to resolve the problems which are laid out in the Green Deal. Then I come to the second question that I have for you and for me as well, because that's one that really came as I was sort of engaging with PIM's approach uh, to the whole issue. Human-centered. Yes, the European Green Deal is human-centered. If by that we mean the reasoning that the EU is using to convince people is to say, caring for the environment is good for you because it's good for our economy. The disappearance of species, it's not just something that should worry people who care about animals for some strange reason. It should worry all of us because it affects ecosystems and the stability of the systems that provide us with fertile soils, with clean air, with water, etc. So it draws everything back to the human interest. Even more so, it draws everything back to a certain economic interest. It talks about the value of ecosystems that we have to start measuring them. So it is human-centered, it is not animal-centered. Pim at the beginning showed us a statistic how often the word animal appears in the, in, the, in the original sort of Green Deal communication. I think, what was it, Pim, once or twice? Okay, my question is to you, is that a problem? Is it a problem that the Green Deal is human-centered? Because one could say, in the end, it doesn't matter why people do the right thing, as long as they do the right thing. Let's say they want to build wider pavements in my street and for that they have to, they propose, you know, the local municipal government proposes to cut the trees. Maybe my neighbor gets active because he thinks the trees just look beautiful and he likes to see them, okay? Aesthetic self-interest. Maybe the other neighbor gets interest because she says, well, these trees are actually where the birds put their nests and they would lose their living space. So she cares about the birds and that's why she defends the trees. And maybe a third person says, actually the trees provide shade, contribute to lower urban temperatures, clean the air, blah, 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 soil fertility. In the end, all of them unite to protect the trees. So my question is again in the chat briefly, is the fact that the strategy is human-centered in itself a problem? What would you say? Okay, so Felix says, from a purely utilitarian perspective, like getting the result done, it's not a problem, but there's also ethical considerations. 
We could be pragmatic. In the long run, we need more. If it is about sustainable, then there's a shortcoming. It's not a problem because we're egocentric, so it actually works better with our species. Will it give the desired solutions for nature? Okay, good question. Anything else wants to add to the chat? Is human-centered in itself a problem? Okay, so I'll pick up from where we are at the end of the chat there with Pim's question. Will it give the desired outcome? That's also where my reflection is. I haven't come to a full conclusion on this yet. But when I look at some of the concrete pieces of legislation, and that's my job to look for Greenpeace at the concrete legislation that he was putting out, I think there is a connection between a very human-centered approach to looking at the global ecosystems and their fragility and the impact of human economic activity and to try to come up with solutions always thinking that, okay, so we are humans, we are separate from the rest. So there's animals and humans and we are humans and we have sort of the mind and we can rationally determine, okay, the temperature is rising, we need to reduce greenhouse gases so much, therefore we should be planting more trees. Therefore, we should be maybe doing some geoengineering. And Frank was earlier raising the alert about that. Some, you know, clever scientists thinking maybe we could start to deflect solar radiation and therefore keep the temperature down. Okay, so basically, I think that human-centered in a strategy like the Green Deal is reflecting much deeper problem of humans having come through our culture, through our self-understanding to a position where we believe we can analyze and understand how nature works. And right now we've understood that actually nature matters. And now we will try to manage nature in such a way that it will be again, you know, good for us and also good for, for other species. I mean, to be fair enough in the biodiversity strategy, there are, you know, clear considerations for wild animals, uh, the preservation of wild animals and, and so forth. Um, but the solution that people come to very often from this human-centered approach is an approach where humans, driven by a strong ego, see a role for us to intervene. I will come a bit later to the example of new GMOs and gene editing, and where I see a big risk for animals coming from that area. And since so many of you are activists, particularly also interested in animal issues, I wanted to raise that with you, make you aware of it. Maybe you want to get more active on that one. I also want to talk about the common agricultural policy. Uh, somebody earlier mentioned the farm to fork strategy. I think actually the common agricultural policy is the biggest, most important uh, piece of legislation when we talk about animals in the sense of domesticated animals, farm animals. So the reason why this human centeredness is a problem is not because it doesn't help to motivate people to do the right thing, but because the solutions that come out of that kind of thinking do not work because nature is not like humans are here and animals are there and there's a tree and here am I. Ecology is the science where you learn about the manifold interactions and the interconnectedness of all living beings. If you come from an ecological understanding of this planet and our species within it, you see that these many interconnections often, in most cases, actually go far beyond what we currently know and what we can currently predict. So we may decide we, this tree is affected by a certain pest, let's spray it so the pest goes away and we save the tree. We don't realize that by killing the pest, we've also killed the food of another species which was necessary to pollinate the tree and that there's a whole circle okay so that's anybody who looks a little bit into ecology and the interconnectedness sees that the risk by taking out one species the risk by making a, a very massive intervention uh, is very high because we have so little knowledge about the interconnectednesses in nature so that's my answer to this question, whether human centeredness is a problem. And I thank him very much sort of by inviting me to this event to, to think that a bit further. Um, 
because I think we can come to solutions. I think it's not just humans is not enough. We need to include animals. To me, that just just sort of just the next level. First of all, other speakers already said this human animal distinction is a bit of a problem in the first place. But it's not only that. It's not that we need to include animals, and then maybe at the next step we need to include trees because since the work of Peter Vorleben that he made so popular about the secret life of trees. We know that also trees communicate with each other, that there are forms of solidarity and social relations between trees, okay? So you could in, in circles sort of enlarge that fear to which we humans let others enter. No, I think that's the, you know, that's a legitimate approach, but I think the interconnected approach that comes from ecological science and from ecological thinking is really the one that is best suited to address uh, global environmental problems and to find our place as humans within that interconnected web of life. Okay, I want to talk briefly about two issues and I'm going to share just a couple of pictures there. Um, so we've had that one. Uh, factory farms, common agricultural policy. Factory farms, here we have a pig farm in Germany where the animals cannot move. Here we have a dairy farm in Spain where you cannot even see the animals. Each one of these white cubicles is space for one cow. They cannot move. They don't see anything except producing milk like in a factory. It's terrible from an animal welfare perspective, of course. It's also terrible from an environmental, broader environmental perspective. As you can see on these farms, there is no grass with which to feed these cows. The feed comes to a large extent from South America. Um, here's one of my colleagues in Brazil investigating the many man-made criminal fires in the Amazon, which are made to clear land, not only for cattle farming, but often also for the production of soy, which is then shipped to Europe as feed for animals, primarily in factory farms. And this is why if you look at the background of my picture, you see the headquarters of the European Commission, the Berlimont building, and you see a Greenpeace banner which says, Amazon fires, Europe guilty. It's not just the Bolsonaro regime that is to blame. It is also our farming policy, which is dependent on massive imports on animal feed because we allow massive factory farming in Europe. Do you know how much percent of European agricultural land is dedicated to animal farming? Please resist the temptation to Google. We're all sitting in front of our computers, okay? Just off the top of your head, put in the chat, how much percent of EU agricultural land would you say from your feeling, you know, when you take the train, going through the countryside, whatever, how much percent do you think is dedicated to animal farming? Elena says 60, who offers more? Lizette says 20, Tatiana 40, 70, Katarina. Okay, Katarina almost got it. Moritz? is already shooting high. 70% is the official figure, 68%. 68%. Just let that sink in for a moment. Almost 70% of our agricultural land is dedicated to animal farming because a lot of the feed is produced also in Europe. I mean, I've seen pig farms in Germany, in the north of Germany, you have huge maize fields, and then every once in a while you have this huge hangar-like building with a couple of chimneys, and you know the pigs are in there, and the maize around us to feed the pigs. 70% of our land. So, uh, and uh, you know, one of the earlier speakers was saying meat reduction is key. <laughs> you could see how much land that would free up. How it would liberate a lot of animals from these terrible industry factory farms, it would free up huge amounts of land. And Monique was talking at one point about this issue that the emissions from livestock, there's a problem between business and the environmental concerns because with emissions, it's actually better to keep the livestock in there. I mean, I'm sure 
Munich would agree with me, that's completely perverse thinking. That's saying because we keep thousands of cows together to produce massively and they fart a lot, and these farts are actually quite potent greenhouse gases. Therefore, we need to keep them inside so we can filter the farts and make sure these greenhouse gases don't, right? So it's a solution from an industrial farming perspective where the solution then is we cannot but keep the animals inside. That's the best way to fight climate change. And there's governments who promote that in Europe. Okay, so again, this is something for people who care about animals to get engaged and this is what we need to change in the farming policy and this is where this human centered thinking translates into completely the wrong solution. Let's reduce climate gases, let's keep the cows all in shelters so we can suck up their farts and clean them before they go into the air. When we could be freeing up so much land when we don't need to eat that much meat anyway in the first place. And that takes me to the second thing, which is right on right now going on at European Union level. And I'm, it's my job to carry the news out of Brussels into the wider networks in Europe to make sure that activists uh, have the information and, and you know, we can work together to stop things. The second solution, solution that's being promoted at the moment is a new type of genetically modified organisms, including genetically modified animals. Gene editing as a technology, as a number of technologies that fall under this. And the solutions they promote there is to make gene edited cattle, for example, that doesn't grow horns anymore. Yeah, because then it's easier to deal with the cattle because then they cannot hurt each other when you keep them very close together. In the United States, a company actually produced such cattle Luckily, the US authorities withdrew, didn't give it an authorization because that company had not seen that next to that one intended genetic change, there were a lot of unintended genetic changes. So there is a technology again where humans think, oh, we are very smart. We know by changing this one gene or that other gene, we can actually make animals fit much better into our industrial production mode, not realizing the tremendous interconnections in the genome at the larger scales, the tremendous interconnection that you have in any ecosystems and therefore causing, at least have a technology with the potential to cause much more harm than good. So I wanted to mention these two because my team and I were working on this. We're working on the, uh, uh, on the reform of the agricultural policy. It's in its last stages. Um, but a big shot from the Netherlands is in charge there for the commission, Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans. I'm sure he's uh, also interested what the Dutch public say on that. And you have elections coming up. Um, so this is something where Greenpeace is clearly saying the commission should withdraw the current proposal of the cap. It is not going in the right direction. Unfortunately, the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers are making it even worse. So that's our call on Timmermans and on new GMOs as well. We have a very clear decision from the European Court of Justice from 2018, but the lobbies in Brussels, the lobby of the biotech industry, which is working together with the chemicals industry, is trying to get the European Commission to find ways around it, to permit some of these new GMOs, to make sure they want them not risk assessed, they want, don't want them labeled so consumers wouldn't know because they're afraid that if consumers know they're dealing with GMOs, then they won't buy them. So we again need to make sure that people across Europe are aware of this and that the European Commission knows that if they were to give in to the pressure from the chemical and biotech lobby, they would face a huge shitstorm from across Europe. And then finally to end, I wanted to, um, to suggest um, what could be an answer. I mean, there have been so many good suggestions. I really like Brahms five, uh, sort of his five objectives, longer term objectives. And I love the picture he chose, you know, this forest where you can see sort of the light in the distance. So it's like going through the darkness, but towards the light. It reminded me of a quote by Martin Luther King, um, which goes something like, darkness does not be darkness, only light can do that. I believe that the human centered thinking is a form of darkness. It's a form of reduced understanding 
of what life actually is, of the interconnectedness of life on this planet. And it's to a certain extent magic to us because we still do not fully comprehend it and maybe we never will. And what do we learn from that? A certain humility. And with that certain humility comes to understand our place and to also see that whatever solution we want to put in place needs to be gradual, needs to be tested and needs to be compatible with life. So major geoengineering, major inventions into the genome of animals or humans or plants are out of the question once you take that kind of perspective. It's also humility in terms of consumption, of course. Give as much as you take, etc. So I think uh, enlarging certainly beyond humans, certainly to include animals, certainly to include awareness of the interconnectedness of trees and other plants, but why not go for an ecosystem approach for an ecological thinking approach. And I have a little graph that I want to show you to finish this off. Hold on. Ah, are you seeing my screen now? Can I see a thumb? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so the last one would be this one. From ego to eco. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in our work, greenpeace.eu is the special website for EU affairs. Otherwise, of course, any Greenpeace website provides you the broader story on you know, both the problems and solution that we see and that we promote. Uh, we also have a Twitter account specifically for the European affairs. Thanks very much again, Chen and Pim for the invitation and to all of you for your attention. And I hope we stay in touch. All right, thank you so much, Yorgo. Um, also very inspiring uh, in various aspects. Maybe I can kick off with the first question uh, that came up. Um, earlier, Frank Biermann also discussed, for instance, uh, the term nature. And he said, well, for political scientists, this is really not a term that we use. So you will also not find it in policy documents in that sense. That's what I took out of it. And as a political scientist, I completely recognize that. And in my preparation for this conference with Pim, we even I even said it's an old fashioned term. But you were someone, you know, at the core, uh, you know, uh, of Greenpeace work and of in touch uh, with civil society very much. And I would just wanted to ask you, does this resonate with you as well when I say maybe our policies are so detached um, from, let's say, what resonates with the general public. I mean, we have in academia, uh, also fancy words for complex things, but um, maybe we are detaching ourselves from what speaks to people and uh, what speaks to them maybe understanding what is actually going on in these policy proposals. Um, and I just wanted to ask for your opinion. Do you think these policies are a bit detached from what people are thinking and worried about? What is your opinion? So I think many... Political science is the science of power relations. And if you look at the policies and the laws that govern our countries, you can detect the power relations that stand behind them. Certainly, I see that a lot of political initiatives are driven by certain interests. And often these are vested interests that have di direct economic interests, that certain things are prohibited or allowed, that certain laws are put in place or, or prevented. That's why I feel so lucky that Greenpeace is one of the organizations which has the means to actually have a fully dedicated team to monitor this. And, and of course, there are many more uh, with other NGOs that we also closely work with in Brussels and across the EU. But if you say, you know, on your question, how detached it is, so I would say, I would answer this on two levels. On the first level, I think that not just at EU level, also at national level, too many policies reflect well-organized interests, and these are often business interests, rather than more diffuse and less well-organized civic interests, citizen interests. So that's the first thing. 
And for us, that just means we have to get organized, we have to link up, we have to not leave the playing field to the lobbyists, we have to be there as well ourselves. That's why I like the scientist uh, uh, self-understanding. Um, the second level though is I think much deeper and I would certainly, I, if I speak for myself, I think this understanding of what is nature and what is our place in nature is also something that I don't yet have fully clear for myself. I mean, for a long time, I was thinking, I work for an environmental organization, I defend nature. That is clearly a thinking where nature is something else than me and I defend it. I defend the forest from being clear cut. I defend the river from being polluted, right, etc. I love the slogan, we are not defending nature, we are nature defending ourselves. I believe that encapsulates this growing sense that we are part of a beautiful web of interconnectedness of all beings. And the more we understand that, the more we come out of this darkness, of this ego darkness of humanity, the more we see how soil fertility, we cannot see these millions and millions of bacteria and other microorganisms, and yet they are so crucial. Our own human body, there are more bacteria in our human body than there are humans on the whole world, many, many times more. We're like a zoo, you know? And so there's so much invisible that is part of life. And the more we understand it, we come to a different understanding of nature. And I think then we also overcome the old conservationist style of thinking where nature is sort of best, you know, a park somewhere guarded with armed guards, you know? And I think that's a challenge for all of us. Certainly it's a challenge still for me. How do we come to an understanding of nature that would mobilize us in such a way that any attack on nature is an attack on us? And therefore all of us stand up to defend it. That's what I would like us to get to. That's, that's you know, what I'm trying to find to articulate. And it's not easy because we come out of, out of a cultural tradition where this division between nature and human is almost as big between mind and body. All right, thank you for your answer. We just had a few questions come in and I'll take one. Um, and I think it also, ref the last one, it relates to a question posed previously on the chat as well. And Hannah F says, thank you for your talk. What do you think about companies and politics transferring responsibility to the consumers? And um, would you, and how would you change it? So, that's an important question. And please also ask that to Franz Timmermans and other people who, who may be in favor of labels in order to deal with the environmental problems. Now I'm all for transparency and as much consumer information as possible. That's very important. And consumer organizations are doing a good job to keep fighting for that because companies often don't want to be transparent not about the chemicals in their product, not about the production processes, uh, not about the origin, et cetera, et cetera. However, there's a temptation by politicians to say, let the market decide. Let's give consumers the information and then we see whether they really care. If they really care as much as they say, then they'll all buy green products. And then we've solved the problem. Business get the signal from the market. You know, that's a perfectly, sort of market logic solution. And I think that's just a way for politicians to abdicate their responsibility. If we have a problem that in Europe, the feed for animals comes from areas linked to forest destruction in the Amazon and elsewhere, there shouldn't be a choice in the supermarket. This product comes from animals fed with feed from uh, forest destruction and this one doesn't. They should all be free of destruction. So when you come to the really big problems or animal suffering, this was from an animal that suffered terribly. This was a happy cow on an organic farm with huge space. And this one is fully uh, meat free and you know, would be the best choice of all of them. You know? So I think there's a point where certain products are so unacceptable because of the suffering they cause, because of the destruction they cause, that having a label that would guide you towards the better one 
is just being irresponsible because you're keeping the other ones still on the market and you should be taking, you should make legislation that excludes these products from the market full stop. All right, thank you so much. I think I'll take a last question uh, before we round up this uh, session. And um, let me see, I think uh, we also have one particularly for you in, concerning the cap reform. And it says between brackets, binding targets, control mechanisms, etc., to actually initiate change. To, so in your opinion, what has to be included in a cap reform? to actually initiate a change towards sustainable and ecologically friendly agriculture? The whole payment system has to change. At the moment, the, the landowners with the biggest land get the most money, the biggest farms get the most reward. There are, there are complete inconsistencies. You find that as part of the Green Deal, the EU wants to increase organic farming in Europe, and at the same time, nothing is done to effectively cut the dependency of the conventional farmers on the chemical industry and their input, inputs. A lot of the tax money that goes to the farmers is handed straight on to the chemical industry at the moment. The, the feeble attempts to reduce the use of pesticides, uh, you know, that needs to go much further. So, Again, I cannot answer this comprehensively, but if you go to our website, if you're interested in details, you'll find it there. If you don't find it there, write to me, I'll send it to you. But if I had to answer it in one sentence, I would say that we currently have a system that subsidizes farming, which destroys the fertility of our soils, pollutes our groundwater, is, has industrial animal farming, uh, as a central element to it with again 70% of our land basically taken up for that and the cap reform at the moment goes way too little into changing it it is not the systemic change that Bram was calling for it is at best a step change and even there in the end it will be left up to national governments and many national governments are way too much close to the agriculture to the big agriculture lobby so that we could trust them. The commission should withdraw this proposal. It's not this commission's proposal. That's why I think it's so crazy that they keep stick with it. They make the Green Deal and they keep the cap proposal from the old commission. They should withdraw it and they should say, in light of the Green Deal, we need a completely different policy. And it's not only for agriculture minister, it's also for health minister, it's also for environment ministers. And that's how it should start a new process. Okay. Clear. thank you so much for uh, sharing your ideas and your thoughts with us uh, on this issue. I think we've heard many interesting things also from the previous speakers and I think there are many open ends that we can discuss further. But for now, I would like to close it off and uh, thank everyone for their participation, also the audience for your interesting questions and uh, your engagement in all of this. What we will do is also gather a bit of the questions that we haven't answered. We also have some um, yeah, propositions planned if needed. So uh, to all of you who are still here, we would love to see you uh, again at three o'clock. I think we just need to stretch our legs, get some fresh air, and then uh, come back and, and see uh, where we can get this conversation going. So thank you very much, everyone, and hope to see you at three o'clock again. Thanks again, speakers. Welcome back. Yes, people were just sitting behind the screen, waiting for something to happen, I guess. So uh, I hope you enjoyed your coffee and or had a toilet break or just uh, moved around a little bit. Well, where I am, the weather is actually very nice. It snowed in the morning when we started uh, today's uh, webinar, but now the sun is shining. So if you see me somewhat white from this side and a little bit dark from the other side, well, that's just the sun. I already tried to close the curtains, but so it's not like a ghost, but it's me sitting in the, in the sunlight a little bit. So I hope you don't mind. Well, um, we have now kind of a reflection session and actually Sharon and I discussed how to do it. And there are so many ways how to, to organize a session like this. And in fact, we, we didn't have that much clue how to, to organize it. So we, we leave it a little bit as, as it all goes along the way. And I thought it might be a nice idea that I briefly 
give my feedback on today's session. Uh, you may have noticed for those of you who are twittering or whatever, I take some notes on, on, on my uh, uh, paper, but I also put some things on screen. I, I treat it today. So for me, a good reflection of a few things I picked up is just show you my Twitter timeline uh, that really much reflects for me the impression of the day. Very, very biased. And of course, I could not by all means Twitter every interesting quote or comment I got from the, the speakers, then I couldn't pay attention. Of course, that I tried to do uh, predominantly. So I would like to, to share my screen. And before I show the, the, the tweets reflecting later today and after which we can enroll in a discussion, I also would like to come back to a comment I like to make on uh, your Guris presentation, but time didn't allow to do it at that time. But let me just try to share my screen. Uh, yes, I hope you can see it. You all see a screen I shared? Yes. I yeah. uh, okay, well, well, this is my timeline. And actually, one comment I, I'd like to make, and maybe that's something also to reflect upon, is that uh, I was about to say to Jorgio, well, very much appreciated that he looked my website and thought that I take myself to be a kind of scientist. And then you're going to no doubt you also have seen the interviews I've done over the last several months with indigenous leaders. And this is just the last one I posted yesterday, hence it's uh, at the start of my timeline uh, for today. Um, and I really think not as a question, but more like a command, uh, comment that we, we can kind of learn a lot about the, the views and, and, and thoughts these people have on our connectedness with nature and with animals. So they really, see themselves as part of nature. And of course, they all know they don't have all wisdom. But anyway, uh, for me at least, it was very helpful and refreshing to talk to people like, for example, uh, Angwakwa, to, to learn about their perspective. And that for me should also be part of processes like the Green Deal and other international negotiations about climate change to also try to listen to maybe minority groups of people that have not only a strong interest, but also very clever and sometimes very useful ideas how we should move forward. But that's a little bit on the side. So going back to today. But before we started, I start to tweet, well, let's start about the, the workshop. So, um, and again, very much thankful for all the, the people that spoke and all the people that listened uh, and enjoyed the discussion that came in and out for today's uh, meeting. Um, likewise, the Maastricht campus in Brussels, the Maastricht University campus in Brussels, which of course is, is the, the coordinator of the whole uh, Relay project and the workshop series uh, is also very much heavily involved and, and interacted with, with these kind of discussion also through the social media. So by all means, take a look at their website, take a look at the project website if you're interested also in the follow-up workshops to come. There's a lot of information through social media and also just on websites, on their websites to see what's up. We will summarize things, uh, very much interesting to take a look at that. Well, uh, I already mentioned that uh, I know Philippe quite some time and, and we are in a similar path regarding to, to animals and even to, to, to plants and, and having giving them a voice as well. It's also connected to George's comments at the end of the workshop, uh, thinking about maybe next step is not only to, to look at nature and, and animals, but also think about plants and trees and these kind of things. Um, and I also liked that Philippe had one of his slides with uh, David Atterborough, and then in another discussion, uh, we talked about, well, we don't want to have all the kind of a fancy picture of uh, the nature, like David Atterborough always presents, but there's also uh, more to that. There's also nature coming into to our cities and coming to us, uh, which are not always as glamorous and, and fancy and, and, and fantastic as most of the movies David Atterborough presented. Um, so a great contribution of Philip uh, Paterberg, and what I took out of that is, is, is I, I like the word divestment. I heard about it, but I never realized what it actually meant. So deliberately not invest in something, that's at least, I think I um, have it correct. That's the divestment. So having companies not investing in unsustainable things, discussing about morality and transitions uh, and the like in order to achieve a more sustainable future. Well, um, Strong discussion. And again, all the speakers say many, many more things than I can just present it and I tweet it. Something I just listened with, with very high interest and I couldn't even tweet. So um, there are just a few snapshots that, that came to my uh, my Twitter hat, so to say. Um, and I, I liked, and that's I think very much in line with, with, with 
thinking Sharon and I had in organizing this workshop is that actually um, animals in nature are hardly being mentioned and also in the solution terms that is a kind of a miss. Uh, so, so, so this um, neglected silver bullet point in the Green Deal not take into account that reducing meat consumption could be something worthwhile to explore in more depth than it's now. And then Burak's presentation, again, very great, uh, discussing things. Uh, I really wanted to, to quote something about Star Trek uh, and, and his comments about uh, uh, super beings actually exploiting the Star Trek crew, but then uh, claiming it when they start complaining, well, hey, you do the same for the animals on Earth. Um, but I couldn't find a kind of a nice picture of Star Trek uh, so quickly, so I just took um, one of his slides, which is as equally important, where actually also he states that the fate of industrial farmed animals is a very pressing ethical thing. And uh, he questioned if the Green Deal really is changing these kind of things, the very bad situations most of these animals are in. Um, then, Frank thanks me for being there. Unfortunately, he apologized for not being able to, to, to join us for today's session, uh, but uh, very appreciated and very good to see that uh, people are very happy to be part of this endeavor as well. Um, Brom, well, first of all, I like Brom's very like, nice animation. Uh, I saw it before and I think it's really good to also use this kind of new things, short animated movies, pictures, whatever you can call it, uh, to, to make a point. Uh, and, I think we're all getting more and more used to having things like this uh, in our day-to-day -day business. Eh? We're also used now to doing things on the screen. Uh, again, maybe not 100% ideal, but still it opens, opens opportunities for these things as well. And looking at these little movie uh, Bram uh, showed us, uh, it also intrigued me how to think about, and we may want to discuss it also in, in this uh, hour or so, uh, we discussed it briefly, is that of course we rely for a sustainable future on current and next generations as well. And I can tell you, uh, my kids, there are 17 and 19, they rarely watch something that's more than five minutes in length. Uh, so uh, you can make fantastic documentaries of an hour and a half. Uh, I think most of the, the younger people uh, will not look at them. Uh, so, so realizing that, that also the whole dynamics in terms of internet things is changing. And, and there's also a funny thing, if you look at websites, they are sometimes still developed for screens. I can tell you, my kids, they don't do anything from a screen. When they buy things, when they even apply for university, uh, a college uh, um, program, they do it on their cell phone. So just on a side note, that was triggered by me looking at Ram's presentation. And of course, contents wise, that was also my, my triggering remark he made that the Green Deal does not go to the roots of the problem. And I think that's actually what I kept feeling on every presentation today. There is something we all feel the Green Deal is not doing good enough. It is a good first step. Of course, it's better than nothing. It puts our attention to a very important thing, but it doesn't go to the root of the problem. And that's something also we may want to discuss in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so. Yeah, Monique Jansen, again, I, I, I read her, her book and, and I'm, I'm so intrigued by, by the concept. That, that personally, uh, I, I really believe that companies can do far more than they are doing now. And uh, looking also at her thesis, I also got a kind of a deja vu that uh, when I became professor of sustainable development over 15 years ago, sustainability, sustainable entrepreneurship, it was just greenwashing. Companies had just a section on social dimension, economic, and then the environment one, because they needed to do something about sustainability, three pillars and whatever. Fortunately, we have come a long way since then. So I really genuinely believe that companies are trying to to make the sustainability angle more genuine and more concrete. But then again, animals, nature, as Monique uh, correctly pointed out, are very rarely part of the equation. So there's another huge step to go. And it may be even so that at the first steps are also greenwashing, trying to take that into account. And we discussed the, the moral issues as well. But I really think that companies should take the interest of animals into account. So this big yes, uh, I took out from uh, Monique's presentation. And of course, I think that, that Giorgio uh, addressed many issues and put it in a kind of a bigger context of the work also he's doing, Greenpeace is doing. Um, yeah, I, I liked the chat discussion about, do you think this anthropocentric uh, thinking is something we can avoid or something we don't need to do? 
And again, I think everything we do is anthropocentric. We are humans, we are anthros. So I don't, I don't know how to think like an animal. I don't know to, how to think like a, a tree or a plant. So in principle, most of our ideas are anthropocentric. And of course, there's also a paradox in itself. By acknowledging that, and by also acknowledging that, like uh, George, you mentioned that most of these approaches are at least not 100% workable because we are just part of it, we are not separate. It also gives us a huge dilemma in dealing with issues that are so huge, like climate change, biodiversity loss, we see today. So in a nutshell, and I'll stop sharing my screen, we can use all of these presentation of things of a very uh, um, starting point for the discussion, uh, but I'm also looking a little bit to all of you and also to Sharon, uh, how to move forward. And we have pre-prepared uh, another set of, uh, I think, thought-provoking statements we then discuss. We can also leave it up to you. Sharon, have you, do you have any statements you want to start with? Um, yes, I could indeed. Um, uh, but that I also want to leave it a little bit open for the participants, um, whether they have something urgent that they really want to discuss before leaving today. So what I'll invite um, the participants to do is just to put it in the chat. Like if there's a question or a topic that they would like to converse upon together, then please do. Then what I'll do is just uh, put one of the statements that we um, came up with because we have several, um, we came up with several statements and we thought, well, probably uh, the audience will have listened quite a bit and would like to actually share their points of view uh, with the rest uh, of the group. So we would like to invite everyone to do that. So also feel free to raise your hand and um, turn on your camera if you like. So you can also really speak to us and with us, I hope. So what I'll do now is just um, share my screen and um, one of the discussion statements that we came up with was coupling sustainability to the economic growth paradigm is a smart move. It is the most feasible way to invest in sustainable change. So we thought Let's put it out there and see what maybe the speakers or what maybe um, yeah the audience has to say or about this. Do you agree? So I guess you mean stopping the growth paradigm, am I right? Oh, sorry, I just went to the to another statement. Um, stopping the growth paradigm. Um, Turning it into non-growth or what exactly do you mean? Well, no, yeah, the statement is actually the opposite, that, um, that, the, that the economic growth model is the bandwagon to be on to actually uh, get to sustainable change. So rather than degrowth or rather than... Um, another alternative account or paradigm? Well, I would say it's impossible. I don't think it can be sustainable within the growth paradigm, but I'm, I'm very curious how the others see this. I don't know if we're raising hands or we are using the chat, but I think this also brings back to the kickoff conference where we said the sustainable growth is basically an oxymoron, right? Um, in which, you know, it just simply cannot happen. But I think there's also another debate about this utilitarianism that we had before with Yorvo. And it's about what, you know, we have to also act within the boundaries of reality and, you know, what also governments can do uh, within you know this given reality and maybe in the short term this is the best way to do it there is no better way sadly but it is not something for the long term so it is pragmatic to do it in this way to put it further on the agenda to make people think about it but it is not how we will get there thanks uh, Phyllis. Uh... Of course, I think both and I, we are just part of the, the group now as, as all of you are. So I will just mingle myself in the discussion as well. 
Uh, I, I agree um, with, with Felix uh, and also referring to the first meeting we had within the series is that it, it looks like a kind of a, a lock in if you keep the economic growth paradigm to make a change because uh, why would you use something that's at least to, to well, maybe part of the uh, problem at each large extent responsible for many of the things we are seeing now. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's maybe an easy thing, and, and, and I think nobody has in principle something against economic growth, but with the uh, same mechanism and systems in place we, we have now, I either think that this, this economic, economic, economic growth paradigm is a smart move to, to, to uh, uh, jump on in terms of uh, moving forward to a more sustainable future. And likewise, I also I always like to, to have kind of a parallel with circular economy which is of course something everybody would say, well, that's a good thing to do. And we would like to recycle our products. And of course I agree, but a circular economy with an implicit economic growth model is also not sustainable because you still need energy, you still need resources to recycle things. So uh, it's far better than not recycling and having a kind of a, a, a cradle to the grave approach, but still it needs to go also uh, within a kind of a new paradigm uh, probably with a more respectfulness towards the resources we use. Can I say something? I worked in the care industry as a complaint officer and uh, the uh, board there um, um, said, well, we took care of the elderly people uh, during the system and the administrat administrative procedures and the, the CARES uh, insurance, but uh, the most important thing is the well-being of these people because they, in average, they stay one year and seven months in our homes. And I think that's going to be the same with the world. You know, uh, first, everything is about money. My students also say to, uh, to me, uh, uh, oh, it's uh, terrible. Everything is about money, but I think it's going to change. Uh, and Corona helps that people really are going to think about what is really important in my life. And then uh, if you talk about health and uh, yeah, well-being and uh, spare time you have, then I think it will change that not only the companies who want more profit for their shareholders, but also the consumers and uh, the politicians will send a manage, uh, message well-being is also very important. I think then the change point will come. Uh, Jorgo, I see that you wrote hand um, for raising your hand. Please go ahead and share your thoughts if you like. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I think it's a big mistake that the EU, um, you know, presented the Green Deal as the growth strategy. I think it's a big mistake for two reasons. Firstly, I think that it, you know, mobilizes the wrong allies because those people who have studied sustainability, the, the vast majority of them say that economic growth per se is actually a harmful political objective and that certain sectors need to degrow so you, do, you, know, you make those people very skeptical because they say you're starting off on the wrong foot right from the beginning. And the people, the people that you do get are the big companies that require growth in order to deliver shareholder value, et cetera, but who are not your natural allies to actually get this systemic transformation that you need to really achieve the objectives. So that's, that's the first problem, it, you know, it's sort of, puts off the people who, who are, who've studied this in more depth and, and it brings in people who come with a lot of wrong solutions. And then secondly, underlying, of course, the reason why many people are very skeptical when politicians keep talking about economic growth is because this famous decoupling of growth from environment, negative environmental impact is not happening and all the facts that we have show it, you know, it's, it's not there. They've, mainstream economic theory has talked about it for a long time. In practice, it's not happening. Therefore, nobody I know is pro-growth. You know, people are 
talking about which sectors must grow, which, which sectors must decline. I think it would have been much smarter for Ursula von der Leyen to say, the Green Deal is Europe's strategy for well-being, fairness and employment or something like that. You know, you can achieve that. Uh, these are things that people care about, that the vast majority of citizens care about. And they actually make sense in the context of a sustainability strategy, because if you really do um, work towards protecting biodiversity, reducing pollution across the board, you do increase well-being, you do increase safety, uh, you do, and you can generate a lot of uh, future-proof employment. I believe uh, Felix, you had a. I think he just he just answered it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, Alessia, I see that you also want to contribute uh, to the discussion. Would you like to uh, speak out, if you like? Hi. Sorry. Um, I didn't hear what you just said. My internet is a bit off. I was just saying, um, if you want, you wrote something in the chat, please feel free to share it with us with your voice, if you like. Um, yes, sure. So it was uh, directed to uh, Bram Buscher, so maybe if he would like to answer it. Um, I found his presentation very interesting, and I wasn't familiar with the concept of convivial conservation, but I find it very interesting. And I really agree with uh, the main point and also what we just discuss, discussed that um, presenting this European Green Deal as a growth strategy um, is very inadequate to address uh, sustainability. And so since uh, this idea of economic growth uh, is so dominant in our society, I was wondering how do you envision to actually convince politicians and EU leaders who are seemingly so unwilling to, ex to exit this narrative of growth and capitalism to do a transition towards degrowth, for example, if you would think that would be possible. Shall I, shall I answer that, Sharon? Uh, so I, I think um, Jorgo already mentioned two, two really important points. But maybe in, in response to your, uh, your uh, contribution, Alessia, uh, two further points. Um, so growth, I mean, this, one is a bit of a technical, nerdy kind of point, but still important for me. In, in, in that economic growth is only sort of the, the, the more popular way to actually, or a different way of state, stating what actually is the problem, which is capital is growth for growth's sake, right? Of course, we want certain things to grow. I want, you know, I would like to grow intellectually. You know, I want my children to grow, you know, plants, you know, and animals grow and then they, and then they wither. And, and, and so, so do a lot of things. What, what is silly and, 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 and sheer impossible is growth for, for growth's sake until all eternity. And that is literally, literally the definition of capital. Capital is investing whatever, money, resources, people, you name it, to get more of it. And so the outcome is, you know, accumulation for accumulation's sake or growth for growth's sake. And that's just silly. <laughs> and that, that really sort of um, helps to um, yeah, empower certain groups of people over others. And create in the process, if you un unleash it tremendously, you know, enormous inequalities and other big problems. So, so, so that is really for me part of the root of, of, of the problem. Now, the, the question is, how do we get out of it, and how how do you then transition? I think, I mean, your point is absolutely, and I don't have any any major answer, right? I think, like so many others, including I guess yourself and so many, you know, many of us are searching for that. But that, that's kind of why I, I, I ended my presentation by saying, we must not let this idea of this is the reality, right? Be in the way of actually think a little bit differently, right? When, when, as soon as somebody tells you, no, that, that's, you know, that's, 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 not, uh, that's not realistic. Then you must immediately think, oh, that's power talking to you to stop thinking and get in line. No, then, the first, then you know you're on the right way. Right? And the more people that start doing that, and the more people that actually 
start to think of, think differently and push for different things, the more acceptable things become. But that's a long process, right? And this, this has been actually quite successful over history at various points in time. In fact, in the 70s, it was so successful that elites were so threatened. That that's why they came with a counter narrative, you know, neoliberalism to try to push the, you know, the genie back into the bottle, right? And the, the key thing, two key things that they, they, they've succeeded. First, that growth is completely uncontested, that, you know, egoism, growth and all that, you know, were supposed to see, were seen as, as, as innately good and can't be contested. And second of all, that you can't think outside the box, right? I mean, capitalists and big business always say, yeah, you need to talk outside the box. And then you say, oh, well, let's tackle growth. No, 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 not that far outside the box. We, we need to stay in certain boxes. Right? And, and so, you know, usually using your imagination and, 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 you know, moving beyond some of these things is, is, I think, the first and most important thing to do. And then you find with others more concrete ways of actually trying to take little steps towards that larger goal. And I, I'm not going to go into much detail. I mean, we're doing some of that, but a lot of people are doing and, and searching for that. And I think as soon as you see that, but connect always those two, the short and the long term, that's when you actually start to, you know, carve out this new path. And that's the only way I think realistically, how we're going to get out of out of the mess that we're currently in. Yeah, thanks, Bob. If I may, may add to that. Uh, well, I, I fully agree. And also it triggered me thinking about a statement Philippe made in the, this morning by that uh, 15, 20 years ago, there were only one or two programs on sustainability in, in European uh, uh, universities. And now there are many more. Uh, so I also really think that we, we can, at least part of the, the contribution we can make, at least myself being a kind of a uh, university professor teaching things as well, is also to education people. Um, having said that, I also see with all the new sustainability science programs that come up, that uh, many of them, one way or the other, including the ones at, at our own university, is moving towards the more economic dimension again. And, and, and losing a little bit the integrated system thinking concept of what we're all discussing today. And, uh, and there are many progresses at also the faculties th teaching things, but as long as we still have the, the key mainstream economic thinking throughout wherever you have, uh, secondary school, universities, higher education, um, it's still not enough, I think. And even worse, um, together with one of my PhD, we are looking to how students that study sustainability, how they change their perception depending on where they end up to. Uh, and the first indications are that if you are quite, um, how you say it, in favor of sustainable development, but if you then start working in a kind of a company that is uh, very economically growth dominated, that without a few months, you have the paradigm like the company, or you quit. Because of course, if you don't resonate with it, you don't stay there. So it's not only uh, uh, enough to, to, to do it on, on teaching uh, within teaching system, but of course, it's something that, that's society-wide. And I think also Philip mentioned the role of the, the media, advertising, and these kind of things. You're all forced in, in buying things you probably don't need. So education, I think, is also a key thing to consider as well. Yeah, maybe I can add to this discussion, Pim, in terms of education. Um, of course, you know that I'm also the uh, coordinator of sustainable education at Maastricht University, where we also really would like to get sustainability um, in all programs, really, uh, where relevant. Um, but I think in terms of uh, competencies for sustainable development, that's extremely important. If, if we can get citizens, uh, of course, students in that sense, but also sort of educate them on, on how to have normative debates, on how to see things holistically in a systems perspective. So that whatever studies that you do and whatever sort of uh, future uh, professions you have to deal with later, I think whatever you do, you will be more and more confronted with a changing state of nature, our environment heavily affected um, by the things that we do. So I think uh, one way forward is actually also, yeah, getting that into education as well. But um, yes, enough maybe from me for now. Let's see if I open the chat. No, there's nothing more, but then I came actually by accident to the second discussion statement because apparently I 
pressed the, the right button. May, um, I, yes. may I still say something about uh, this discussion statement? This one or the previous one? Uh, sorry, the previous one, yes. All right. Because this I have actually, yeah, because I actually have a little bit of a different view than maybe uh, some of the people who spoke before me. Um, and I probably may be already be doomed a little bit too much of a realist. Um, but I do agree with, with, with this statement, I would actually say, although maybe more with the second part, because if you, if you look at the statement, the, the sort of first part is about decoupling sustainability with economic growth. And it has been argued that that is basically impossible due to how uh, economic growth actually works or how to capitalism actually works. But I do believe in the second part of the statement, which says that it is the most feasible way to invest in sustainable change. Because I believe that with this sort of capitalist system, you can go against the system and go against um, the flow, which takes also a lot of energy and effort, or you can sort of make use of the system. And then therefore by, by going with the stream and, and making use of it and investing it this can i believe be sort of a first step which can also lead to realization of people that uh, actually nature and the environment are very important and that you then can set like new goals or higher goals or new standards and i think mr riss also argued that with this new green deal you mobilize the wrong allies as in um for instance, like like, like companies and, 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 and a wrong part of the public. But I believe that this Green Deal is very much sort of a compromise. And for a compromise, you need everyone. And if you are too, set, set the standards too high, then you also have a problem. And then you don't get with yourself sort of a part of the public of the, the, the European Union. So yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thanks for sharing, Robert. Um, is there anyone who would like to react or who would like to add something to this point of view or to the statement in general? If not, then I'll be so free to move to the next one. And this one is actually also two statements in one. <laughs> Um, and the first um, I thought about after also listening to Philip Patberg this morning, in which that uh, he really saw that the Green Deal will accelerate the sustainability transition on. And in his argument, he said there are actually many things in place already in society, in our you know infrastructure, um, if I can say so, in terms of education projects. Uh, movements, but he saw some challenges and he said we need to overcome specific challenges to really get that sustainability transition going. But here I, so that's the first part. I say, okay, the Green Deal will accelerate the sustainability, the sustainability transition, but uh, second part, it will not lead to the systemic changes needed on the short term. So how long do we have to wait? Um, and will it actually lead to systemic changes? So I'm really, um, yeah, looking forward to your points of view on this. Well, maybe I can can, can react on, on that, uh, Sharon, as well. Uh, um, of course, it first depends on how you define a sustainability transition. I think also in one of the early presentations, sustainable development goals, I think it was by Frank, were being mentioned as a, uh, a key uh, important step because there was a lot of stakeholder involvement. I think I agree, uh, involving stakeholders is a good thing because sometimes I still see that people think like the economic system is something that's out there. No, it's, it's us, we are part of it, so we can also make the change. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, I when, when now we start preparing this, this workshop and starting, start looking at the Green Deal, I still compare it a lot with all these climate negotiations and protocols and what all we have, Kyoto, Paris agreements. And of course, they are all for the good in many cases. So we really want to make a change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, whatever. But sometimes the outcomes is actually a kind of a login. So 
really not making uh, the transition, maybe in the short run, sustainable, but actually causing a, a very strong system lock-in. Uh, sometimes you just need to loosen things up and the situation may go initially even worse than before in order to achieve a better sustainable future. You can imagine about, uh, hopefully the corona crisis will also lead to some sectors to the good, but now people are suffering uh, in, in many, many ways, uh, economically, but also uh, well-being uh, wise. So it's not always the case that these good ideas will lead to a kind of system change that can even make a wrong system more embed in society, so even, even entangle it with the well. Especially, and that's my main worry about all the things, uh, and again, the example is sustainable development goals. The idea is good, but now you see it being misused by many, many countries, industries, uh, universities. Uh, first of all, they are not uh, taking the whole picture into account because the sustainable development goals are meant to be taken to look at in, in, in connection with each other. If you pick out one or two that suits your purpose, then it's not something you want to do. It's not good. Or using it for a different purpose, using it for a kind of a, a university strategy while it's usually meant for countries, for regions to, to take uh, into account. So um, it's also how to, to implement it later on. Of course, with the Green Deal, that's the next step. But so coming to the bot, uh, but it could also lead to uh, even, even, uh, even a, a worse system uh, in the long term. That would be my but. Um, Jorgo, would you like to add something to the discussion? Yes, for me, this uh, statement raises two important questions. The first one is what do we mean when we talk about the Green Deal? Because on one hand, the Green Deal was a very successful piece of communication by the European Commission. Uh, and it has in its annex a long list of legislative proposals that are supposed to come. And to me, the question how good or bad the Green Deal is, you know, we cannot answer that one yet because the communication is just that, communication. And as I said earlier, it has an important role to play in sort of giving a united vision towards the different political leaders in the European Union, ideally, you know, can play that role. But whether it will accelerate anything depends on how good or how bad the legislation that comes out of it. And secondly, the Green Deal is not the only show in town. We have at the moment massive public money going into recovery uh, to the economy post COVID. And in Greenpeace, we've been tracking the airlines alone have been receiving 30 billion, one of the most polluting sectors in terms of its climate impacts, one of the worst sectors also in terms of jobs, uh, job security and employment conditions. So it's going in the wrong, to the wrong parts of the economy. So that's not an acceleration, that's actually creating bigger problems for the future. Same thing with the cap. If Timmermans does not pull it back, if it goes through as it is now, it creates more problems for the future, not less. So if the Green Deal was the only show in town, then yes. Uh, and, and you know the legislation would follow it, it would accelerate it. It certainly would not lead to significant systemic changes. That's not the approach that they're pursuing. But given that it's not the only show in town, given that there's a lot of pressure, uh, the EU Mercosur trade agreement is another one that goes completely cross with the ambitions of the Green Deal. Um, we, need, we need to keep watching and we need to keep putting pressure. Yes, thanks, Jorgo. Also very interesting uh, how you uh, did your, the analysis of uh, how the airline industry is being saved at the moment. And um, yeah, the amounts of money that go into uh, protecting uh, some of the things uh, that are extremely polluting, of course. Um, so you see where the focus is also placed and uh, where money is available uh, if needed. Um, and I think if I, if I think back also about the... Bram unfortunately just had to leave now, but um, when I think about his presentation, he also talked about how current uh, conservation uh, like projects uh, actually only add up to unsustainable practices. So 
the things that you think you do to uh, make it better actually only uh, yeah, contribute to the same problem and are not uh, fixes. Um, definitely not the systemic fixes that we need. And I think uh, that's definitely something I also add to the new knowledge that I have from today's session. Is there um, anyone who would like to add their point of view to this discussion that we're having? Yeah, I would like to add something. So I totally agree with Yorgo's uh, statement about the first part of the discussion statement. Um, but I would like to add something to the second part. Um, I would like to add that short-term and rapid systemic changes are not really a strength of the European Union because we have to keep in mind that every time we would like to have something changed, that 27 member states have to agree on the same thing, which is pretty rare in the European Union and which all, only make things harder. And yeah, I think that's that's a problem here. That's um, it's, it lies in the nature of the European system, the European democracy, that changes and decisions just take so much time. Yeah. Thanks for your contribution. Um, so, uh, so if we think also maybe in terms of. Um, solutions perhaps um are there any any things that come to your mind in terms of um is there a way to sidestep let's say um the political structures in some way and i think uh yeah personally i think that's very difficult uh, but are there ways that you see that um that these sorts of um, realizations can get taken up by uh, various public bodies as well, um, for which there may not necessarily need to be agreement across all the different member states, because the propositions that need to be developed now, because I think what Yorgo said was a very good point, it was a successful communication the Green Deal, but it's now up to all parties and all member states to come up with ideas on how to implement it. So can we think of ways, or do you have ideas about not necessarily sidestepping, but how certain um, areas get more focus in the proposals and the action plans that need to come up? And um, yeah, so just your thoughts, if you will. Um, if I may add, just add something to that. So I think one solution would be, um, which is pretty obvious that the member states transfer more power to European bodies, but like not, uh, not necessarily in uh, at every part, but maybe in like um, in the sectors of uh, nature conservation and protection. But I actually don't really see this coming because um, even though the European Union is a very strong alliance of member states, the member states still like their sovereignty. And I don't really see that coming that they will transform more power to the European bodies in terms of Brexit and everything we are, uh, which is happening right now. So I would say that the situation is very complex and difficult to solve because of the, because just the nature of the European democracy and the European system, which is, I, I don't have a solution for this, actually. This is very difficult. Yeah, of, of course, you can also think about that. If, if you, uh, I partly agree with you, it is about the, maybe the slowness of the process at the European level. Uh, but I'm also thinking, again, I'm not a kind of an expert on transitions like Philippe and others are. But uh, what I learned from it, uh, that is, the, the fastest way you can go if you have on the different levels people acting. So actually, hey, yeah, you, you probably need to have some some European level kind of acting, uh, which maybe go very slow. But I personally think that that individuals that, that groups of people can do maybe more than they think they can. Again, eh, it's, it's not like there are things that are just, just happening without humans. There's always people involved, and 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 
uh, you see that at least in the Netherlands, I think you see that happening quite quite strictly. People are just taking their own initiative, making smaller corporations. If you talk about uh, grocery shops, uh, also in Maastricht, uh, there are some companies, uh, even uh, farmers, uh, there are some farmers that, that come together again. Um, and in that sense, uh, you see this more small scale, more local uh, development. And I like the phrase in that respect of my, my former uh, um, director, Jan Rotmans, uh, not going back to the future, but forward to the past. So actually taking some of the things that happened in the past, uh, but then of course, uh, with a new style, we don't want to go back to the, to the, to the horse and, 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 and the carriage, but uh, we also don't want to, to move in this direction, which is apparently also not sustainable. And this local development, you see that people are taking this initiative in many, many cases. And maybe it's not enough. Maybe it goes, doesn't go uh, too fast if it's not being coupled with uh, policies at the European level. But still, I think there is something ongoing already at the moment on different levels. I think this also links to, um, at the kickoff, we had this discussion about degrowing and what this means also for you know, the poorer people. Um, and I myself, uh, you know, if I went back to my hometown, which is 200 people in the south of Catalonia, and I told them we have to degrow, they would basically ban me from the town and break a chair on my face, right? So how do we, how, how do we communicate that to them and you know, um, get them on board to fighting for you know, what we believe is the good cause in a way that you know, this relates to their daily life? I think this is also what the, you know, I don't get that from the Green Deal. And even from, you know, this is also one of the main goals of our discussions is how do we relate this? You know, how do we relay this sort of like policy ambitions to, you know, the people in a way that makes sense for them, uh, that it's not so detached uh, and get them on board uh, with that. Um, I don't know if anyone has ideas for this, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I don't have an idea or a clear cut answer, but I was also thinking about Brahms' discussion that uh, uh, I think the, the, the stretch of his approach was also that not everybody needs to degrowth, uh, but we just need to uh, make the distribution of wealth and, and whatever more evenly uh, for those of uh, the people maybe in, in your village that, that need to, to grow to, to, to reach a certain level. Uh, but the thing is that, that it's a difficult task to do, I think, because personally, again, at the beginning of this whole sustainability debate, also mentioned by uh, Monique about this people planet uh, uh, profit, so this whole profit already annoyed me at the beginning, and fortunately it changed in prosperity, but also still quite allergic to speaking to people from government or whatever, talking about win, win, win. I don't believe there is always a win, win, win. I think sometimes people lose in terms of, well, you do need to do with less. And it's not a real loss, of course, if you have plenty of things like most of us have, but still people are not that reluctant to, to step back, uh, to travel less, to have less income, to use less energy. Uh, so it's also a lot of uh, psychology, I think. And, and, and hopefully, um, I may be quite naive, but I hope that also this crisis will, will get some change. But in my darkest hours, I think that this crisis is just not harsh enough either. Uh, to make a change. Uh, I fear that after things have settled down a little bit more in terms of corona cases and COVID-19, whatever, that people will actually do uh, an additional step in, 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 in uh, increasing production and, and, and uh, take up for the loss we have uh, suffered over the last several months, uh, I think, at least most of us will. So in that sense, it's, it's not, I think, of course, if it was easy, probably people would have come up with clever ideas and we have started it. But I think it's an ongoing process, and I think it's also um, a matter of diversity. And that was also my comment about these bigger projects and bigger green deals and Kyoto protocols. If you take it too big, you sometimes also lose flexibility in the solutions uh, because you, you don't know exactly what's happening with climate change uh, in detail. And you don't have any idea what certain solutions that might seem logical at the moment will turn out in the future. An example is biomass. When it was started to, to be important, people were applauding for it. Well, we all know what happened with that. Uh, very detrimental to, to the environment. So it's probably try and arrow, many, level, many levels, different cases. And I think some people need to realize that we probably need to do a step back in order to provide others to become more evenly and the world to become more sustainable. 
but how to convince them, I don't know. Yorgo, would you like to um, say something as well? Yeah, um, on Felix's point, you know, if I understood it right, so the question, how does an abstract big concept like the Green Deal translate into uh, very concrete changes and improvements for the life in, of people in towns and villages and cities across the EU? Um, a couple of things. So one thing that I'm really hopeful for, and which is sort of among the ambitions of the EU, is to invest massively into urban greening, greening of urban spaces. And I've seen that in a couple of cities. I mean, in Brussels, the local government took sort of the lockdown and the pandemic situation as an opportunity to imagine space for cycling. Um, Brussels was and still is to a large extent a pretty suicidal place for cyclists because it was not set up, set up at all. And the improvement that has made to people, especially in a situation where otherwise it was difficult to get out and be in the fresh air. So to suddenly have more space where more people can cycle and enjoy fresh air you know, during the summer when otherwise there were so many restrictions. Um, that was a clear, very clear thing that I saw. And I think rolling that out across Europe more green spaces, taking back urban spaces. A lot of urban spaces over the last decades have turned into sort of commercial spaces and bringing them back more into public spaces, greener public spaces, where you can also, when the weather permits, live more outside. That'll make it very, I think many people will feel that uh, if, if that's one of the things that this EU program can achieve. Um, also then employment, of course, the, the, not only the planting and constructing, but the upkeep and caretaking for these spaces. Um, public transport is another area where I think, you know, a really good quality public transport, many member states were hesitant to invest in it, also because of the strict sort of budget, you know, neoliberal thinking that too much public debt is a bad thing and you know we must sort of have austerity rather than invest. Um, so if we can now see investment into high quality public transport, connecting people, making it possible to you know, take away dependency on private cars and, and create mobility to more people, give mobility to more people, that again will make big improvements and create some uh, new employment there as well. And that's just sort of from thinking from the bottom up in the immediate living environment. Uh, this talk of, you know, changing cities so that you have pretty much everything within 20 minutes walking distance, your work, where you buy things, ending this situation of towns that no longer have any shops where you can buy food. There's a lot in there, um, which is not systemic as such, but which could very quickly add up and make people benefit and bring environmental benefits at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite hopeful in that kind of development. Maybe an entirely different sort of point or like um, thing, thing that relates, would also relate to, you, to your question would be also um, about promotion, I would say, because uh, in my opinion, the European Commission has at the moment done quite a good job as sort of like uh, promoting or branding this sort of green deal um, because I've not seen a single message in which the European Commission only says like this is a green deal they say like this is a green deal but also a green deal that uh, gets people on board that makes sure that the poorest people in Europe um, uh, will, will profit from this that makes sure that there is this sort of transition in jobs and so in that sense I think that also the way how you brand it can be really important to um, um, get get people on board and make sure that they actually start believing in this deal. Yes, very uh, uh, interesting addition. Um, what you just said, uh, I agree with you uh, in terms of communications. It's a uh, relatively clever but I think um, uh, now all eyes are on okay so what are the plans then and I think when Jorgo in his um, presentation asked us to you know write down what what our initial thoughts are I think 
that also came up as the majority of the things that were mentioned, like, okay, good start, or but where is this going? Um, and I think uh, we're in the development of that. And I think I find a way now to also wrap up this discussion in that sense, that I think our conversation also points towards where the conversation uh, needs to go. Um, and also address those things that uh, we foresee in, um, in, in it not being able to fix. And I think as academics, I think as citizens, I think we need to be honest about our observations. Um, and yeah, well, a pledge for me and Pim, I think that we will continue this discussion in that sense. Um, and we will also write up a report about what has been said, the issues that have been raised, and we would like to also pass this on uh, in a wider conversation and in a wider discussion. And for us, this is not the end. Um, we think uh, really, in that sense, part of a, of a bigger system that needs to be better. Um, so, Bim, is there any final thing that you would like to say to our audience and our speakers of today? Well, of course, we'd like to say a lot of thanks to, to everybody, including the, the office, uh, the campus in, in Brussels for, for helping us organizing uh, this. And of course, also many thanks to you, uh, Sharan, for, uh, for being part of this uh, endeavor. Uh, well, I really liked all the discussions and, and the presentations we have. And, and, and again, as Sharan pointed out, for me, the, the struggle or the positive vibe or the, the interest is, is, is not over yet. And it's still very much needed. And personally, yeah, probably like, like all of you, you will start wondering what you can do. And I call myself a scientist, so I try to do my best from my scientific background to, to make a change and to speak out whenever I think it's needed. But of course, by the end of the day, we can all change our own behaviors. We can try to do as good as we think we can do. And, and of course, we all will make mistakes. And I think also I like Frank, Frank comments that, that it's not about not flying. It's not about being vegetarian, but it's trying to do little steps you all can do in order to achieve a kind of a more sustainable world. And if things like the Green Deal, uh, which I really think can be having a huge potential, um, uh, can be part of that, uh, that, that will be great. And personally, I like to be very critical and, and keep an eye on all these things. But also, I don't think a kind of, a, and I really like that today's meeting, it's also a kind of a critical positive attitude towards the future. Uh, doom and gloom, we all know there are many things coming upon us which we don't want to, but we also need to take this, this positive vibe in order to make a change, to, to move people uh, forward for a better and sustainable future. And I think respecting uh, animals and nature, and that was the key entry point for me to, to, to think about meetings like this, uh, for me, is, that's the key, respecting animals and nature, and of course, no need to say your fellow human being, for me, that's the starting point of a kind of a sustainable future. So again, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm also looking a little bit to Felix. Felix, do you want to say something on behalf of the um, project? Um, well, I think this was a, an extremely successful uh, workshop. We had a, a very diverse uh, range of uh, you know, um, viewers and, and discussants. So uh, what we will be doing now is that this is, uh, I think as Sharan said, not the, the end of the conversation, but also the start uh, in a way, because we will be writing a working paper uh, with the discussions of today that we will circulate with you and that we will invite you to still circulate further, which is uh, the document from which we will derive the policy recommendations that we will be sending to the commission. Uh, so by all means, uh, keep, on, keep on thinking about this. Um, and just uh, to answer a question in the chat, yes, uh, the recording will be shared. Uh, we'll make a little summary video uh, and also the full recording uh, available to you in the coming uh, weeks uh, as time uh, permits. So I think just a big thank you, uh, of course, Pim and Shevin and all the speakers for their time and everyone uh, for participating. Uh, and that's all for me. Well, have a great day all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.